Chapter One of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Mystery The Ministry was defeated on a question of vital importance. The Premier placed the resignation of himself and colleagues in the hands of His Excellency the Governor of New South Wales. A dissolution was granted, and an appeal to the electors was shortly to take place. Sydney, as the capital of this important colony, was in a turmoil of excitement. The Labour members were determined to show a bold front in the city and suburban constituencies, and capable men had been selected to fight for the cause. Capital opposed Labour, in order to safeguard its rights, not out of any desire to deal unjustly with the men on the opposite side. The strife promised to be severe, and nowhere more so than in Balmain East, the constituency which, for several years, had returned as one of its members, Mr. Henry Bryce, the principal partner in the firm of Bryce, Golding & Company, Stock and Station Agents. Henry Bryce was a wealthy man, an example of what can be done by energy and industry, aided by a fair amount of brains, and well balanced by common sense. He was a man nearly sixty years of age, but looked ten years younger. He was often heard to declare he never felt more fit for work in his life than at the present time. Although a hard-working man, he had been a lucky man, and even his station properties had turned out well. The Labour Party decided to fight against Henry Bryce on this occasion. A dead set was to be made against him, on account of a shearer's strike which had taken place on one of his stations. On this occasion Henry Bryce had proved victorious, and managed to shear all his sheep with non-union labour. In the eyes of the leaders of the Labour Party, this was an unpardonable sin. It mattered not to the Labour leaders whether Henry Bryce fancied he was acting rightly in the matter. He had no option according to their decree. Union Labour, the leaders declared, must be employed, and Henry Bryce and other squatters must obey their dictum. It was of no use trying to browbeat Henry Bryce in this manner. He had worked hard for his possessions, and he meant to have a free hand in dealing with them. He offered the unionists the wages asked, but he declined to be bound down to employ none but union men. It was on this rock Henry Bryce and the Labour leaders had split. Neither side would give way, and when Henry Bryce proved he was independent of the unionists, the pill was too bitter for them to easily swallow. The election gave them a chance of retaliating by opposing Mr Bryce for Balmain East. There were other members more opposed to the Labour Party than Henry Bryce, but it was the success of the latter against him in a pitched battle that had made them marshal their forces against him. This opposition only stimulated Henry Bryce to strain every nerve to retain his seat. He had been offered more than one seat in which he could walk over, but he declined and decided it should be Balmain East he would contest and abide by the decision of the electors. The fight raged bitterly, but no insults or scurrilous attacks were made on Henry Bryce. The Labour Party acknowledged he was an upright man, and had led an almost blameless life. They opposed him solely on the ground that he was not in favour of unionism. Henry Bryce resided in a fine house at Potts Point, and accordingly he generally went over the ferry to Balmain to attend meetings, and interview his constituents. He had an important meeting one dark, dreary night, and his daughter, Ida Bryce, tried hard to persuade him not to attend. Mrs Bryce took very little interest in politics, or, in fact, in anything but herself. It was the one great mistake Henry Bryce had made when he married a second time, and placed a stepmother over his son and daughter. "'I must go, Ida,' said Henry Bryce. It is most important. I dare not miss a single meeting. It will be taken as a sign of weakness. Do not worry your father, Ida, 
said Mrs. Bryce. You know he's wedded to politics. If he failed to attend this meeting, politics would bring an action for divorce against him. Now, if I had requested him to take me to the theatre on this particular night, it would have been different. I am sure your persuasive powers to induce your father to remain at home would not have been expended in vain. Ida Bryce made no reply. She had long given up entering into wordy arguments with her stepmother, and that lady was exasperated accordingly, nothing pleasing her better than a battle of words with Ida. "'There is nothing to hinder you going to the theatre tonight, if you wish,' said Henry Bryce to his wife. "'Ida will accompany you.' "'Certainly, if you wish it,' replied Ida. "'Perhaps Ida would prefer your political meeting,' said Mrs. Bryce, with a sarcastic smile. "'Nonsense,' said Henry Bryce. "'Send for tickets at once. "'It is rather late, but they will reserve you seats, I am sure.' "'Will you go, Ida?' asked Mrs. Bryce. "'If you wish it,' she replied. "'I do wish it,' said Mrs. Bryce harshly. The girl's quiet, almost contemptuous manner nettled her. Ida Bryce knew more about her stepmother's doings than Henry Bryce. In such matters he was often dangerously blind and trusting. "'Then it's settled,' said Henry Bryce. "'You are for pleasure, I am for business. I may be rather late home. There is a committee meeting after the speeches.' "'Is Mr. Golding to be there?' asked Mrs. Bryce. "'I believe so. He said he would come round.' Herbert Golding was a partner in the firm of Bryce, Golding & Company. Ida Bryce did not like Herbert Golding, but he was a favourite with Mrs. Bryce. Perhaps this accounted for the girl's antipathy to him. Henry Bryce crossed over to Balmain and attended his meeting. It was reported afterwards he had never met with such a cordial reception, and the committee were certain he would be returned at the head of the poll. He left the meeting in excellent spirits, and declining the offer of one of his chief supporters to see him safely home, walked away in the direction of the ferry. It was close upon midnight, and a small knot of people stood on the AUSN Company's wharf, awaiting the arrival of the Wodonga from Brisbane. "'She's late in,' said one of the men employed on the wharf. "'I ain't heard a whistle yet.' "'She's entered the harbour said another man. "'Who told you?' "'Silent Billy,' was the reply. It was so unusual for Silent Billy, as the man was called, to make a remark, that it was evident those present doubted the information. "'If you don't believe me, ask him yourself,' said the man who had referred to Silent Billy. Sauntering along the wharf was a short, thick-set man in a pilot jacket and slouch hat, his breeches were of a dull blue, and he had on heavy boots. He had a stern face, and his shaggy whiskers were grey, and stuck out like wires. This was Silent Billy, a man seldom known to speak unless he was spoken to, and then only to say the briefest possible reply. "'Say, Billy, is the Wodonga in the harbour?' The man made no reply, but proceeded to clamber down the side of the wharf, and get into a boat moored there. This seemed to be positive proof that the Wodonga was close at hand, for Silent Billy generally went out in his boat to catch the rope thrown to him from the steamer, which having made fast to one of the seats, he rowed with it back to the wharf. This was a necessary operation to enable the Wodonga to swing round and back into the wharf. Silent Billy pulled out from the wharf, and no sooner had he done so than a boom was heard, followed by a sharp whistle. "'That's the Wodonga round in the point. Billy was right. He's a wonderful man, is Billy,' said one of the men on the wharf. They watched silent Billy slowly pulling out into the stream. Then the faint outline of a big steamer was seen in the darkness, and presently her saloon lights were visible, gleaming out from her huge side. A man stood in the bow of the steamer, with a rope coiled in his hand, ready to throw to Billy in the boat. He was about to fling it, was suddenly seen to fall back off his seat and sprawl in the bottom of his boat. "'What's up, Billy?' yelled the man on the steamer, 
Silent Billy scrambled quickly up and looked over the side of his boat. He made a grab at something floating in the water. The old fellow shuddered as his fingers clutched the saturated clothes of a drowned man. Man overboard! Hold hard! shouted Billy. Wait till I get him aboard! He tugged hard at the body, but failed to drag it into his boat. Seeing it was impossible to do this, he made the body fast with a piece of rope to the stern of his boat, and then signalled to the man on the steamer to fling his rope to him. When the end came whizzing into the boat with a thud, Silent Billy commenced to row back to the wharf. The people on the wharf all crowded to the side to see the object Billy had in tow. His mishap had been seen from the wharf, and many were the surmises as to the cause of Silent Billy, who was such a good oarsman, catching a crab. Billy slung the rope of the steamer onto the wharf, and then said, Give us a hand with this poor devil, afore she comes alongside and swamps us. The body of the unfortunate man was hauled onto the wharf, and carried under the sheds until the arrival of the water police. Only a dim light shone on the wharf, and the face of the drowned man was scarcely visible. The Wodonga came alongside, and one of the first passengers to come ashore was Dr. Langside. He had seen what occurred from the deck of the Wodonga, and hurried ashore to see if he could be of any assistance. Dr. Langside followed Silent Billy to the sheds, and here he found two men in the familiar uniform of the water police, looking seriously at the body. They recognised Dr. Langside, who was well known in Sydney, and one of them said, This is a sad business, Doctor. I'm afraid there's been foul play. Do you know who it is? asked the Doctor. Yes, sir, and so do you, I expect. Luke, and the policeman drew a handkerchief off the drowned man's face. Dr. Langside started back in amazement. Good heavens, he exclaimed, it's Henry Bryce. Whatever does this mean? He at once proceeded to examine the body of the unfortunate Henry Bryce, who, but a few short hours before, had been full of life and health, and eager to fight his election battles again. Dead, undoubtedly, said Dr. Langside. Look here, Williams, he's been struck a heavy blow on the back of the head. This blow was enough to render him insensible. He must have been knocked down and pushed into the water, or have been struck when near the edge of the wharf and fallen in. Looks like a case of murder, said W.P. Constable Williams. There will have to be an inquest, said the doctor. Word had better be sent to his house, said the constable. I will go there myself, said Dr. Langside. I know Miss Bryce well and as Dr. Langside drove in a cab to the residence of the Bryces at Potts Point, he thought of the unfortunate man lying dead on the wharf, and muttered to himself, It's a mysterious affair. I wonder how it will turn out. When young Ted Bryce hears of this, there'll be a day of reckoning for someone, sooner or later. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of Who Did It」by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. No Trace When Ida Bryce and her stepmother returned from the theatre, they found Henry Bryce had not arrived. It was after eleven, but Ida was not anxious about her father, as he said he might return late. Twelve o'clock struck, and he had not returned and even Mrs. Bryce commenced to feel uneasy. She was a selfish woman, with hardly a thought for others, but Henry Bryce had been such an indulgent husband that he had aroused what small amount of feeling there was in her. "'I wish your father would come, Ida,' she said. "'I have never known him to be so late.' "'He ought not to have gone on a night like this,' replied Ida. "'He is so venturesome, and he always refuses to have the carriage to meet him.' They sat looking at the clock on the mantelpiece, until it was just on the stroke of one, when Ida Bryce started from her seat and said, "'There's a cab coming up the drive. I am glad he has returned. I am tired and want to go to bed. 
That play was so dull it nearly sent me to sleep. Ida Bryce, in her anxiety to welcome her father home, rushed out of the room into the hall just as the door was opened. When she saw Dr. Langside, she turned white and gasped. My father, where is he? Why are you here? Is anything the matter, Dr. Langside? As a medical man, Dr. Langside had been placed in many painful and difficult positions, but as he looked at Ida's face, he thought he had never had such a hard task set him before. He knew how Henry Bryce was beloved by his children, and he dreaded the effect of the terrible news he had to tell upon a girl of Ida's temperament. "'Your mother up, Miss Bryce?' he asked in order to gain a moment's respite. "'My stepmother is in the dining-room,' said Ida. "'But where's my father? Have you seen him? Has he met with an accident? Is he hurt?' "'I've seen your father,' he said quietly, "'and he has met with an accident. "'Come into the dining-room and I will tell you both about it.' "'His tone of voice somewhat reassured Ida, "'and she led the way into the dining-room. "'Father has met with an accident,' she said. "'Dr. Langside is here. He has seen him.' "'Mrs. Bryce looked startled, "'but she received the news more calmly than Ida.' Dr. Langside shook hands with her, and then, standing, looked gravely at them. "'Where did it happen? Tell me all about it,' said Mrs. Bryce. "'I only arrived from Brisbane by the Wodonga tonight,' commenced Dr. Langside. "'When I stepped onto the wharf, my services were required to attend a man who had been in the water.' He looked closely at Ida Bryce. He knew she would be more nearly affected than Mrs. Bryce. You can imagine how shocked I was when I discovered it was your father, Miss Bryce, who had met with an accident. I attended to him at once. I did all I possibly could for him. Go on, said Ida Bryce in a hollow voice. Mrs. Bryce was also much agitated. I'm sorry to say your father has met with a very serious accident. I doubt if he will recover, he said, hesitatingly. You have no doubts said Ida slowly. You know he will not recover. Dr. Langside bowed his head in acknowledgement. Ida Bryce stepped up to him and clasped his arm. Is my father dead? she said with a shudder. Ida, how can you? came from Mrs. Bryce. Dr. Langside took Ida Bryce by the hand and said quietly, Miss Bryce, your father is dead. He was dead when I saw him. Mrs. Bryce uttered a piercing scream and proceeded to moan in a most lamentable fashion, rocking herself to and fro and wringing her hands. Ida Bryce merely sank down into a chair and seemed dazed and crushed. She hardly realised the blow she had received. Dr. Langside wished she would burst into tears, but her eyes remained dry. Her grief was too deep even for tears to flow freely. Dr. Langside remained in the house all night. In the morning he found Ida Bryce better. That she was still suffering terribly, he could see, and he endeavoured to rouse her. "'I will at once send a wire to your brother,' he said. "'Is he on the station?' "'Yes, at Munda Station,' said Ida. "'Please meet him at the railway station when he arrives and explain to him. "'Poor Ted! It will be an awful blow to him!' "'How long will it take him to reach here?' asked Dr. Langside. "'He will not arrive until tomorrow," said Ida. "'The inquest will be held today,' said Dr. Langside. "'After it is over, your father will be brought home.' Ida shuddered. The mere thought of an inquest being held over her dead father was an additional blow. "'It is necessary,' said Dr. Langside. "'There may have been foul play. I'm sure your brother will be anxious to hear the truth.' "'Foul play?' said Ida. "'What do you mean? My father had not an enemy in the world.' "'He may have had one, Miss Bryce, and it may be that one who has caused his death. "'You'll see it all in the papers, so I may as well tell you. "'I believe your father was struck down by a violent blow on the head, "'and then either fell or was thrown into the water.' "'Oh, this is dreadful,' moaned Ida.' 
and to think I was at the theatre last night, laughing and enjoying myself at the very time. She sobbed hysterically. You cannot blame yourself for that, Miss Bryce, he said kindly. Everyone knows what an affectionate daughter you were, and how dearly you loved your father. After a short conversation, Dr. Langside left her, and promised to return when the inquest was over. Mrs. Bryce appeared inconsolable. She made a far greater outward show of grief than Ida. She was genuinely sorry for her husband's death, but as the day wore on, she became equally anxious on her own account, and wondered how Henry Bryce had made his will. The inquest was held. The morning papers had gathered particulars about the accident, and the community at large felt a severe shock at the death of such a well-known and much-respected man as Henry Bryce. As the inquest proceeded, and the news appeared in the evening papers, it was discovered that what had befallen Henry Bryce was no accident, but would probably, at the conclusion, be called by the much uglier word of murder. One of the evening papers in an early edition alluded to the supposed murder of Mr. Henry Bryce. The same paper even went so far as to crow over its rivals in a later edition, and went on to point out how they had first published the fact that Mr. Henry Bryce was murdered. It was not even thought indecorous to make capital out of the dead man, and the sub-editor was complimented by his chief on his foresight and acumen in being the first in the field with such an important piece of news. Nothing sensational was brought out at the inquest. The coroner tried to look wise and put on an air of importance. He did not get such a man as the late Henry Bryce to sit upon every day in the week. He felt that this was no ordinary case, and consequently prolonged it, and gloated over it in a manner that surprised even the reporters, and it takes a lot to surprise a pressman. Had the inquest been on the body of Tom Smith, wharf labourer, the coroner would have apologised for calling the jury together, and explained that it was merely a matter of form, and hinted that the sooner they got through with it, the better. It is surprising what a vast difference there is between a wharf labourer and a millionaire, even when death is supposed to have levelled all ranks. So the coroner puffed himself out with windy dignity, and reproved a juryman for levity when he sneezed, and actually threatened to order him out of court if the offence was repeated. As the atmosphere of the court was somewhat ticklish to sensitive nostrils, the juryman may be pardoned for his breach of decorum. Dr. Langside never had much respect for the coroner, and what little he had vanished before the inquest on poor Henry Bryce was over. The coroner cross-questioned witnesses as to the, as to the private relations of the deceased with his family. He even went so far as to say the inquest ought to be adjourned in order that Edward Bryce might be present. The fact of Edward Bryce being 500 miles from Sydney at the time weighed not an atom with the coroner. After deliberating for some minutes, he kindly consented, out of deference to the feelings of the deceased's family, to waive the point of Edward Bryce's presence. Dr Langside felt inclined to wave his fist in the coroner's face, and looked so contemptuously at him that the coroner asked him if he wished to make any further remarks. As Dr Langside had already given his evidence, and been recalled five times, he candidly admitted he could throw no more light on the subject. The coroner summed up. This was his chance. He summarised the evidence. He dilated for fully an hour on the salient points of the case. He flung arguments at the jury with such rapidity and inaccurate aim as to the points he intended to make that the good men and true were bathed in perspiration and bewilderment. Having exhausted his skirmishers, he brought up his heavy reserves and said, Gentlemen, I will now read over the evidence. The juryman glanced at the piles of fool's cap, and one of the gentlemen groaned audibly. The coroner heard him, and said in a sympathetic manner that it was a painful scene, and he fully endorsed the groan of the affected juryman. At last the inquest came to an end. 
and the jury returned a verdict of willful murder against some person or persons unknown. The coroner said that was a rather large order, but the jury felt it was their turn and declined to amend their verdict. Henry Bryce's funeral was an enormous procession, and although scores of people followed who had never spoken to the dead man in their lives, they had known him by repute as an upright man. Edward Bryce, Herbert Golding and Dr Langside were the chief mourners and occupied the first coach. In after years, this incident was brought vividly to the minds of two of them. Edward Bryce was terribly shocked at the news of his father's death. He could not understand it. Like his sister, he did not believe his father had an enemy in the world. Once, however, the bare fact was brought home to him that his father had met with foul play. It was as Dr Langside had thought. Young Bryce was determined there should be a day of reckoning for the man or men who had killed his father. The police did their best. The police, as a rule, do their duty and get very little credit for it. They got none in this case. The reporters badgered them for information, and when the police informed them, quite truthfully, that they had no information to give, the papers stated, The police declined to give us information, but believe they have a clue which will lead to the apprehension of the perpetrator of the crime. When the police read this, they were mad. There was no clue. The chief would have given a year's salary of the best police reporter in Sydney to have obtained even the smallest bit of a clue. But the papers were so persistent in saying that the police had a clue that the detectives in charge of the case began to think there must originally have been a clue and that it had been lost. Edward Bryce was anxious about this clue. He offered £500 reward for information that would lead to the arrest and conviction of his father's assailant or assailants. That £500 made the police hunt for clues in all sorts of impossible and improbable directions. How it got about no one knew, but a rumour commenced to circulate that the Union shearers had something to do with Henry Bryce's untimely death. No more scandalous rumour was ever circulated, said the Union men. It was a political dodge to damage the Labour Party at the general election. Edward Bryce did not believe the Unionist shearers were responsible for the outrage, and he said so openly. The men applauded him, and swore there should be no more trouble at Munda Station next shearing. How they kept their word will be seen later on. There was no trace of the man, or men, who had attacked Henry Bryce, and the police honestly confessed the whole affair was shrouded in mystery. End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of Who Did It?" by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The New Member Henry Bryce was not the man to die and leave no last will and testament behind him. His will was duly proved, and his executors were his son Edward. Herbert Golding, his partner, and Dr Langside. It was a surprise to Dr Langside when he heard that he was one of the executors. He had attended the late Mr Bryce on more than one occasion, but did not think that he had been regarded in any other light than an ordinary medical man. Herbert Golding was not surprised he was made an executor, but he was surprised when he found Dr Langside had also been appointed. The appointment irritated him, although he gave no outward sign it did so. The will was an equitable one. The bulk of the estate was divided between Edward Bryce and his sister Ida, the former taking Munda and other stations, and a large share in the firm of Bryce, Golding and Company. Mrs Bryce had £50,000 cash, and the house, furniture and effects at Potts Point on condition Ida was allowed to reside there if she desired. Dr Langside and Herbert Golding received £500 each. Everyone was satisfied, although Mrs Bryce expected more and said so. 
but the amount she received was too handsome for her to speak slightingly of it. It became necessary to find a candidate to take Henry Bryce's place in Balmain East constituency. Edward Bryce was asked to take his father's place, but he submitted he was too young and declined. After some discussion, in which heated arguments were advanced for and against, for he was not a particularly popular man, Herbert Golding was asked to stand. After, as he stated, giving the matter his most serious consideration, he consented. Herbert Golding was a man with an immense opinion of his own importance, carefully concealed behind a mask of outwardly pious and benevolent characteristics. He was a very different man to his dead partner, Henry Bryce. It is surprising how two men, directly opposite in character, managed to hit it off well in business. Henry Bryce was a bluff, hearty, hail-fellow well-met sort of man. He made no boast of possessing religious principles. He seldom went to church, but he did not think he should be refused admittance to the abode of the just on that account. He was probably right. He lived honestly and did many kindly actions. He hated hypocrisy and cant, and towards the latter end of his life, he commenced to think Herbert Golding was a bit of a humbug. Herbert Golding was not a bad-looking man. He was a bachelor about forty years of age, or a few years younger, and a favourite with the ladies. He was tall, had a good figure, and looked a gentleman. His face was clean-shaved, and he had mild blue eyes, which seemed to look benevolently on all mankind. His smile was not fascinating. It had something of the sneer in it. Had he cultivated a moustache, it would have been a decided sneer. He was very particular in his dress. He always wore dark clothes, and they were always of the best, but cut in an unassuming fashion. Herbert Golding always wore a top hat. Even in the intense heat of summer, he would not discard his shiny beaver. He attended church regularly, in fact was a shining light, and acted as vicar's church warden. The congregation at the particular church he favoured with his presence looked up to him and regarded him as a model man. The male members placed implicit confidence in him and took his advice on matters concerning their financial welfare. The female members made a fuss of him, there was no danger connected with such a moral man as Herbert Golding. His vicar regarded his churchwarden as his right-hand man, and relied upon him in everything. Herbert Golding was one of the founders and chairman of the directors of the Amalgamated Land and Investment Banking and Financial Company. A long name, but Herbert Golding was fond of high-sounding titles, and he had bestowed the name upon the company himself. He had wished to add half a dozen more words to the name of the company, but when a director pointed out that special envelopes would have to be made in order to get the address on, he gave way. Amalgamated Land and Investment Banking and Financial Company, he refused to budge from, and the name was adopted. The company flourished exceedingly, and gave 10% to depositors. Herbert Golding was regarded as a munificent benefactor to the human race of modest investors. Henry Bryce declined to have any share in this company, and he was lamentably deficient in common sense, so his partner said, for not investing a few thousands on fixed deposits at 10%. When Herbert Golding pressed the matter, Henry Bryce had said, 10% eh, Golding? That's very nice for the depositors if it lasts. But how about the poor devils your company lends money to? What interest do you charge them to pay 10% on fixed deposits and clear working expenses? No, Golding, that company won't suit me. Get some of your congregational friends to invest in it. I dare say your parson would put in a trifle. The black cloth gentry are desperately keen on 10%. Herbert Golding had replied, As you like but I can assure you it's a capital investment and as safe a concern as there is in Sydney. Such a highly respectable man as Herbert Golding must stand a good chance for Balmain East, said his supporters. 
Although somewhat prosy in his style, Herbert Golding was not a bad speaker. He had a good voice and a convincing way of putting things. He held out the part he had taken in establishing the Amalgamated Land and Investment etc. Company as a sop to the Labour Party and the working men, stating the company had been established mainly to benefit the workers, who could now obtain a large percentage for their small savings. He had nothing to do with shearing strikes. In fact, he was in favour of unionism. He eulogised the late Henry Bryce, but said he could not agree with him on the labour question. Herbert Golding had no hesitation in using his dead partner's name as a lever wherewith to hoist himself into the Legislative Assembly. There was not much time in which to work the electorate, but Herbert Golding did his best. He was here, there and everywhere, and it was surprising the number of people holding exactly opposite views that he agreed with. On one point he remained firm, much to the disgust of the committee. He would have nothing to do with the licensed victuallers. He went dead against them and in favour of the local option without compensation. He had his reward the next Sunday, when at church, as the vicar pointedly alluded to him in his discourse, and held him up as a man who would not pander to the vices of the community. After service he was congratulated on all sides. After his dinner, a remarkably good one for a bachelor, he uncorked a bottle of his favourite port, and smiled. Success to temperance! Herbert Golding preferred to be esteemed morally rather than politically. When the day of the election came, Herbert Golding felt anxious as to the result. If he won in the face of his opposition to the LVA, it would be a great moral victory. If defeated, he could assume a resigned attitude and point to the vile influence that had been at work against him. He was not defeated. He was triumphant. He smote the Labour candidate and the LVA candidate hip and thigh. He was surprised at his success. He headed the poll by a large majority. That Bryce affair did it, said the Labour members. Herbert Golding cared very little what circumstances had assisted in placing him at the head of the poll. He was a member for Balmain East, and that was enough for him. He could add MLA after his name, and write his letters from that wonderful menagerie known as the Parliament Buildings in Macquarie Street. He was a member of the Legislative Assembly, a lawmaker, a power in the land. He could feather his own nest out of the pickings in the Treasury, if there were any left, and he would be paid £300 a year by a confiding people for doing it. The mere thought of this made Herbert Golding look more pious and benevolent than ever, and his blue eyes fairly gleamed with sympathy for suffering humanity. Truly, it was a veritable triumph, and the righteous had prospered. The morning papers congratulated Balmain East on possessing such an admirable representative. Poor Henry Bryce, whose body was hardly cold in its grave, was forgotten. He might have been dead years. One paper hinted that such a man as Herbert Golding could not long be kept out of the ministry. Herbert Golding read all these notices. He actually purchased a book for newspaper cuttings and pasted them in. Such testimonials to his worth ought not, he felt, be lost to posterity. The new member was elated. He had forgotten all about his dead partner. Before Edward Bryce returned to Munda Station, he had gone thoroughly into his father's affairs, and Dr Langside had assisted him considerably. Herbert Golding was extremely obliging, and showed every consideration to the family of his late partner. He was to have sole management of the firm in Sydney, as Edward Bryce said he did not care for a town life. Ida Bryce decided to remain with her stepmother for a time, but she confided to her brother she did not think it would be for long. "'We shall not agree, Ted,' she said. "'When I find the situation irksome, I intend to apply to you for a situation as housekeeper at Munda.' "'Come whenever you like, Ida,' he said. "'The place has never been the same since you left. "'Old Wideawake says you were the only cheerful object "'within a radius of forty miles.' 
poor old wide awake said ida what an honest old fellow he is i'm sure there's a mystery about that man ted he's not always been a station hand i don't think he has said ted bryce he's an amusing old chap and he's well named he's a sharp customer and i like him and he's fond of you but who could help being so she added all the good qualities i may happen to possess i inherit from dear old dad said ted bryce sorrowfully was there ever such another man in the world no he was indeed a good kind father said his sister in a broken voice oh if i could only lay my hands on the man who murdered him said her brother clenching his fists it will come to light some day i want nothing better than to stand face to face with the man who struck him down then you're quite sure it was murder said ida yes said ted bryce i'm certain of it and so is dr langside in that case vengeance will surely overtake the man who did the deed said ida End of chapter three Chapter four of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Munda. Munda station was about five hundred miles west from Sydney on the western line. It was an immense station, covering about forty square miles of country. Louth was the nearest township, and Burke, about ninety miles distant, the nearest railway station. Munda was not a particularly enchanting place, but it was a good station in a season when rain was plentiful. About a hundred and thirty thousand sheep was an average shearing. Young Edward Bryce, at his own request, had been appointed manager at Munda, with several experienced men under him. Like his sister, he preferred the country to the town, and when he visited Sydney, he always felt stifled in the city, and was not sorry when the time came for him to return to Munda and comparative solitude. Town-bred men can never understand the charm of the lonely life some men lead on stations. They would die of ennui in less than a month. They cannot enter into or share the peculiar delight these station men out in the back blocks of Australia take in their existence. Edward Bryce, had he so wished, could have been a man about town with a place in his father's business house more as an excuse for an occupation than anything else his father would have made him an ample allowance but edward bryce was not built that way he did not mean to lead an idle useless life merely because his father had made money he was not a fop and had no inclination to do the block in pitt street and ogle the fair maidens of sydney who exposed their charms there dangling after the girls he considered not exactly a waste of time but a neglecting of opportunities yet edward bryce was no confirmed bachelor he was not a selfish man and nine out of every ten unmarried men are selfish on one of his trips to sydney he made the acquaintance of miss flora hanworth a sister of wyndham hanworth a well-known australian artist who was a great friend of edward bryce's if there was one thing Ted Bryce loved more than any other, it was pictures. He was fond of visiting the art gallery in Sydney, and one day he was pointing out to his sister what he considered a mistake in a bush scene, signed W.H. The man who painted that is an artist, said Ted Bryce, but he's made a mistake. I never saw a sheep lie down like that in my life, and I've seen some hundreds of thousands drop down both from a desire to do so from exhaustion and from death. I wish I had W. H. at Munda for a week. I'd soon prove to him where he was wrong. He's a clever fellow all the same, but I'll bet he never painted that sheep from life. You're perfectly correct, said a melodious voice behind them, which made Edward Bryce and his sister turn round hurriedly. They saw a good-looking man of about thirty smiling kindly at them. Ida Bryce saw at a glance that he had a mobile face, a heavy dark moustache, clear dark eyes, was not tall, but carried himself well, and looked, as he had spoken, like an educated man of the world. I did not paint that sheep from life, he added. Then I presume you are W. H., the painter of that picture, said Edward Bryce. He spoke without the least embarrassment, 
and the artist at once liked him for it. Had Edward Bryce commenced to make apologies for criticising the picture, the painter would have formed an unfavourable opinion of him. "'I am. My name is Wyndham Hanworth,' he said. "'I heard your remarks. They are perfectly just. That sheep is the blot in the picture.' "'Did you hear all I said?' asked Ted Bryce. "'Yes. I could not resist the temptation of listening to an unbiased criticism of my work,' said Wyndham Hanworth. "'Then will you accept my invitation and come to Munda and study sheep?' asked Ted Bryce, with a frank smile. "'With pleasure,' said the artist. "'It is too kind of you to invite me.' "'Not at all. It will be a pleasure to me to have a real live artist on the premises. "'I am very fond of pictures. Good pictures, I mean. Not like that.' And he pointed to an impossible figure of an undraped woman. Ida Bryce had time to observe the artist closely during this conversation, and she thought she would like him. She did like him when she knew him well, and that meeting in the art gallery had sealed a lasting friendship between the Bryces and the Hanworths. Wyndham Hanworth was not one of those men who did not believe in criticism, but he knew when a critic was up to his work. He knew also there were faults in his pictures, and he was only too glad to have them pointed out to him by men who knew more than he did. It does not follow that a man need be an artist to criticise pictures, or an actor to criticise acting, or an author to review books. Yet there are painters, actors and authors who declare that they do not believe in criticisms, even go so far as to say they never read them. How can you judge of the worth of criticism if you never read criticisms? asked Wyndham Hanworth of a brother artist, and the question remained unanswered, because it is unanswerable. The man who places himself above criticism is seldom worth being criticised. Wyndham Hanworth must be left to himself for the present. Munda Station and Edward Bryce demand attention. When Edward Bryce reached Munda on his return from his father's funeral in Sydney, he felt for the first time in his life the loneliness of his surroundings. It seemed to him he missed his father's presence. Although Henry Bryce seldom visited Munda during the last few years of his life, his son always felt his absent father's presence about the homestead. "'I must have a mate here for a time,' he mused. "'I never felt this depression before, but it is not to be wondered at when I think how dear old Dad died, and that I could not see him alive once more. Edward Bryce called his father Dad. It might sound childish to the modern young man, but when Edward Bryce said Dad, there was a world of affection in his voice, and there was not a man in all Australia who would have cared to hint the use of that word was ridiculous. Henry Bryce had always been Dad to his children, and such endearing terms as the governor, the old fossil, the pater, or the old man, were not familiar in the Bryce family. "'I wonder if Wyndham would come and take compassion on me,' he went on. "'It will be shearing time soon, and I fancy he would be able to paint a good picture with a shearing shed for a model. Hang it all, I'll try him. It takes a letter such a time to reach Sydney. I'll send a wire.' "'Hello there. Yes, sir. What is it? Oh, it's you, Wide Awake, is it?' said Ted, as a man stood in the doorway. I want to send a telegram to Sydney at once. Tell one of the lads to saddle up. Yes, sir, said the man. The telegram's to Mr. Hanworth, said Ted. You remember him? Rather, said Wide Awake. He's a real good sort, and he's a first-class artist. So he is, said Ted. I'm asking him to come and spend a few weeks with me. I feel a bit lonely. No wonder, said Wide Awake, shaking his head. And come back here and keep me company, said Ted Bryce, when you've seen the telegram sent off. Wide Awake disappeared. I wonder who the deuce that man is, said Ted Bryce to himself. Old Wide Awake, and he's not an old man by any means. It is the only name he's ever been known by here. He's about the best man we have on Munda, and that's a large order. Wide Awake returned, and Ted Bryce asked him to sit down and have a pipe handing him his pouch at the same time. There is considerably more freedom between master and man on an Australian station than between men of similar standing in the old country. 
on a big station are occasionally found broken down swells not in health but in pocket who are by no means depressed at their unlucky turn of fortune's wheel and who to their credit be it said often turn out real good men old wide awake as he was called had been picked up by ted bryce at burke during the race week young bryce had taken a fancy to old wide awake's looks and engaged him as a general hand about the homestead the man interested him and although he declined to give any name or the least information as to his antecedents or where he came from the young squatter had no reason to regret the trust he placed in him it is an awful thing this murder of my father said ted bryce news is slow in finding its way to these back country spots and wide awake although he knew of henry bryce's death did not know of the manner in which he had come to an untimely end murdered said wide awake you surely do not mean to say your father met with foul play such a man as your father could not have many enemies there can be no doubt unfortunately about the foul play replied ted he had a terrible blow on the back of his head which knocked him insensible dr langside says he was either knocked into the water or thrown in afterwards very strange said wide awake and have the police no clue was he robbed no said ted he was not robbed there was no motive of gain in the mind of the man who did the deed at least no immediate gain by robbery that is the strange part of the affair my father had attended an election meeting he was the candidate on our side for balmain east it was as he returned from the meeting he was attacked some people were inclined to blame the union men for it but i do not hold that opinion the unionists go too far sometimes but i do not think they would commit a cowardly act like that they'd fire a shed and poison non-unionists said wide awake that has been done ted bryce was silent he knew such things had taken place but still he did not think the men would treacherously murder an old man in cold blood excited by rioting they might commit desperate acts but this was a different matter altogether will anyone benefit by your father's death asked wide awake no one outside the family herbert golding his partner in the firm retains his portion and is now manager he has also been elected member for balmain east in place of my father they asked me to stand but i declined i think it only reasonable that mr golding should have been put in then the whole affair is a mystery said wide awake yes replied ted i have offered a reward of five hundred pounds for information that will lead to the conviction of the murderer i have an idea something may be gleaned about it during net shearing said wide awake how said ted surprised well you see we get a lot of all sorts of men around munda at that time and if you adopt your father's plan and decline to shear under union rules we shall have a very mixed lot indeed here and a heap of ruffians who will loaf about and sponge on a union camp yes said ted what then these men talk a lot the death of your father is sure to crop up i'll keep my ears open and learn what they have to say something may leak out we can never tell even the faintest clue sometimes turns out strong when followed up i don't believe any of the shearers were responsible for my father's death said ted perhaps not but you know there are men who hang on to the union ranks who are out and out scoundrels it's these men who commit all the outrages and the union men suffer for it said wide awake perhaps you're right said ted but where's the motive for such an outrage if we could discover the motive the perpetrator of the crime might be traced depend upon it the man or men who murdered your father were instigated to commit the crime by some individual desirous of getting rid of him said wide awake that may be so said ted but i have no idea who could possibly be anxious to remove my father time alone may reveal that said wide awake i do not believe crimes such as this are allowed to go unpunished sooner or later the evil doer is unmasked the longer his crime remains undiscovered the greater his punishment he carries about with him a load of guilt that crushes him down his burden becomes greater than he can bear and as he can confide in no one 
gets no one to share the weight of his terrible secret. At last he voluntarily confesses his guilt. I've often read of cases where men confess to a murder after years of silence. Death to them is preferable to carrying their frightful load of guilt. And they have no dread of the scaffold. No man ever sinned and remained unpunished. His punishment may not be publicly known, but he suffers torture in secret. He's condemned by himself, by the weight of evidence he adduces against himself, and upon which he convicts himself to years of misery, worse than mere imprisonment or death. A guilty man at liberty sees in each fellow man a possible accuser. He lives in daily, hourly dread of the arresting hand upon his shoulder. He looks at his fellow men in the face, in fear and trembling. Believe me, a guilty man at liberty is more bound and fettered than a man who lawfully suffers for his crime. Ted Bryce looked hard at Wide Awake as he spoke these words, vehemently and with some emotion. "'Yours must have been a strange life,' said Ted. "'It has,' said Wide Awake. "'I know what a guilty man must suffer, because I have borne the burden of a guilt not my own. I know how I have suffered being guiltless. What then must be the suffering of a man knowing himself guilty of a crime for which an innocent man is blamed?' Ted Bryce placed his hand on old Wide Awake's shoulder and looked him in the face. "'I believe what you say,' he said. "'I know I can trust you. Keep your name and your secret. I do not want to learn either. But remember this. If ever you want a friend to assist you, think of me and I will not fail you. There's my hand on it, Wide Awake.' "'God bless you,' said Wide Awake, as he grasped Ted Bryce's hand. Then he turned and left the room." End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Who Did It?" by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Artist When Wyndham Hanworth received Edward Bryce's telegram, he at once sent a reply that he would leave Sydney for Munda in a couple of days. Wyndham Hanworth was rapidly advancing in his profession, which he dearly loved, and several of his pictures had fetched fair prices. Before he left for Munda, he called to see Ida Bryce. Ida was always pleased to see him. She admired him and wished she could assist him in his work. She was also very fond of Flora Hanworth, who kept house for her brother, as they were orphans and had earned their own living for several years. She knew her brother was partial to Flora, and she did not wonder at it, for the artist's sister was an amiable, attractive girl, of a refined disposition, and well-educated. "'I'm glad to see you, Mr. Hanworth,' said Ida. "'You are quite a stranger. It seems ages since I saw you last.' Wyndham Hanworth smiled as he replied, "'Not ages, Miss Bryce. I called here three weeks ago.' "'Ah,' said Ada, with a sigh, "'poor old Dad was alive then.' His death has been, and still is, hardly realised by me. I seem to fancy he will return home at any moment. No one could have been more shocked or have sympathised with you more deeply than my sister and myself. I owe much of my success to your father, Miss Bryce. He purchased several of my pictures, and that assisted me at a critical time, said Wyndham. My father admired your work. He did not profess to be a judge of painting, but he bought pictures that pleased him. I should never buy a picture myself, because a certain artist painted it. I should always buy the picture that gave me the most pleasure to look at, said Ida. There you are right, said the artist. I often think that the gaudy coloured pictures we see in a humble dwelling give the occupants as much pleasure or more than a nobleman's gallery affords him. But I did not come here to talk shop, Miss Bryce, he added. I have received a telegram from your brother. He says he feels lonely at Munda, and asks me to go and spend a week or two with him. "'And you will go?' said Ida eagerly. "'Yes, Miss Bryce. I can understand his feelings. I leave to-morrow,' said Wyndham Hanworth. "'You are my brother's best friend,' said Ida. "'I am anxious about him. He seems altered since Dad's death. I am afraid he will never rest until he has traced out the perpetrators of the outrage.' "'I will do all in my power to rouse him,' said Wyndham. 
I shall also be able to obtain some sketches. The shearing will be on soon, and I may perhaps be persuaded to remain until it commences. I do hope you will, said Ida. I will ask Flora to stay with me here until your return. That is very kind of you, he said. I shall be glad to know she is left in such safe hands. She is a most delightful companion, said Ida. Mrs. Bryce came into the room, and Wyndham shook hands with her. He did not like Mrs. Bryce. Like many other people, he could never understand Henry Bryce marrying her. When Mrs. Bryce heard he was going to Munda, she merely said, Give my love to Edward. I hope you will have a pleasant visit. Perhaps he has some pet horses, or dogs, or a tame kangaroo he wants you to paint for him. Edward always appears to place animals on a higher level than human beings. Perhaps it is because he is associated with them more... I think Ted likes animals, said Ida, quietly, because they are true and faithful to people who are kind to them. In my short experience, I have often found human beings are seldom grateful, and often sneer at people who are unselfish enough to do them good turns. Wyndham Hanworth felt it was time to make his adieu, and accordingly did so. Ida Bryce went to the door with him, and said, my stepmother, I am afraid, is not overwhelmed with love for either Ted or myself. Be sure, if Ted asks you, say I am quite contented here. I feel it is my duty to remain for a time, but I do not think I can bear it much longer. Wyndham Hanworth understood her, and merely said he would do as she wished. Ida, said Mrs. Bryce when she returned to the room, I cannot understand why you make such a fuss of a man in Mr. Hanworth's position. He's an artist, said Ida. He's also a gentleman. I do not make a fuss of him. He would be the first to resent fussiness from anyone. He's not a suitable companion for a girl in your position, said Mrs. Bryce. A painter, a man who paints sheep and bush scenes and huts and hovels and such things. My father sold sheep and bush scenes and huts and hovels and such things, said Ida. Don't talk nonsense, Ida. Your father was a stock and station agent, not a painter, said Mrs. Bryce. We shall not agree on the subject, said Ida, so let it rest. My father did not object to Wyndham Hanworth. Your father often made acquaintance outside his own circle that it would have been better for him had he not done so said Mrs. Bryce. Ida Bryce was about to reply, in a manner that would have caused Mrs. Bryce to fly into a passion by hinting that her stepmother was one of the undesirable acquaintances in question. She refrained, however, and merely said, I shall ask Flora Hanworth to stay with me during her brother's absence, if you have no objection. But I have objection, said Mrs. Bryce. Flora Hanworth is beneath you in social position. Not at all, said Ida. She's a lady. There are no lower grades in the ranks of ladies. I will not have Flora Hanworth staying in my house, said Mrs. Bryce. And I am afraid I shall have to go and stay with Flora, said Ida. I have no doubt we shall manage very well together. In fact, I should rather enjoy it. I forbid you to do anything of the kind, said Mrs. Bryce. If Flora does not come here, I shall most certainly go there if she will have me said Ida. Mrs. Bryce knew Ida well, and had not the least doubt she would do as she said. Your father spoils both you and Edward, said Mrs. Bryce. He was the best father that ever lived, said Ida. Dear old dad. Ida, do not be so absurd. Absurd, said Ida. Yes, calling your father dad. It is childish, said Mrs. Bryce. Then I shall always remain childish, said Ida. He was dad to me alive. He is dad to me now more than ever. You cannot understand. It is useless for me to explain all that simple word means to me. Ida left the room, feeling she could not keep her tears back. Wyndham Hanworth left by the night mail for Burke. It was a tedious journey, and he was heartily tired of the train when it steamed into Burke Station. He took the coach to Louth, and there Edward Bryce met him with a buggy and pair. "'You're a good fellow to take compassion on my loneliness, Wynne, said Ted Bryce. "'I know what an awful drag that five hundred miles of a railway journey is, especially in this sort of weather. 
I can tell you, old man, we're in for a scorcher. At Monday yesterday, it was over a hundred under the veranda. A hot welcome, Ted, said the artist. A very hot welcome. All the same, I'm glad to see you. Have you brought your tackle with you? said Ted. Fishing tackle? asked Wyndham. Now, you're better at catching expressions and finishing touches than fishes. You know what I mean. All the cargo into the buggy, or perhaps I'd better send a wagon for the stock in trade, if it's very bulky. Don't chaff, Ted. It does not become you. Be serious and sober-minded, and drive me at a steady pace to Munda. Mind, I distinctly said, at a steady pace. The last time those greys flew over the ground. I believe they are the very pair. Is there an accident insurance office handy? he asked. I'll not kill you, Win," said Ted, laughing. I'll strap you in if you prefer it. Joking apart, I'll go steady in deference to your shattered city nervous system. Fifteen miles an hour. How will that suit you? Halve it, my boy, halve it, said Wyndham. Fifteen miles an hour. I shall be a thing of shreds and patches long before we reach Munda if you drive at that pace. By this time, Hanworth's baggage was put in the buggy, and in a few minutes they were off. How those greys could travel! They disdained to trot, and preferred a good gallop when their master was willing. They seemed to revel in the exercise, and the buggy and its occupants did not trouble them in the least. "'This is glorious,' said the artist, with evident satisfaction. "'Beats your towns hollow,' said Ted. "'Yes,' replied his companion. "'There's plenty of scope here,' and he waved his hand. For miles and miles there was nothing but open country. The grass was fast being burnt up with the scorching sun, turning to a dingy brown, and already cracks were to be seen in the baked ground. Still, the want of rain had not been severely felt as yet. It was a wonderful sight, this vast tract of land, level as a billiard-table on every side. "'I wish some rain would come,' said Ted Bryce. "'It will be getting serious in another couple of weeks. The river is low, but navigable still.' That will not last long, and we know what to expect when the darling dries up. Want of water is the great drawback here, said the artist. What a paradise this place would be if the rain could be depended upon. How do these artesian bores act? Very well, but we cannot get them on this side of the river. The nature of the ground will not allow it. They have them on Dunlop, and there has been an immense supply of water from them. I believe one or two are nearly exhausted, and the remainder are shortening in supply. For my own part, I do not think they are permanent. I wish they were. It would be a grand thing for the country if these bores were inexhaustible, said Wyndham. Yes, replied Ted. They are, however, wonderful even now, and who knows in time what further discoveries may be made. When do you commence shearing? asked Wyndham. Probably next week. We are hurrying up, because if the drought gets very bad, it will stop us, said Ted. I want you to paint a picture of our shearing shed, Wyn. I'm sure you would make a big hit with it. There's such a variety in it for you, and it would be a real Australian scene. You may see some fun here. I'm not going to sign the union agreement, and I fancy Munda will be made a test shed. I thought the union men swore there would be no trouble at Munda again, when you disbelieved the rumours circulated that your father's death was caused by some of these men, said Wyndham. The men were sincere when they said it, replied Ted, but the union is all-powerful, and unionists must obey orders, no matter what their own particular intentions may be. But that's tyranny, said Wyndham. Exactly so, replied Ted. There are no more tyrannical men on the face of the earth than the unionist leaders. I think they do not understand freedom of contract, because they have no freedom amongst themselves. I do not blame the men for all the trouble and strikes. I blame their leaders. Many of these leaders are nothing more than paid agitators, frothy-mouthed windbags, men who fatten on agitation and live well on union funds. I do not say all are alike, but I know some leaders of the unionists who brag of their influence and sneer at the men they dupe. Why not sign the unionist agreement? asked Wyndham. Would it not save trouble? Yes, said Ted Bryce, but I believe, as my father did, that every man has a right to employ who he likes to do his work. I will give them union wages, but I shall decline to be bound down to employ none but union men. I think you are right, said the artist. What a pity there is not more harmony between employers and employed. 
i expect there is a good deal of obstinacy on each side obstinate i may be said ted bryce but i believe in freedom unionism does not give men freedom for it makes them slaves it deprives a man of the right to think and act for himself but luke wynn there's manda and we will drop this subject you can see how it works for yourself if there's trouble over the shearing the greys dashed along at a great pace they knew they were near home union or non-union arguments troubled them not they were happy under the control of their master acknowledging his kindness and never feeling their subjection manda said wyndham howarth hurrah for manda we're far from the madding crowd here at all events wait and see said ted bryce there's the shearers camp over yonder you'll see a crowd there that will amuse you and furnish you with a whole portfolio full of sketches End of chapter 5「6 of Who Did It」by Nat Gould This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two Girls The battle royal had taken place, and Mrs. Bryce suffered defeat. Ida Bryce gained the day, and Flora Hanworth was a visitor at Potts Point. Of course, Flora knew nothing of what had taken place, or she would have been the very least person to have accepted the invitation. If Flora Hanworth was poor, it only made her prouder and more susceptible to the least slight. She knew how Ida was situated regarding her stepmother, and Flora had accepted the invitation more for Ida's sake than her own. Mrs. Bryce felt compelled to act amicably if she did not feel amiable. She was rather afraid of Ida, and dreaded a scene if she was not as polite as a hostess should be to Flora Hanworth. Still, she could not prevent an occasional sarcastic remark, and Flora Hanworth was quick to notice the least slight. "'I do not think Mrs. Bryce cares for me to be here,' she said to Ida. "'Whatever induces you to think so?' replied Ida, with well-feigned surprise. "'Because of certain remarks she has made,' said Flora. "'My dear Flora, you must take no notice of Mrs. Bryce's little peculiarities. She does not mean anything. She only tries to be effective, and to say smart things,' said Ida. "'At my expense,' said Flora. "'Smart things are generally said at the expense of someone,' said Ida. "'I assure you, Mrs. Bryce gives me very little rest.' She uses me as a target to fire her shots at, but I'm afraid they do not very often hit the mark. Ida, you are not happy here, said Flora gently. I can see that. Is there anything I can do for you, be of any help to you? I shall never be happy in this house, said Ida sadly. It is not so much Mrs. Bryce's manner to me as the thoughts of how much I have lost here that renders it unbearable. You will go to your brother when you leave here, said Flora, taking it for granted Ida would change her residence before long. Yes, replied Ida, he has promised to give me a situation as housekeeper at Munda. Flora smiled and coloured slightly, as she thought that she would not mind being permanently installed as housekeeper to Edward Bryce. I am sure the situation would suit you admirably, she said. What fun it would be if we both went to Munda while your brother is there, said Ida. I'll write to Ted and ask him if he can accommodate us. He will not wait to reply by post. He will at once wire back. By all means, come immediately. How can you, Ida? said Flora, who was nevertheless pleased at such a prospect. We could not possibly visit a house inhabited by two bachelors. You forget Mrs. O'Brien, said Ida with a laugh. Bridges is a perfect she-dragon. She would guard us from all dangers and draw lurid pictures of the consequences of too close an intimacy with young men. Mrs. O'Brien has been in charge at Munda for years. She looks after Ted as though he were still a child. Good old Bridget, she nursed us both. She is a large-hearted Irish woman, and Mrs. O'Brien is better known out west than any woman in the district. Mrs. O'Brien's presence certainly facilitates matters. I agree with you, Ida. It would be capital fun, but what would Mrs. Bryce say? asked Flora. Raise objections, said Ida. She will point out that such conduct on the part of two hitherto respectable girls would be outrageous, 
she would say it was indelicate i really believe she would hint that i had designs on wyndham and that you were about to lay siege to ted's young affections said ida with a sly glance at her companion flora was indignant or pretended to be ida thought the pretence predominated such things might be said about our visit said flora demurely it would be absurd of course i am no fonder of mr bryce than you are of wyndham i mean in that way oh you know what i mean she added as she saw her companion laughing but i am very fond of your brother said ida smiling and i am sure you like ted we should be a merry family mrs o'brien would preside at the table and see that we behaved like good boys and girls will you agree to go to munda with me if ted will have us and your brother will permit it if you wish it said flora but this is such a sudden freak whatever will mrs bryce say she will say a good deal replied ida and think a lot more than she says but mrs bryce will have to give in it may be wicked of me but i am beginning to thoroughly detest mrs bryce ida you must not say that said flora remember she was your father's choice that only makes matters worse said ida it is for that very reason i dislike her conduct this is not right it is not like you ida said flora oh you don't know all said ida if you realised what i feel you would not blame me she has insulted the memory of my father it is that makes her society unbearable to me what do you mean asked flora i mean that mrs bryce has so far forgotten what is due to my father's memory said ida that she encourages the attentions of a possible successor to him impossible you must be mistaken said flora shocked unfortunately there can be no mistake about it said ida he has called here several times who has called said flora mr golding said ida your father's partner said flora but he is one of the executors no doubt he comes to consult her on business matters that is what i thought at first said ida although i had my suspicions mrs bryce was far too familiar with mr golding when my father was alive accidentally i learned mr golding did not come here on business connected with my father's will he came here on business connected with my father's widow surely there must be some mistake said flora mrs bryce would never so far forget herself as to encourage another suitor for her hand and your father dead such a short time you do not understand mrs bryce said ida i do i tell you it makes my blood boil to see how she encourages mr golding but has he no sense of shame said flora no idea of what is right and proper he was your father's partner he is a very religious man or professes to be so surely he cannot be such a consummate hypocrite i never liked mr golding said ida he once actually proposed to me i have never forgiven him for that insult insult ida said flora surely it is not an insult for herbert golding to offer you his hand it was said ida passionately it was a gross insult he could not possess himself of mrs bryce so he magnanimously offered to make me mrs golding he got his answer you did not insult him i hope said flora oh no said ida i calmed my feelings as he was my father's partner i declined the honour i said he hardly knew what he was saying i put it down to the champagne but he is a staunch abstainer said flora so he said replied ida he said miss bryce i never drink anything stronger than water and what did you say ida i said then there can be no excuse for your conduct and bade him go replied ida does your brother know of this said flora no replied ida i did not tell ted it might have caused trouble and poor old dad hated scenes ted would probably have thrashed him had i told him all this is monstrous said flora i always understood from the vicar mr golding is such a devout trustworthy man i am afraid your vicar is deceived in him said ida mr golding's outward devotions are very different from his inward meditations ida i want you for a moment called mrs bryce the girls were seated on the veranda and mrs bryce's voice startled them ida at once went inside leaving flora in her chair 
Mr. Golding is coming to dinner, said Mrs. Bryce, looking at her keenly. He has some business matters to talk over with me, so I thought it only polite to ask him. Of course, I should not have asked anyone else so soon after my husband's death. Mr. Golding seems to have a considerable amount of business with you, said Ida. Of course, I have no objection to his coming to dinner. He's not my guest. You are so peculiar in your ideas, said Mrs. Bryce. I thought it better to tell you now. Perhaps you will think an idea I have at this particular moment is peculiar, said Ida. It depends upon what it is, said Mrs. Bryce, rather nervously. I have been thinking how delightful it would be for Flora and myself to go to Munda for a week or two, said Ida. Mrs. Bryce wished nothing better than to have the house to herself, but she pretended to be shocked at such a suggestion. Really, Ida, I wonder what you will do next, she said. How can you possibly go to Munda? Mr. Hanworth is there. It would be positively indelicate. I failed to see it, said Ida. Mrs. O'Brien is there, and Ted, and Flora would go with me. I have no doubt she would, said Mrs. Bryce sarcastically. Your brother is there. I see no greater impropriety in Flora and myself visiting Munda than I do in Mr. Golding visiting you, said Ida, and the accent on the you was pointed. Mrs. Bryce was angry. Her stepdaughter had such an unpleasant way of putting things. The cases are entirely different, said Mrs. Bryce. I am a widow, and Mr. Golding is my late husband's executor. It is necessary he should come here. On business, said Ida, with considerable meaning underlying the words. Do you mean to hint that Mr. Golding does not come on business? said Mrs. Bryce angrily. Oh, dear, no said Ida, but some men have such a happy way of combining business and pleasure. Mrs. Bryce commenced to feel uncomfortable. Those calm, steady eyes of her stepdaughter seemed to search her through and through, and to probe to the uttermost her shallow nature. She controlled her temper and said, And pray, when do you propose to go in this wild excursion to Munda? I am writing to Ted at once, if you have no objection to offer to our going said Ida. It would be no use my offering objections, said Mrs. Bryce. You always disregard my advice. If your brother thinks it a proper thing for you to do, I raise no objection. Then it is settled, said Ida. Perhaps you will mention the matter to Mr. Golding. He may wish me to take a message to my brother. Mrs. Bryce felt there was some hidden meaning in Ida's words. She would have given much to know her stepdaughter's opinion of Herbert Golding. She hardly understood Herbert Golding herself, but she was fascinated by him, and did not discourage his evident attentions to herself. A shallow woman like Mrs. Bryce was amenable to flattery, and no one knew how to take advantage of this better than Herbert Golding. "'Flora, we are to go to Munda if they will have us,' said Ida joyfully. "'Have you spoken to Mrs. Bryce already about it?' said Flora in surprise. Yes, I thought it better to get it over. She called me in to say that Mr. Golding was invited to dinner, so I retaliated by saying we were about to storm Munda. Was she very shocked? said Flora. Very, said Ida, to all outward appearances. Inwardly she was delighted to be rid of us. Now I will go and inform Ted of our plans. We shall look ridiculous if he refuses to have us. He will not refuse, said Flora. He will be so glad to have you there. And someone else too, I expect, sly boots, said Ida with a merry laugh. Come to my room while I write the letter, Flora. Perhaps you would like to add a postscript on your own account. Ida, you are ridiculous, said Flora. I will write to Wyndham while you write to your brother. Two such missives cannot fail to have the desired result, replied Ida. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Who Done It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two men. From my sister, said Ted Price as he opened the letter bag which had just arrived at Munda, and looked at the envelope he held in his hand. From my sister, said Wyndham Hanworth as he took the letter handed to him. Chorus. <laughs> 
What, what can, can they, they have, have to, to write, write about? about? The two men sat down and read their letters. Well, said Ted, looking up with a smile. Well, echoed Wyndham, returning the smile. I expect your letter closely resembles mine, said Ted. Probably, said Wyndham. I am surprised at Flora. Of course, it's quite impossible. What's impossible? asked Ted Bryce. That Flora should come to Munda with your sister. Nonsense, said Ted Bryce. I shall send a wire telling them to pack up and come at once. We shall be busy with shearing, but the girls will enjoy the scene. I do not think Flora ought to come, said Wyndham. It does not look well, Ted. Hang the looks. Let us consult Mrs. O'Brien, said Ted. Mrs. O'Brien answered to the summons. She was a stout, strongly built woman, with a coarse, homely, honest face, and looked quite capable not only of taking care of herself, but of a whole family. "'I'll give her a start,' whispered Ted Bryce to the artist. "'Mrs. O'Brien,' said Ted solemnly, "'Miss Ida and Miss Flora Hanworth will be here on the day after tomorrow.' Mrs. O'Brien held up both hands, gave a gasp and dropped into a cane chair that creaked under her weight. "'Bless us, Master Edward,' she said. "'You're joking.' Mrs. O'Brien had made rigorous attempts to refrain from calling him Master Edward, but all had turned out failures. Edward Bryce did not object to it. He knew what an honest old soul Mrs. O'Brien was. "'I'm not joking,' said Ted Bryce. Here is Miss Ida's letter. She says she's coming and bringing Miss Hanworth with her. I think you know, when my sister states her intention of doing a certain thing, she generally carries it out. Sure she does, said Mrs. O'Brien. But it's dreadful, it really is. What shall I do with them, and the shearing coming on? Can you manage to look after them? said Ted Bryce. If we must, I must, said Mrs. O'Brien. If Miss Ida says she's coming, she'll come and nobody will stop her. Bless her dear heart. She always was so wilful. Worse than me? asked Ted. Lawks, yes, said Mrs. O'Brien. You was bad enough, Master Edward, but Miss Ida was a whole regiment in comparison. Wyndham Hanworth laughed heartily. You have seen my sister, Mrs. O'Brien? he asked. Yes, sir, and she's a sweet, pretty young lady. I expect I'll be able to manage her better than Miss Ida. "'Oh, deary me, what a time I shall have,' said Mrs. O'Brien. "'Then I will tell my sister you will have all prepared for them,' said Ted Bryce. "'I'll do my best, Master Edward,' replied Mrs. O'Brien. "'There's plenty of room for em at Munda, that's one comfort. "'I hope them shearers will keep quiet. "'If it come to war, they might frighten the ladies.' "'I do not think it would quite come to war,' said Ted, laughing. If, however, it does come to war, you must act as their bodyguard. Guard em with me body, is it? said Mrs. O'Brien. I'd like to see the son of em that'd lay a finger on my young lady. And she flourished a brawny arm fiercely. You see, Wynne, said Ted, smiling. Our sisters will be perfectly safe in Mrs. O'Brien's care. In that case, I waive my objection, said Wyndham. Let them come by all means. I'm sure Flora will enjoy it immensely. So it was decided to send a telegram, asking the girls to come at once, and Ted and Wyndham would meet them at Louth. "'I told you so,' said Ida to Flora, when she received the wire. "'We are to go at once.' Mrs. Bryce was duly informed of their decision, and feebly protesting, she allowed them to depart. She had informed Mr. Golding of the approaching departure of the girls, and he had been secretly elated at the prospect of seeing Mrs. Bryce alone more frequently. It was a dusty, hot journey to Burke, but the two girls did not mind it in the least. To Flora, everything was strange. She had never been so far up country before, and the sights were new to her. The coach ride from Burke was not agreeable. Ida thought, Ida thought she had never been so bumped about before and Flora was in constant dread of the coach capsizing. At Louth they were heartily greeted by their brothers, and the drive to Munda was one of enjoyment. At Munda, Mrs. O'Brien almost wept for joy at seeing Miss Ida again. 
and Flora thought they could not come to much harm with such a good motherly soul to look after them. They were quickly at home at Munda, and Flora thought it a delightful place. How quiet and tranquil it all seemed after the bustle of the city. She was not surprised that Edward Bryce preferred to live at Munda. She liked him all the better for it. He was so different from these town men, so much more manly and self-reliant. And Edward Bryce felt there was a new interest in his life now Flora Hanworth had come to Munda. The homestead seemed to have undergone a sudden transformation since the two girls arrived. Their presence brightened everything, and Wyndham Hanworth thought he had never seen Ida Bryce look so well as she did, free and unfettered at Munda. Mrs. O'Brien was here, there and everywhere, looking after the comfort of the girls. The men could shift for themselves now, it was her young lady she had to consider. The girls retired early the night of their arrival, and as it was moonlight and almost as light as day, Ted Bryce and his companion went for a stroll in the cooler air of the evening. Thousands upon thousands of sheep had been brought in ready for shearing, and they could be seen, lying thick, almost like snow upon the ground. "'Shall you have a big tally this year?' asked Wyndham. "'I think so,' replied Ted. "'I expect to shear about a hundred and thirty thousand. "'What an enormous lot,' said Wyndham. "'It seems so to you,' said Ted. "'But there are larger stations than mine out west. "'I've known sixty thousand sheep and lambs die in a drought. "'It is simply terrible to see the tracks covered with bleached bones.' "'What a careless sort of life these shearers lead,' said Wyndham. "'Free and easy,' replied Ted. "'They knock up a good cheque and then go to the nearest town and knock it down. "'The bulk of their money, I'm afraid, goes to the publicans. "'Come over to the camp. I see the lights are in yet. "'You will see some rough customers.' "'The shearers' camp was pitched near the main track, "'which ran through Munda Station, and was not far from the Darling River.' There must have been a couple of hundred men there, and as Edward Bryce said, some of them were rough customers. As they neared the camp, several men stared at them, and presently one man, evidently superior to the others, came forward. "'Good evening, Mr. Bryce,' he said. "'Glad to see you. I was wishing to speak to you.' "'Anything important, Dow?' asked Ted. Turning to Wyndham Hanworth, he said, "'This is Tom Dow.' He's one of the unionist leaders, but I'm glad to say he's more moderate than some of them. Glad to hear it, said Wyndham. A little moderation never comes amiss. You're right there, said Tom Dow. But there ought to be moderation on both sides. I wanted to ask you, Mr Bryce, if you had fully made up your mind not to sign the agreement. I mean to act as my father acted, said Ted Bryce. I will pay union wages, but I will not be tied down by any hard and fast agreement. "'I'm sorry you will not shear under union rules,' said Tom Dow. "'If you agree to the rate of pay, "'I fail to see what objection you can have to abiding by the rules.' "'My objection is this,' said Ted. "'I think I have a perfect right to employ non-union men, if I think proper. "'There are men who were here last shearing, "'and I'm not going to send them away when they stood by my father "'and got him out of a difficulty.' "'Then I'm afraid there will be trouble, Mr Bryce,' said Dow. We have a determined lot of men in camp here, and I will make yours a test shed. That, of course, remains with them, said Ted. I claim the right to do as I feel disposed in this matter. They can do the same. All I can say is, I'm sorry, said Tom Dow. You stuck up for the men when it was hinted they had a hand in your father's death, and you were right. I'm certain none of our men would do such a deed. If we did not agree with your father, we respected him. Was it not stated during the election that there would be no disturbance at Munda this shearing? asked William Hanworth. I believe so, replied Tom Dow. But you must remember, the men who made that promise were not as a rule shearers. They merely expressed their opinion as to what the shearers would do. I believe if it rested with you, Dow, there would be very little trouble here, and I'm sorry that it does not said Ted Bryce. I hope, however, the men will agree to shear, without endeavouring to force me to sign any agreement. One thing you may tell them, Dow, and that is, I shall not give way.' 
I'll do my best to bring about a settlement, said Tom Dow, but my instructions are positive, and I must not disobey orders. What is the general feeling among the men? asked Ted. The bulk of them would agree to work at union rates without any signing, I think, said Tom Dow. There are, however, several men in camp who rule the others. These men will stick out for the employment of unionists only. Has there been any mention of my father's death in the camp? asked Ted Bryce. Yes, replied Dow. It is often mentioned, but I've heard no opinion given as to how it happened or the reason for the outrage. It is a strange thing to me no clue has been discovered. You knew my father, said Ted. Have you formed any idea on the subject? Nothing definite, said Dow. At first I thought it was an attempt at robbery, but such turned out not to be the case. I shall never rest until the man who committed the deed is brought to justice, said Ted Bryce. I don't believe there's a man in this camp that would not rejoice to see the murder of your father caught, said Dow. Do what you can to bring about a peaceable arrangement, said Ted Bryce to Dow, as they turned to walk back to the homestead. That man has a good face, said Wyndham Hanworth. Is he a leader amongst these men? Partly so, said Ted. "'and he is secretary for the district. "'He has more than one camp to look after. "'You'll be able to get a few sketches tomorrow, "'for the men are coming up to the shed "'to see what arrangements I'm going to make.' "'Will there be a row?' asked the artist. "'Not tomorrow. That will come later,' replied Ted. "'At this moment a thoroughbred youngster galloped past them. "'There goes a young un that'll make a flyer before long,' said Ted. "'He's by Phantom.' Oh, by the by, you've not heard about the phantom horse. I must try and let you have a peep at him. He's been running loose here for some years. No one can catch him. He's a wonder and a beauty to look at. The phantom horse, said Wyndham. Is he a wild horse? A blood stallion, said Ted. He has a history which you shall hear some day. That two-year-old is by him. That's why I said he was by phantom. I did not know you went in for race horses said Wyndham. We have some well-bred ones on the station, said Ted, but I've never raced much, except at Burke, Forbes, Bathurst and country meetings. If that young phantom is good enough, I shall send him to a Randwick trainer to see what he can do with him. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Who Did It?" by Nat Gould this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Old Wide Awake The night Edward Bryce and his friend Wyndham Hanworth visited the Shearer's camp, Old Wide Awake was there. Wide Awake was well known to most of the men, and as he had had nothing to do with the shearing, the Unionists admitted him to their camp, and he enlivened the night for them by playing the accordion or telling some story of adventure. Such men as Wide Awake, known only by their nicknames, are often found in the camps, and no one tries to find out who they really are. Wide Awake was bent on discovering if any of these men knew what had led to the murder of Mr. Bryce. He had a difficult task before him, because if his purpose were suspected, and they became aware he had a suspicion of some of their number, he would be in considerable danger. Wide Awake was, however, used to dangers of many kinds. His life had been risked too often for him to value it highly. He had seen Edward Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth visit the camp, and observed them in conversation with Tom Dow, but they had not seen him. "'Well, Mr. Dow,' said Wide Awake, "'what chance is there of this affair ending peaceably?' "'Not much, I'm afraid,' was the reply. "'Mr. Bryce is obstinate.' "'Once he makes up his mind, he takes a deal of shifting,' said Wide Awake. "'But he's just a man, all the same.' "'Come, Widey, give us a tune,' said one of the men. "'All right,' replied Wide Awake, and commenced a popular music-hall ditty, and the chorus was quickly taken up. The shearers were spread about in groups. The bulk of them were clad in moleskin pants and merino singlets, and were quite warm enough without more clothes on. They were a strange-looking lot of men, and some of them had villainous faces, 
while others showed traces of better days. Wide Awake, having played several tunes, put down his accordion and commenced to chat. Sporting topics were the chief subject of conversation. The betting on the next big event was discussed, and the chances of the horses summed up, according to individual ideas of their merits. Some chance remark gave Wide Awake the opportunity he desired, and he said, "'What a mysterious affair that murder of Henry Bryce was!' "'You think it was murder?' said one of the men. "'Not much doubt about it,' said Wide Awake. "'When a man is poleaxed on the head and his body is found in the water, there's not much difficulty in arriving at a conclusion as to how he came by his death.' "'I don't believe he was murdered,' said the man. "'I mean intentionally. Perhaps he got into a row, and a blow he received was aimed at someone else.' "'A likely yarn, that,' said Wide Awake. "'It's as good a yarn as yours, anyway,' said the man, who was a bully and not liked in the camp. "'That's a matter of opinion,' said Wide Awake. Quarrels soon arise in these mixed communities, and the men are never loath to witness a fight. The man who was talking to Wide Awake was a big hulking fellow named Eli Spence, a bully, but a coward at heart. His size made most of the men fight shy of him, but they would have given a trifle to see him taken down in a stand-up fight. Eli Spence was always ready to bandy words with any man, and he regarded Wide Awake as fair game to insult, or merely poke fun at, as occasion might arise. "'Well, your opinion ain't worth much,' said Eli Spence. "'I was at that election meeting when Henry Bryce spoke. It's my belief that Henry Bryce was not sober.' and when a man's had drink it's easy enough for him to run his head against a post or to fall into the water wide awake looked closely at eli spence when he said he was at mr bryce's election meeting what are you staring at said eli insolently perhaps you don't think i was at the meeting call me a liar at once i never said you were not there said wide awake you gave me the information yourself i did not ask you for it "'Then what are you staring at me for?' said Eli. "'I fancied I'd seen you before,' said Wide Awake. "'Oh, indeed. And where did you see me, Mr. No Name?' said Eli Spence. "'I had dropped that, Eli,' sang out a man in the group. "'A man can go under any name he likes here. "'It's no business of ours,' came from several quarters. "'I saw you, I believe, in San Francisco,' said Wide Awake. Eli Spence gave a slight start. Then he swore and said he had never been to Frisco in his life. He'd never been out of Australia and didn't want to go. Then I'm mistaken, said Wide Awake. As to my having no name, I prefer Wide Awake to that of Eli Spence, ex-policeman. What's that, Widey? shouted several men. Is Eli an ex-policeman? Ask him, said Wide Awake. It's a lie, roared Eli Spence. I'll make you prove it. "'I can soon prove it,' said Wide Awake. Ten years ago, you were in the police force of San Francisco. "'I could not call to mind at first who you were. "'I do now. "'I recollect you being dismissed from the force.' "'What for? "'What did he do?' asked several men, "'glad to see Bully Spence finding his level, "'and yet dreading the consequences to Wide Awake, "'who was a general favourite. "'Let him tell you himself. "'I will not,' said Wide Awake. I only wanted to prove that my name is better than his own. There's all events as good. Eli Spence was in a towering rage. The accusation levelled against him was true, and he meant to take it out of wide awake. I tell you what he says is false, said Eli Spence. If he knows what I was dismissed the force for, let him out with it. There you were in the force, Eli, and you were dismissed, said a man. You have let the cat out of the bag, said another. "'Hold up, Eli!' shouted a third. "'Out with it! Were you dismissed because you had too many gold watches at your diggings?' A roar of laughter greeted the speaker's remark, and Eli Spence, turning on Wide Awake, said, "'I'll make you suffer for this. I'll be even with you.' "'The sooner the better,' said Wide Awake. "'Bah! You're an old man,' said Eli contemptuously. "'I wouldn't hurt you for the world.' "'You'll find I'm not so old as I look, "'if you come any of your Frisco tricks on me,' said Wide Awake. 
Fair play, fair play, shouted the men, rushing in between Eli and Wide Awake as the former made a forward movement and raised his clenched hand threateningly. Stand back, roared Eli. Let me thrash the old fool. He's been blackguarding me long enough. What did Eli do in Frisco? said one of the shearers. Let's have it out, shouted several men. Eli Spence was in the Frisco force, said Wide Awake, but he was one of a gang of organised robbers. Many a man have they hit on the head and then flung into the harbour. As Wide Awake said these words, a sudden thought seemed to strike him, and for a moment he turned pale. He recollected the band, of which Eli Spence was one, were called High Flyers, and that their method of disposing of their victims was similar to the manner in which Henry Bryce had met his death. It must only be a coincidence. Eli Spence could have no possible motive for murdering Henry Bryce. It's a pack of lies, roared Eli. I never hit a man on the head in my life except in a fair fight. If you must know why I was dismissed the force, alone I was in it, it was for kissing a lass who objected to my doing so. Loud laughter followed this statement. She couldn't stand you, Eli, said one. That's a bit thin, said another. It won't wash, Eli. And sundry other remarks were showered upon him. Seizing his opportunity, Eli Spence aimed a terrific blow at Wide Awake, who now stood opposite to him. The bully was maddened with the taunts hurled at him, and could not control his feelings. Wide Awake sprang quickly to one side, and Eli Spence, overreaching himself, fell to the ground, amidst another roar of laughter. The old man's a bit too nimble for you. Have another shot at him, Eli. Eli Spence scrambled to his feet, bellowing with rage. Wide Awake was ready for him. As he had stated, he was a much younger man than he looked. Sorrow and care had made him appear aged before his time. He knew Eli Spence was a formidable antagonist, but Wide Awake had been accustomed to fight his own battles for many years. The passion Eli was in would place him at a disadvantage with a man as cool as Wide Awake. The shearers saw it meant a fight, and they were determined to see fair play, and, if necessary, protect Wide Awake from serious harm. "'Come on, you cur!' shouted Eli Spence. "'I'll soon knock your head out of shape for you!' Wide Awake, in his early days, had been taught that once a quarrel was inevitable, there was a lot in getting the first blow in. Before Eli Spence had well got the words out of his mouth, Wide Awake's right fist shot out and caught the bully between the eyes, and then, as Eli Spence staggered back, dazed and astonished beyond measure, Wide Awake came round with his left and knocked him down with a well-directed blow on the jaw. In an instant, the shed was a wild scene of excitement. The shearer shouted and yelled and roared with delight. Bravo, old un! Go it, Widey! Get up, Eli! Are you dead, man? Perhaps he's had enough. Such were the cries heard on all sides. Eli Spence staggered to his feet. He was blind and furious with rage. If he had had his knife in his belt, he would have made short work of Wide Awake. He rushed forward, and by the sheer force of his impetuosity, he got a blow home on Wide Awake's left eye, which at once commenced to swell. The blow seemed to turn Wide Awake into a different man. He avoided Eli as much as possible, and dodged his blows. This was wise policy, as Eli Spence soon became tired and lost his wind. When Wide Awake saw him falter, he changed his tactics, he went in at close quarters, and in a few minutes he had Eli Spence completely beaten and at his mercy. He bided his time and played with him before he gave him the final knockdown blow. Eli Spence made one desperate effort to rally, but finding it of no avail, he gave a furious kick at Wide Awake below the belt. This cowardly action caused an angry shout from the men. Wide Awake, however, thought it was now time to end the battle, so he gave Eli a terrific blow on the temple, and the big man fell down insensible, and lay like a log on the floor. 
Cheer after cheer greeted Wide Awake's victory, and he took it very quietly. "'That will keep him quiet for a few days,' said Wide Awake. "'If he wants a return battle when he comes round, you can tell him I'm willing. Good night, lads. I'll go back home now.' And he picked up his accordion and walked quickly away to escape further congratulations. Wide Awake knew he had made a bitter enemy in Eli Spence, but he cared very little about that. He could not get the idea out of his head that Eli Spence was in some way connected with the attack on Henry Bryce. He knew Spence had been a desperate man in Frisco and had not stopped at murder, so it was hinted there at the time of his dismissal from the force. He meant to watch Eli Spence and see if he could glean some information that would either set at rest or confirm his doubts. Next morning, Edward Bryce saw Wide Awake had a swollen eye and was cut about the face. He inquired the cause, and Wide Awake related all that had occurred the night before, but kept his ideas about Eli Spence to himself. "'I'm sorry this occurred,' said Ted. "'It may make the men more difficult to deal with.' "'Spence was a bully and unpopular,' said Wide Awake. "'I think you'll find his defeat will assist you rather than go the other way.' Such proved to be the case. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of Who Did It ?" by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Phantom Horse A deputation from the Union Shearers waited upon Edward Bryce and headed by Tom Dow as spokesman endeavoured to induce him to sign the agreement, and thus make Munda a union shed. Edward Bryce declined to retreat from the position he had taken up, and intimated he should start with non-union men if the others decided not to accept his terms. Tom Dow tried to quiet the men, but angry threats were uttered as they moved away, and Edward Bryce was convinced there would be trouble. He was almost sorry his sister and Flora had come to Munda. There was no telling what these men might do, or into what excesses they would be led. There was nothing for it but to abide the result. Riots had occurred on one or two stations, and the government had offered to send police to Munda to enforce order and protect property. Meanwhile, they were a merry household at Munda, and Mrs. O'Brien protested that Miss Ida had turned the homestead upside down, "'You said you would tell me about the phantom horse,' said Wyndham Hanworth to Ted, as they were all seated on the veranda one night after dinner. "'Perhaps it would not interest the ladies,' said Ted. "'I should very much like to hear about a phantom horse,' said Flora, and Ida said she had almost forgotten the story, so it would be interesting to hear it again. "'It would be a good subject for a picture,' said Ida to Wyndham. "'The title is catching,' replied the artist. When I hear the story, I shall be able to form a better idea as to whether it will make up into a good picture. There are several versions of the Phantom Horse story, said Edward Bryce, but I think the one I shall tell you is true. Nine or ten years ago, said Ted, one of our boundary riders came in with an extraordinary story. He had been out as usual and returned home rather late. He was tired, and so was his horse, and they were making slow progress towards his hut. Suddenly, the man fancied he heard a sound like horses galloping at a furious pace. He listened intently, and became certain the rumble was caused by horses. He looked round, but could see nothing. It was open country where he was, but a couple of miles beyond him, it was well wooded, and the ground became more broken and hilly. He was at a loss to know where the horses had come from, for the bulk of the mares were fourteen or fifteen miles away. You must know, said Ted, that a horse of this description will entice mares away and gallop off with them to his lair, wherever it may be. This goes to show the wonderful power the male has over the female, he added, with a glance at his sister. Indeed, said Ida, this is the first I've heard of it. At all events, the phantom horse has exercised wonderful power over mares on Munda Station during the past ten years. The boundary rider was not long before he saw, galloping in his direction, 
half a dozen horses. In front he saw a fine, powerful grey horse, and he knew he had never seen him before. He rubbed his eyes, fancying he must have been deceived, but no, there plain enough was the horse, and he looked almost white. As they drew nearer to him, the leader caught sight of the boundary rider, and at once changed his course, and the man then saw there were five blood mares belonging to Munda after him. He knew, in the tired condition his horse was in, it was hopeless to give chase, and he determined to ride on to his hut, and then early in the morning to take another man with him, and go in search of the horse and mares. Next morning he related to old Wideawake what he had seen. "'Has Wideawake been here ten years?' said Ida. "'Off and on he has,' said Ted. He went away for a couple of years, but came back again. At all events, he was here at the time I speak of, for he accompanied the boundary rider, whose name I forget, in his search after the white horse. Wideawake has told me more than once the story of that ride. I remember when a lad how excited I got over his recital. He can tell the story much better than I can, but I'm afraid he is not in a fit state to appear before ladies this evening. So you must accept me in his place. "'What is the matter with him?' asked Ida. "'I hope he's not met with an accident.' "'Nothing serious,' said Ted, with a wink at Wyndham. "'He ran against some obstruction last night and hurt his eye. "'But to my story, Wide Awake and his mates were mounted on two of the fastest horses at Munda, "'and they had no fear of not being able to head the runaways, provided they came across them. "'They followed for several miles in the direction the horses had gone the previous night,' and soon found traces of them as the ground was moist. Wide Awake, however, discovered they were on the wrong track, for the horses had doubled and gone back again. They rode back and found marks on the right, which had been newly made. They were now in a country, but little known to the station hands and boundary riders. As they rode on, the growth became more dense, but there seemed to be a regular track made by horses constantly passing along. Wide Awake was in front, when all at once an extraordinary sight was before him. Looking down at the track formed between the growth of stunted trees and wild tangle of underwood, he saw an open space, green and cool, evidently a choice plot of pasture in the midst of all this forest. Standing under the shade of a large tree was a fine grey blood horse, and around him were five mares, wide awake recognised as belonging to the station. The grey horse he had never seen before. Where had such a splendid animal sprung from? For Wide Awake could see at a glance he was a prince among stallions. The two men halted and looked at the group under the tree, and various were their surmises as to where the grey had come from. The wind was blowing slightly in the direction of the horses, and presently Wide Awake saw the grey lift his head, sniff the air, and then commence to paw the ground. The horse had scented danger and from his movements it was evident that he was accustomed to it, and knew how to act. He neighed loudly, and this at once secured a response from the horses hidden in the bush. No sooner did the grey hear the answering neigh than he snorted defiance, made a snap at the mares, then headed them and led the way at a smart gallop. From this the men concluded there was an outlet at the other side of the open space. Without further delay they pressed forward, and were soon in the open ground. At the far end to their left they saw the last of the mares disappearing. They at once gave chase. It was a wild ride. It is well known that horses ridden by good men can generally head a horse with no burden on his back. It may seem strange, but it is true. I have seen a horse get rid of his rider over hurdles, and go on leading the field for perhaps half a mile but at the end of the journey he came in last. Across the open they galloped, and passing again through a narrow opening, came out into clear country in a very short time. In front, about half a mile ahead, were the horses, the grey still leading. They imagined it would be an easy matter to overtake them after an hour or so hard galloping. They were vastly mistaken. The grey horse led them a merry dance, Mile after mile passed, and still the horses were well ahead. At last a couple of the mares commenced to flag. The grey noticed their signs of distress, 
but dare not slacken his pace. One black mare galloped alongside him, and Wide Awake noticed the horse seemed to encourage her and urge her on. Two mares fell back beaten, and the men passed them. Another mile and a third dropped out, and then a fourth, but the black mare still continued to gallop with the horse. On they went, and Wide Awake says he never had such an exciting chase before or since. Nearer and nearer they drew to the galloping pair. They were almost on to them, when the grey horse, as though realising the mare could go no faster, suddenly shot forward and left her behind. The speed at which the grey went after all these miles, Wide Awake says, was astonishing. They raced after him, but soon found it was all to no purpose. Instead of gaining upon the grey, he was leaving them, and they could feel their horses had gone far enough. At last they were compelled to halt, and no sooner had they done so than the grey slackened his pace, and finally stopping, wheeled round and looked at them, shaking his head in defiance. It was no use following him then, so they turned their horses round and went back after the mares. They found them all thoroughly knocked up, and had not much difficulty in driving them home to the nearest paddock. Both Wide Awake and his mates were tired out, and the former slept in the boundary rider's hut. Next morning, Wide Awake came on to Munda and told his story. Scores of times since then, the phantom horse, as we call him, has led the best horses and riders in the country many a long stern chase. In ten years, no one has ever been able to capture him or even head him, and it is impossible to corner him. Where the horse came from is a mystery and will remain so. It is said, however, that he is an imported stallion that was stolen from one of the stations, and it is supposed he got away from the thieves, galloped into the dense country, and was never caught again. How he came to Munda district I do not know. Certain it is he was not seen here until ten years ago. He is now almost white, and must be fifteen or sixteen years old, but he can still gallop like the wind. On a moonlight night he can sometimes be seen near the paddocks, and being white he has a strange weird look about him that has caused the men to christen him the phantom horse. He is very particular in his choice, and always selects the best mares to run off with. That youngster I pointed out to you last night is a young phantom. All his stock can gallop, and we conclude from this he must be very well bred. He will never be caught, of that I am certain. We could shoot him, of course, but his stock turn out so well we do not mind him running away with some of our best mares occasionally. Oh, Ted, do let us have a gallop after him, said Ida, who was a very good horsewoman. Would you like it, Flora? I know you can ride. What, give chase to a phantom? said Wyndham. Yes, said Ida, it will be glorious. Do let us try and get a peep at him. I've never seen him. It is rather risky work said Ted Bryce, but if Wynne and Flora think they can manage the ride, I shall be only too pleased for you all to have a gallop. Mind, it will be a genuine gallop, for the Phantom seems to magnetise the horses chasing him and draw them on. We can take Wide Awake with us, and young Law, who's a first-rate lad on a horse. Can Wide Awake ride well enough now? said Ida. Is he not too old? If you knew what Wide Awake can do, you would be astonished, said her brother. He is a wiry, middle-aged, active man, and ten years younger than he looks, I should say. Wyndham Hanworth and his sister were both good in the saddle. It was their one extravagance, so the artist said. He was a thorough believer in horse exercise, and argued that in the end it was more economical and much pleasanter than paying a doctor. Then we'll go tomorrow, said Ted Bryce. Wide awake can see as much with one eye as most people can with two, so his damaged optic need not stand in the way. I will give orders to have the horses ready, as we must make an early start. We have to find the phantom before we can chase him. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of Who Did It?" by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A rattling gallop. Wide Awake selected the best horses at Munda for the ride after the Phantom, as he knew they would be required. They were all well bred, 
and the pair on which Ida and Flora were mounted were sired by the horse they were about to seek. "'What a beauty!' said Ida, as she stroked the arched neck of the bay on which she was seated. "'He does not much resemble his sire in colour. Now, said her brother, "'but he has inherited his galloping powers, "'and it takes a good one to beat him.' Flora's mount was a wiry, well-set horse, but had not the spirit of Ida's bay. Ted Bryce knew what a good rider his sister was, but he thought Flora could hardly manage such a spirited animal. His own horse was the one he generally rode at Munda, a thoroughbred and fast enough for any run. Wyndham Hanworth was well pleased with his mount, and before the chase that followed was over, he had good reason to be thankful his horse was a clinker. Wide Awake and young Hiram Law went with them, and they all rode out of the homestead enclosure in high spirits. The day was not too hot, although the sun was shining brilliantly. Wide Awake led the way, and he said he thought he knew in which direction the phantom could be found, as three of the mares were out with him. A smart gallop across a level, even paddock put the party on good terms with themselves. "'This is splendid,' said Flora, who was riding alongside Edward Bryce, Ida being ahead with Wyndham Hanworth. "'Nothing like a smart gallop for invigorating one,' said Ted. "'It has brought the colour into your cheeks. "'You are looking much better than when you arrived at Manda. "'The change will do you a lot of good.' "'It was very kind of you to let us come to Manda,' she replied. "'I hardly knew what to say when Ida broached the subject. "'I thought Mrs Bryce would object.' "'Which no doubt she did,' said Ted. "'I dare say she thought it a terrible thing for two young ladies "'to pay a visit to two bachelors at Munda. "'Were you glad to come?' he asked earnestly. "'Oh, yes,' said Flora frankly. "'Then, checking herself, added, "'You know, I never care to be separated from my brother for very long. "'I flatter myself I am useful to him, and that he misses me.' "'I'm sure he does,' said Ted. "'I know he was very pleased to hear you were coming.' He seems to get on very well with Ida. Look at them now. How earnestly they are talking. He admires Ida very much, said Flora. She is a lovable girl and so high-spirited. She puts me in the shade utterly. That I am sure she does not, said Ted, looking at her admiringly. Flora Hanworth was charming in her habit, and with a small hard hat, sitting jauntily on her well-shaped head. Ted Bryce thought he had never seen her look so well. There was not much time for conversation, as Wide Awake hinted they must push forward. After a ten miles ride, they commenced to leave the level plains and to enter the broken country. Keeping a keen lookout, Wide Awake soon saw traces of the horses they were in search of. He requested Wyndham Hanworth and Ida to bear to the left, with Hiram Law as guide, while he went on with Edward Bryce and Flora. "'We can meet at a certain point I've arranged with Law,' he said, "'and then once in front of the Phantom, "'he will probably make for the open, "'and we shall have a rattling gallop after him.' "'This was considered the best plan, "'and the party separated to meet, "'as Wide Awake had appointed. "'In about an hour they came together again, "'and Wide Awake, pointing ahead, said, "'There's the Phantom, and the mares are with him.' "'They looked in the direction indicated,' and there, sure enough, about a mile away, was the grey horse and three mares, quietly cropping the grass, unaware danger was at hand. "'The best thing we can do is gallop straight for them,' said Wide Awake, "'and they will then make for the open.' They set their horses in motion, and quickly broke into a gallop. When about halfway across the open, the phantom saw them, and as though realising there was no time to be lost, he turned quickly and galloped away with the mares. "'Bravo!' shouted Ted. "'He's making straight for the plain. "'We shall have a grand gallop after him. "'This beats fox-hunting, I guess. "'Come along, girls. "'Now then, win. "'Let us see what our horses are made of.' Away they went, with Wide Awake and Hiram Law leading. The ground was rough, but the bush-bred horses thought nothing of it, and Flora considered it marvellous how they avoided the numerous holes and rocks that lay almost directly in their track. "'We're in for a jump,' said Ted, as he saw Wide Awake and Law set their horses at a huge fallen tree that lay right across their track. 
All right, shouted Wyndham. We'll take it together, Flora, shouted Ida. Follow the leaders. It was not a formidable jump, but it was the first that day, and consequently increased the excitement of the gallop. They all got safely over, and Ida's bay gave a tremendous leap, but she sat firm as a rock and did not move in her saddle. In front they could see the phantom leading the mares, and Flora thought of Edward Bryce's story the previous night, and how much it resembled the reality. Dashing through the bushwood, they were not long in reaching level open ground, and then the chase commenced in earnest. The phantom horse seemed to know he would have to do his best, and the mares, as usual, soon found it impossible to keep pace with him. They fell back and were soon passed by the riders, who took but little notice of them, so intent were they on the white spot dancing in front of them, and gradually drawing ahead. "'We shall never catch him,' said Ida. "'What a galloper he is! This is something like a run. The draghounds are very tame after this.' "'It is the first time I've ever hunted a wild horse,' said Wyndham. "'I confess I relish the sensation.' "'He's gaining on us wide awake,' shouted Ted Bryce. "'Push on, or he'll lose us!' "'We cannot go much faster,' replied Wide Awake. "'I can,' said Ted, excitedly, and shouted to those behind him. "'Come along, follow me. We'll try and head him.' "'Be careful, ladies,' sang out young Law as they dashed past him. "'The ground is tricky farther on.' "'We'll be careful,' said Ida. "'Follow us.' This was quite sufficient for Hiram Law. He was a lightweight, and his horse hardly felt his burden. "'I'm off, Wide Awake,' he shouted. Miss Ida told me to follow her. Keep your eyes on him, sang out Wide Awake, who was now in the rear. Ted Bryce and Wyndham were racing neck and neck, and Ida and Flora were close behind. Their blood was up, and the excitement of the riders acted on their horses. It was a glorious gallop. There was no time to speak, very little time to think. Ted Bryce urged his horse on, and almost forgot the others were behind him. The phantom horse could now be plainly seen. The gap between him and the riders had lessened. His splendid action and great stride excited Ted's admiration. I'll head you yet, he thought. It will be something worth talking about if I can beat the phantom in a race. He looked back and saw the others were not far behind. On they went, and mile after mile was left behind and still the phantom held out no signs of distress. The thunder of the horse's hoofs resounded on the hard ground, but it was not long before they were in a country where the earth was loose and resembled a rabbit warren full of holes and pitfalls. Ted's horse stumbled once or twice, but after finding out the nature of the ground, he picked his way in a very clever manner. The phantom galloped on, and Ted saw with delight they were gaining on him. The horse was evidently out of his usual country, and did not know the ground well. In a few minutes there was a cloud of dust ahead, a white horse struggling on the ground, and Ted knew the phantom had fallen. "'Come along!' he shouted excitedly. "'He's down! We'll catch him now!' Ida Bryce urged her horse forward, and Flora followed her closely. Hiram Law was galloping alongside Wyndham Hanworth. Mr. Bryce will be down if he don't be careful, said the lad. I know this ground. It's nasty. I've never heard of the phantom coming down before. If he falls, there's not much chance for us. Hiram had hardly got the words out of his mouth when his horse came down with a bang onto his nose and the lad shot over his head, turning a complete somersault and landing on his back. Ida laughed merrily as she saw him scramble to his feet. The phantom horse was on his feet again, and galloped on, none the worse for his fall. Ted Bryce and Wyndham had gained on him considerably, and their hopes of heading him were high. Another mile, and Ted Bryce was within a dozen yards of the hitherto unbeaten grey. The phantom horse snorted savagely, but galloped on. Nearer and nearer Ted Bryce drew to him, and his nerves tingled with excitement. Now his horse was almost level with the phantom, and Ida called out, Ted's got him, Flora. Look, look, he's nearly level. The phantom's beaten at last. But if beaten, 
the phantom did not mean to be trapped. Without any warning, the grey horse suddenly swerved round to the left and rushed right across the track of Edward Bryce's horse. The move was so sudden that Ted Bryce had no time to check his mount. His horse, startled at this change of tactics, got out of his stride, crossed his forelegs and came down heavily. Ted Bryce was unhurt. He scrambled to his feet, still holding his horse's bridle, and then looked round for the phantom. The grey horse, checked in his course by the other riders, for a moment stood at bay. It was at this instant Ted Bryce got on his feet. Then he saw the phantom make a savage rush at Flora Hanworth, who sat on her horse a little to the right of the others. Ted Bryce gave a loud cry of alarm. Flora Hanworth saw the savage animal rushing on to her, and was too confused to attempt to move her horse. In another moment, Flora and her horse were knocked over by the phantom, and the grey was lashing out furiously at them with his heels. "'My God, she'll be killed!' shouted Ted Bryce, dropping the reins of his horse and rushing to the spot. Flora was rendered insensible by the fall, but was luckily thrown out of the saddle. Hiram Law and Wyndham were there before him, and the phantom, seeing them, galloped off at a furious pace. Wide Awake, coming up at the time, caught Ted Bryce's horse and led him up to the spot. Ted Bryce rushed to Flora and dragged her out of harm's way. He knelt down and, raising her, supported her body. Her head drooped, and he saw she was insensible. "'She's fainted, Wynne,' he said. "'I hope to God she's not injured. I shall never forgive myself if she's come to any harm.' Wyndham Hanworth and Ida Bryce had dismounted, and now stood about the prostrate girl. "'She's stunned with the fall,' said Wide Awake. Flora was not long before she opened her eyes, and saw Edward Bryce bending over her. The look in his eyes startled her, and the colour came into her cheeks. He bent over her and said softly, "'Are you much hurt, Flora? Tell me you're not injured.' He called her Flora, and she felt a delicious sense of happiness steal over her. "'I am all right,' she said quietly. "'I was stunned by the fall. My head pains me, but that is all.' Luckily, Flora Hanworth had received no severe injuries. She was bruised and shaken, but managed to ride to Munda, although the journey was tedious. Edward Bryce was heartily glad when they reached the homestead, and Flora was at once put in charge of Mrs. O'Brien, who ordered her to bed, and attended on her as well as a mother and doctor combined would have done. "'She'll be all right in the morning, Master Edward,' said Mrs. O'Brien, in answer to his anxious inquiry. "'Thank heaven for that,' he said. Mrs. O'Brien looked after him and shook her head. "'It comes to em all sooner or later,' she said to herself. "'Well, she's a bonny girl, and I'm sure she loves him. I can see it in her eyes when I mention his name.'" End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Trouble Brewing Flora Hanworth quickly recovered from the shock caused by her fall. The next day she was up for dinner, and although pale, said she felt no ill effects. "'You had a narrow escape,' said Ted. "'The phantom was desperate. I was afraid he would kick you. It was an anxious moment for me, Flora.' "'Was I indeed in danger?' she asked. "'Yes,' replied Ted. "'If you'd been seriously injured, I don't know what I should have done.' It was evident, both to Ida Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth, that this incident had drawn Flora and Edward Bryce closer together. Ida was pleased. She would gladly welcome Flora as a sister. "'Our first batch of non-union shearers arrived from Sydney today,' said Ted to Wyndham. I expect the union men will induce them to join their camp, at any rate the bulk of them. That will be hard lines, said Wyndham, when you've gone to the expense of bringing them up. That counts for nothing, said Ted. If persuasion has no effect, the union men will resort to force. It will not be the first time they've done so here. It was as Edward Bryce anticipated. Twenty or thirty men who had undertaken to shear at Munda 
and had been forwarded from Sydney, when they reached the station, were induced to join the Union camp. The other ten declined, and in consequence came in for torrents of abuse, and were lucky to get off with that. Wide Awake heard the next lot of men were to be taken by force into the Union camp if they would not go voluntarily. Fifteen police had been sent to Munda to keep order. Edward Bryce would have preferred to do without them if possible, but he knew it would be unsafe not to have some protection with such a large camp of men on the spot. The River Darling was still navigable, and Ted had entered into arrangements with the captain of one of the cargo boats to bring the men down during the night. As cargo boats were not allowed to travel downstream at night, he thought the Union picket men would be off their guard. The captain of the boat brought twenty men safely down, but unfortunately he misunderstood his directions and landed them at the wrong place. More than an hour was lost before the Munda men and the police came across them, and by this time it was light, and the Unionists were astir. There was no help for it but to march for the sheds as quickly as possible, and avoid an encounter with the Union men. All went well until the camp was roused. The Unionist pickets saw the men marching to Munda, and at once gave the signal to the men in the camp. The Unionists turned out in a body about a hundred strong, and most of the men had formidable-looking weapons in the shape of heavy sticks in their hands. The Munda men were surrounded by their escort of police, led by Sergeant Tyler, an old hand in the force. The Unionists were taken aback at the strong protection afforded the men, but they passed on and intercepted the line of march. Sergeant Tyler rode forward and requested them to allow the men to proceed peaceably to Munda, but he was answered by angry shouts and a great flourishing of sticks. Tom Dow came forward and asked to be allowed to confer with the men on their way to Munda. Sergeant Tyler declined to allow him to do so, but Edward Bryce, riding up, said, Let him speak to the men, Tyler. I want no man to work for me who's unwilling to do so. He then rode back to the men, before Tom Dow came up. The union leader wishes to speak to you. Sergeant Tyler refused to grant him permission until I asked that he might be allowed to do so. Listen to me, men. You have been engaged in Sydney and brought here at my expense. Your wages are fixed. They are at the same rate as those demanded by the union men. I want no man to shear for me without adequate pay. But I refuse to be bound hand and foot by any agreement these union men think fit to draw up. If I sign it this year, there is no telling what they may demand next year. Here is Tom Dow. I will do his work. If there's a man among you who wishes to join the union camp and leave me in the lurch, let him step out. I want no unwilling men in my shed. A cheer went up from the men at this manly speech, and then a shout of, We'll stand by you, Mr. Bryce, to a man. You've taken the wind out of my sails, said Tom Dow with a smile. May I speak to them? Certainly, said Ted Bryce and turning to the men he said, Dow wishes to say a few words to you. I have no fear what your answer will be. Another cheer from the men, and then Tom Dow said, Fellow workers, the union camp is formed here. We are all ready and willing to commence work at Manda, but for our own protection, we ask Mr Bryce to sign our agreement and shear under it. He refuses to do so. We are standing up for our rights. The masters have it all their own way. We merely want justice. Will you fight against your fellow workmen? Join our camp and stand firm, and Mr Bryce will then see it's to his interest to do as we ask. We demand nothing but what is just and fair. Manda is a test shed, and our victory here would help the men who are standing up for their rights in other parts of the colony. Men, do not join the blacklegs and injure your own cause. Come out in a body and go over to the union camp. "'What do you say, men?' asked one of the newcomers, a tall, powerful man, evidently superior to the others. "'Shall we throw up Mr Bryce and join a union camp, or shall we stick to the agreement we signed in Sydney to shear at Munda?' "'We'll stick to our agreement, Ben Holt,' shouted the men. "'You've heard their answer,' said the man called Ben Holt to Tom Dow. "'I'm sorry for it,' said Dow. "'Consider well what you're doing.' You are siding with capital against labour. We're doing nothing of the sort, said Ben Holt. 
We mean to have a free hand in the choice of our work. We're not going to be ordered about by a lot of fellows like you. Bah! You're worse than the masters of long chalk. Then you decline to join us, said Tom Down. We do, replied Ben Holt. You see those men, Sergeant Tyler, said Tom Dow, pointing to the formidable body of shearers. They are determined to stick up for their rights. I cannot control them if they wish to prevent these men working at the shed. That means you will not try to control them, replied the sergeant. Remember, Tom Dow, my men are armed. I am sent here to protect these men Mr. Bryce has engaged. If your men attempt to interfere with me in the execution of my duty, you will know what to expect. Then you mean to fire on us, said Tom Dow angrily. This is what we are taxed for, to pay men to shoot us down. A nice government we've got, and no mistake. Keep a civil tongue in your head, Tom Dow, said the sergeant, or you may get into trouble. Tom Dow went back to the unionists and told them the men had declined to join the camp. Then we'll make em join, shouted some score of angry voices. None but union men shall shear in that shed. Sergeant Tyler, with Ted Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth, moved on in front, the escort following. "'They look a threatening lot of men,' said Tyler, "'but I doubt if they'll do much. "'I've seen a lot of them in my time, and there's not much danger in them.' "'You see, Wyn, there will be a row after all,' said Ted Bryce. Sergeant Tyler ordered his men to keep as far from the Unionists as possible, and to do nothing to provoke an encounter. He had also given strict orders that no matter what the Unionist did, the police were not to make any attack until he gave the word. They were marching past the Union men, when suddenly a shower of stones came pelting onto them. Luckily the missiles fell wide of their mark, and none of the stones did any damage. Sergeant Tyler gave no sign. He coolly rode on as if nothing had happened. The men under escort did not relish the position they were in. "'Why don't you pepper em with the guns?' shouted one man. The Unionists, seeing no notice was taken of their first attack, grew bolder and made a movement to intercept the line of march. Sergeant Tyler, with Edward Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth, rode on. In front of the men, the sergeant halted. "'I'm going to take these men to Munda,' he said, quietly but firmly. "'My men have their rifles loaded,' If you continue to obstruct us, I shall order them to fire. If I give an order to fire, some of you will not have a chance of shearing again under any conditions. Take my advice and return to your camp before any mischief is done. There is a heavy punishment for rioters. Let the black legs go, said Tom Dow. We may have a chance of paying them out later on. That is a threat, Dow. I shall not forget it if any of these men are attacked during their stay at Munda said Tyler. The Unionist did not stir, and Sergeant Tyler ordered his men to move to the left to prevent an encounter. No sooner was this done than the Union men also moved to the left, and again brought them to a halt. "'I will give you one more chance,' said Tyler. "'Let my men pass on, and nothing more shall be said about it.' A sullen murmur from the mass of men was the only response. "'You will not give orders to fire on them?' asked Ted Bryce. No, said the sergeant, I can manage this business without that. Clear the way, he shouted, but the unionist did not move. Force a passage, he said to his men. Use your batons only. The police were mounted on strong, powerful horses, and at once rode forward, still surrounding the men they were escorting. The horses trampled on the feet of the foremost of the unionists. Several men seized the bridles of the horses, but sharp blows on the hands made them relax their hold. "'Look out, Tyler!' shouted Ted Bryce as he ducked to avoid a stone. Sergeant Tyler could not move his horse quick enough, and a sharp stone hit him on the wrist, drawing blood. He rode his horse forward and drove the Unionists along in front of him. The police quickly forced a passage, and then from the rear came another shower of stones. Three of the shearers were knocked down, and one of the policemen fell from his horse, stunned by a blow on the head. Wyndham Hanworth felt a stinging sensation in his right knee, and looking down saw his breeches were cut and his knee bleeding. A slight scratch, said Wyndham, in answer to Ted. 
nothing more. The blackguards, said Ted. I did not think they would go so far. Sergeant Tyler ordered six of his men to form a guard in the rear, while the remainder, with Ted Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth, escorted the men to the homestead buildings. Tyler, with his half-dozen men, charged at the crowd, and laying about them freely, soon dispersed them. The Unionists, however, still kept up a fire of stones as the police retired again. The constable who had been knocked from his horse quickly recovered and remounted. He had a nasty bump on his forehead. Seeing the police were determined, and fancying they might use their firearms if further provoked, the Unionists retired to their camp. They were not satisfied with what they had done, and several of the worst men hinted at firing the shed and the homestead if Edward Bryce did not come to terms. "'We've not done with those fellows yet,' said Sergeant Tyler to Edward Bryce. "'We shall make a start tomorrow, said Ted, "'and perhaps when the men see I'm determined to do without them, they will cave in.' "'I hope so,' said Tyler, "'but I doubt it. There are a lot of loafing scoundrels in the camp. These men are the bane of the regular shearers.' The men injured in the attack were attended to, and their wounds were not of a serious nature. "'You had better not go far from the homestead, Ida, while these men are about,' said Ted to his sister. "'They would not interfere with us, surely,' said Ida. "'I do not think they attack women.' "'There's no telling what they may do in their present frame of mind,' said Ted. "'Perhaps it would be safer to send you and Flora back to Sydney. "'I'll talk the matter over with Wynne.' "'Do not be alarmed about us, Ted,' said Ida. "'We are not timid girls. "'There is no occasion to pack us off to Sydney.' End of chapter 11also a wool-shed and a wool-scouring plant. The wool-shed was a building 130 feet long, and built of colonial pine framework on piles two and a half feet from the ground. The building was enclosed with galvanised corrugated iron. Between the sweating pen and the wool sorter's quarters was the shearer's portion of the shed, which is called the board. On either side of this board, Fifteen shearers are placed. The catching pens are fixed between them, into which the sheep are put from the sweating pen. Each pen has an opening onto the board, and two shearers are supplied from each pen. A passage called a race runs down the centre of the building, the catching pens being on either side, and a gate opens from each pen into the race. The race is always kept filled with sheep from the sweating pen, and, as the catching pens become empty, they are filled from the race. Machines were used in the Munda shed, and each shearer had two machines and a separate driving gear fitted with a brake, which permitted the shearer to stop or start his machine at will. Briefly, this was how the shed looked at Munda when the roll was called. Sheep in large numbers could be seen on all sides in the race, the catching and sweating pens all ready for an immediate start. Forty men answered when the roll was called, and signed their names. "'Before you start,' said Edward Bryce, "'it is hardly necessary for me to tell you "'we may have some more trouble with the men in camp. "'We shall do all in our power to protect you from being molested, "'and I expect you to help us by keeping within bounds "'and not go straying near the camp. "'We have a 130,000 sheep to shear, I anticipate, "'and I trust you will be able to get through the work "'as quickly as possible.' The men gave a cheer, and at once proceeded to take their places on the board. It was an animated scene, and Wyndham Hanworth had already commenced to make sketches of the novel sights before him. Flora Hanworth and Ida Bryce had ridden over from the homestead to see the start, and were much interested in it. The Union men assembled to see what would happen, and as none of them would sign the agreement under which Munda Station was run, they were ordered off the premises. The police were drawn up outside the shed, and under Tom Dow's instruction, 
the Unionists quietly walked back to their camp, which was about a quarter of a mile below the wool shed on the public roadway. The Union camp was now in full working order, and the number of men in it increased daily. Pickets in squads of four were formed, armed with heavy waddies made from saplings. These pickets were ordered to bring into camp any men found making their way to the wool shed. Only ten men had come over from the Union camp to join in the shearing, and these deserters, as they were called, would have had a warm reception if the Unionists had captured them. Inside the shed, all was bustle and excitement for an hour or two, but the men quickly settled down to their work, and it was surprising the rate at which some of them shore the sheep. All classes of men were represented on the board. "'They're a miscellaneous lot,' said Ted, laughing, "'and judging from their movements, I imagine sheep-shearing is new work to them. However, they generally do their best, and the sheep do not suffer much. You see the fifth man on the right, Wyn? "'Yes,' said Wyndham. "'He does not seem very easy at his work.' "'He was a trainer in Sydney,' said Ted. "'He's a good sort of fellow, had bad luck, and could get nothing to do in his line. "'He applied to a friend of mine, who said he was sure I would give him a chance, "'and so packed him off up here. "'If he can't manage the shearing, I'll give him a chance with a horse or two here.' "'What on earth can a trainer know about shearing?' asked Wyndham. "'Fraser, that is the man's name, told my friend he had shorn sheep before.' but it must have been a good many years ago, long before machines were invented. Look at him now. He's having a struggle with that sheep. Why, he's cut himself. I'll stop him and give him a chance elsewhere, said Ted. Sam Fraser was nothing loath to leave his place on the board. He had come in for plenty of chaff during the short time he had been doing his best to shear. You'll never make a fortune at that game, Fraser, said Ted Bryce. I think horses are more in your line than sheep. Sam Fraser gave a comical smile as he bound up his hand and said, "'It's a good many years since I handled a sheep, Mr. Bryce. "'There were no machines, then. "'I can handle a horse, though, with any man when I get a chance. "'My luck's been dead out, for I should not be here, trying to shear. "'I'll give you a chance with a horse or two I have,' said Ted. "'In the meantime, you can either look on or go outside.' "'Thank you, Mr. Bryce,' said Fraser. "'I'll do my very best for you.' "'Some of the men shear well,' said Ted, "'for a scratch lot.' "'They do not trouble much about their clothes,' said Wyndham. "'Most of the shearers had moleskin pants on "'and a flannel singlet with no overshirt, "'and socks were discarded, "'many of them being barefooted, "'although here and there a man had a rough pair of shoes "'made out of a piece of bagging or wool-pack "'with string for laces. "'It will make an excellent picture,' said Wyndham. "'if I can manage to do it justice. "'I must be very careful about the sheep this time,' he added, laughing. "'You have not forgotten that incident,' said Ted Bryce. "'I consider the remarks I made on your picture were well-timed, "'for it was through my attempt at criticism we became known to each other. "'I expect your sheep this time, Mr Hanworth, will be so lifelike, "'we shall feel inclined to sit and look at them, just to see if they move,' said Ida. "'I hardly think I shall carry the deception so far,' said the artist with a smile, but I shall try my best to make the picture a success. Shearing was going on briskly, when the men were knocked off at eight for breakfast, and resumed work an hour later. "'I think we may as well ride back,' said Ted Bryce. "'I'm hungry. I don't know how you all feel.' "'The keen demands of appetite are upon me,' said Ida. "'It was early when we left Munda.' "'About five o'clock,' said Ted. I wonder what the Sydney ladies would say to that. I expect Mrs. Bryce would be very shocked if she heard you were galloping around the country at such an unearthly hour in the morning. Shearing went on all right in the shed for two or three days, and the Unionists made no move, although they were still camped on the same spot. The shearers occupied a hut built of pine slabs with an iron roof. The shed hands, called rouseabouts, had a building to themselves, and also the wool scourers. The men were lively in their huts at night, and passed the time away merrily. The unionists could hear them singing and dancing, and were in an ill humour, because the shearing appeared to be going on very well without them. Tom Dow had great difficulty in keeping them in order, and he felt they would break out before long. Ever since the night Wide Awake had fought and beaten him, 
Bully Spence had been eager for revenge. Spence had his followers still, and he was a dangerous man, a regular firebrand in such a mixed community. Eli Spence sneered at Tom Dow, and characterised him as a weak-hearted man, afraid to show what the Unionists were made of. A couple of nights after shearing had commenced, Eli Spence was the centre of a group of a dozen men. He was speaking to them earnestly, and Tom Dow knew he was up to no good. He moved towards the group, and Eli Spence did not see him. He heard Spence say, Ah, oh, for strong measures, if we can't get at the shed, there's the homestead. All the police are down here at the wool shed. They'll never think of a raid being made on the homestead. There's some rare fun to be had up there, said Eli, with a savage grin. There's a couple of nice-looking girls there, and if we capture them, I reckon Mr. Edward Bryce would quickly come to terms with us then. You're a fool, Eli Spence, said Tom Dow. I warn you again not to mention these things. I will have no acts of incendiarism here while I'm in charge of the camp. Such acts of violence injure our cause. If we must fight, let us fight fair. Bravo, Tom, shouted several men. Do the masters fight fair? shouted Eli Spence. Some of their men do. What about Wide Awake? said a man. There was a loud laugh at Spence's expense, and the hit went home. I said the masters do not fight fair, roared Eli Spence. We can't get our rights by fair means. Let's get em by foul, say I. We're a hundred and fifty strong here now, and we all sit down like a lot of blessed sheep, and let these non-union fellows take our places. We could get possession of that shed in half an hour if we were all of one mind. Tom Dow saw Eli Spence's words had some effect on the men. He tried to counteract them by urging the men not to commit any acts that would bring them within the clutches of the law. When the lights were put out, Eli Spence and a few of the more desperate men in the camp were plotting how they could best make an attack on the homestead with success. We ought to fire the place, said Eli. There'll be no lives lost. You need have no fear of that. They'll all be able to get out before there's any danger. But once the place is fired, it will burn to the ground. Nothing can save it. That will show we mean business at any rate. I'd sooner see the wool shed fired, said one man. That would do the most damage. Can't it be done, Eli? Could be done, but there's a greater risk of being caught. Police are always on a lookout there while the homestead is unguarded. I'm for burning the homestead, as it can be done easily, said Eli Spence. These scoundrels talked for a couple of hours before they turned in, and it was eventually decided, if Tom Dow still remained inactive, they should take the matter into their own hands. These men were not regular shearers. All of them, with the exception of Eli Spence, had joined the camp only a short time. They were men who professed to be staunch unionists, but were unmitigated loafers, anxious to gain admission to the camp in order to idle away their time and be fed at the expense of the union. It was these men who did the unionist cause so much harm. Tom Dow knew what these men were, but he had no means of getting rid of them. If he ordered them out of the camp and they went to the wool shed and offered to be taken on, he knew he would be blamed for it. To order them out of the camp would be a dangerous experiment. It was a difficult position for Tom Dow to be placed in. He did not believe in open acts of violence, but he saw no chance of averting them. If he warned Edward Bryce, his warning would probably be construed into a threat by Sergeant Tyler. He determined to watch Eli Spence and his mates closely, and by timely interference try and prevent them from damaging Edward Bryce's property and at the same time doing incalculable injury to the Union cause. Tom Dow was a thorough believer in the justice of his cause. He was bound up in Unionism. His was a narrow mind, and like many men of his class, he was full of prejudices. According to his lights, he acted as he thought right, but there is no more dangerous man than he who becomes a fanatic, believing in the justice of his cause. Such a man is not open to conviction. Tom Dow was such a man, 
and he placed the cause he advocated before everything. End of chapter 12「Chapter thirteen of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Herbert Golding, MLA. It is necessary for the continuance of the story that Munda Station should be left for a brief period, in order to ascertain how affairs had progressed in Sydney since the departure of Ida Bryce and Flora Hanworth. Herbert Golding acted the modest man after his election to the Assembly. Deputations waited upon him to congratulate him upon his success, and he modestly disclaimed any merits of his own contributing to it, and alluded to his late partner's popularity as being mainly responsible for his election. At a general meeting of the investors and depositors in the Amalgamated Land and Investment, etc., company, when Herbert Golding took the chair, he was received with loud cheers. The statement he made to the meeting still further enhanced his popularity. He gave a glowing account of the prosperity of the company, and said the directors declared a dividend of 10%, and carried over several thousands to the reserve fund. All depositors would receive 10% on deposits, and the chairman stated that the interest would be paid at the offices on a certain date. It was a large meeting, and there was not a dissentient voice raised against the policy of the directors. When people receive 10% for money on deposit, they seldom give a thought as to how such a large percentage can be paid. It was so in this case, and Herbert Golding's statement was continually interrupted by cheers. After the meeting, the majority of those present remained behind. Herbert Golding had an idea this gathering had something to do with himself, so he lingered about the offices to hear the news. The preliminaries had evidently been settled before. In a very short time, a messenger was dispatched to see if Mr. Golding had left the building. Fortunately, he had not done so. He had not the slightest intention of doing so until he knew what had taken place upstairs in the boardroom. When he entered the room, there was again much cheering. One of the directors said he had been deputed on behalf of the shareholders and depositors to ask Mr. Golding to accept a slight offering from them as an acknowledgement of the excellent services he had rendered the company as chairman of directors, and also at the same time to celebrate his election as member for Balmain East. The subscribers wished to know if Mr. Golding would consent to sit for his portrait to be painted by that rising young artist, Wyndham Hanworth, whose ability was beyond question, and who would be sure to do justice to his subject. When Herbert Golding heard who was to paint the portrait, a strange feeling of uneasiness crept over him. Why, he could not tell. He had no cause to dread Wyndham Hanworth painting him. He had only met the artist once or twice at the Bryce's. He knew Mr. Hanworth was a great friend of Edward Bryce, and he also knew the artist selected was the best man they could have chosen. Herbert Golding did not like the idea of Wyndham Hanworth painting his portrait, but he was not the man to raise objections in a case of this kind. He thanked those present in feeling terms for the honour done him, and expressed the pleasure it would give him to sit to Mr. Hanworth, who was an artist of recognised ability, and with whom he had a slight acquaintance. When Herbert Golding left the offices of Amalgamated Land and Investment Company, he took a hansom and drove to Mrs. Bryce's residence. He found her at home, and she welcomed him cordially. Herbert Golding was always well received by Mrs. Bryce. His constant visits since the death of her husband had caused people to talk, but as he was one of the executors of Mrs. Bryce's will, excuses were made for his presence at her house. He was not in love with Mrs. Bryce, although he had no doubt she would accept him if he offered her his hand, as soon as decency permitted. He was too selfish to think of anyone but himself, and it was self-interest prompted him to encourage Mrs. Bryce in the belief that he loved her. She had fifty thousand pounds, a fine residence, and was not a bad-looking woman into the bargain. The fifty thousand pounds Herbert Golding knew would be very useful to him at the present time. It certainly was a nuisance, he thought, 
that this sum of money should be mortgaged heavily in the person of Mrs. Bryce, but as he could not obtain the money without the lady, he resigned himself to accept both. Why should a man situated as Herbert Golding be in want of money? He was a partner in one of the oldest and best firms in Sydney. He was chairman of directors of a flourishing company, and he was an MLA, with three hundred a year for pocket money. Surely such a man could not be in want of money. Yet Herbert Golding required money, and a large sum. Dr. Langside had not been satisfied in going through the books of Bryce, Golding & Company. There was a sum of close upon £30,000 he could not satisfactorily account for. Herbert Golding explained that the sum was advanced him by the late Mr. Bryce for certain purposes connected with the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company. In fact, the 30000 was for the purpose of extending the operations of that company. He acknowledged the late Mr. Bryce was not a shareholder in the company, but he said the advance was fully secured on property held by the company. Edward Bryce had accepted this explanation without giving the matter much thought, but on consideration he had empowered Dr. Langside to act for him in the matter during his absence, and go thoroughly into particulars with Herbert Golding. Dr. Langside requested Herbert Golding to furnish him with full particulars as to this advance of £30,000. This Herbert Golding had not yet done, and the doctor was becoming impatient. At last, to allay his suspicions, Herbert Golding had promised to refund the whole of the money within twelve months. He said the company was flourishing, and could in that time easily pay back such a sum. "'The money has been taken out of the firm,' said Dr. Langside, "'and there is no proof that Mr. Bryce empowered you to act in this manner. "'I have no doubt your statement is correct. "'You are one of the executors, and I am acting for Mr. Edward Bryce, "'and am also myself an executor, and I am sure, Mr. Golding, "'you will see it is to the interests of the firm. "'This money should be put into the business again. "'Times are not so good now as they were formerly, "'and even to a firm such as Bryce and Golding, Thirty thousand is a sum of vast importance. I thoroughly agree with you, Dr. Langside, said Herbert Golding. My partner trusted me in everything. In the matter of the advance to the company, he knew I was chairman of directors, and therefore in a position to know how it stood financially. I candidly admit, at the time Mr. Bryce agreed to allow the money to be drawn out, the company was not in such a good position as it stands today. As to the mortgages... They are all in proper order, and you can see them if you wish. As executor, I should like to see them, said Dr. Langside. They were not with Mr. Bryce's papers. No, said Herbert Golding. As it was purely a matter of transferring the money from one business to another business, Mr. Bryce kept his papers in the office. I will show you them, said Herbert Golding, as he opened a safe and took some papers out, handing them to Dr. Langside. Dr. Langside examined them carefully, they looked all right, but he had his suspicions. He disliked Herbert Golding, but that did not influence him, and he had no wish to be unfair to him in consequence. He would have liked to take the papers to his solicitor, but as Herbert Golding was one of the executors, he did not feel inclined to adopt this course. The papers will be perfectly safe here, he said, as he gave them back to Herbert Golding, who locked them in the safe again. After further conversation, Herbert Golding had agreed to the money being repaid into the firm by the land company within twelve months, and with this promise, Dr. Langside expressed himself satisfied. Herbert Golding had secured an advance of £30,000 from the firm of Bryce, Golding & Company, and he had placed the bulk of the money at the disposal of the Amalgamated Land Investment Company, because, at the time he did so, he had every faith in the company, and was sanguine he would clear a large sum by using this money. How he obtained Henry Bryce's consent to the advance of this large sum, or whether Henry Bryce knew it had been advanced, was at present only known to Herbert Golding. Dr. Langside had his suspicions, but he said nothing. He was a medical man, and could keep his own counsel. In the course of an extensive medical practice, 
Dr. Langside had some curious family secrets committed to him. They were as safe with him as though the recipient of them had died, and had them buried with him. He was not a man to talk about other people's affairs. He could not, however, help knowing what had been told him, and, curiously enough, when attending a director of the very company Herbert Golding was chairman of, he had listened to a statement that did not redound to that gentleman's credit. This particular director had an idea at the time he was about to die, but he recovered. When he regained his health, he was in a fever of anxiety when he thought of all he had said to Dr Langside. In a casual way, suppressing his anxiety as well as he was able, he alluded to what he had stated to Dr Langside. The doctor looked at him steadily and replied, My dear sir, I never take notice of what my patients say when they are delirious, or not quite in their right senses. I hear what they say, but it is my invariable rule to forget it afterwards. Quite right, doctor, quite right, was the reply. You are a model of discretion. I wish there were more men like you. Let me give you a word of advice, said Dr Langside with a smile. Do not make any more confessions before you are quite certain you are going to die. Herbert Golding was thinking over this £30,000 as he drove to see Mrs Bryce. He determined, if he saw no other way clear, to marry her and invest the bulk of her money for her in the Amalgamated Lands Investment Company. In other words, pay by means of her money the 30000 back into the sound firm of Henry Bryce, Golding & Company. That would relieve him of one grave responsibility. But there was a far more important and all-disastrous one looming ahead. Herbert Golding was not a fool. He was a calculating, hypocritical rogue with the manners of a gentleman and a smooth-faced look that disarmed suspicion in most people. He, above all the directors, knew the exact position of the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company. The other directors were mere puppets, and Herbert Golding's advice was always followed. The responsibility rested upon Herbert Golding, but the other directors, in neglecting their duties and implicitly trusting their chairman, would be held equally responsible should anything go wrong. Herbert Golding's thoughts were not pleasant as he drove to Mrs Bryce's residence. He knew perfectly well that the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company was not in a flourishing condition, and he was also aware that the last dividend had been paid out of money recently deposited. End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Bryce accepts. Of course, I am aware the wedding could not take place for some months, said Herbert Golding to Mrs. Bryce. But my dear Lydia, that need not stand in the way of our engagement. I want to feel that you are mine and mine only. If you prefer it, we can keep our engagement a secret until you think proper to disclose it. But give me a decided answer, Lydia. This suspense is intolerable, and I can bear it no longer. My love for you must plead in excuse for me, and if you love me as I love you, I am sure you will consent. Thus spoke Herbert Golding to Mrs Bryce, and he did not speak in vain. Mrs Bryce meant to accept his offer all the time, but she wished to keep him in suspense for a few moments. She declared her love for him, and accepted him as her future husband, but she wished the engagement to be kept secret, and would not agree to the marriage taking place until twelve months had elapsed since Mr Bryce's death. This suited Herbert Golding exactly. He was not in a hurry to enter the bonds of matrimony. He fancied he could handle Mrs Bryce to his own complete satisfaction. They chatted pleasantly and in a confidential manner. Herbert Golding knew better than to carry his profession of affection for her too far, but he flattered Mrs Bryce and fooled her easily. Money matters cropped up. Herbert Golding had skilfully introduced the meeting held at the land company's office into the conversation. He knew Mrs Bryce would be pleased to hear of the presentation to be made him, and accordingly he made the most of it 
and also of the company over which he presided. "'It must be a very flourishing concern,' said Mrs. Bryce. Ten per cent for deposits is really a wonderful interest.' "'It is,' said Herbert Golding. "'I had better strike while the iron is heated and the fire of love, and before it cools down,' he thought. "'I am afraid you will not receive ten per cent for your money as it is at present invested,' he said. "'Oh, dear, no, Herbert,' she replied, lingering over his name fondly. "'I only wish I could obtain ten per cent. What a difference it would make in my income!' "'There is no reason why you should not avail yourself of the opportunity "'to place your money in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company,' he replied. "'I am chairman of directors, as you are aware, Lydia, "'and therefore know how thoroughly safe the bank is. "'I am also, as one of Mr. Bryce's executors, "'bound to do the best I can for you in investing your money. "'And to be selfish, Lydia, as your future husband, "'I should take very good care your money was not risked in any foolish speculation.' It was a specious argument, and Mrs. Bryce felt the force of it. Even had she been suspicious, which she was not, the fact that Herbert Golding was engaged to her would have disarmed her suspicion. Her future husband would not be likely to rashly risk her money. He gave her time to think over all he had said. "'Have you much money invested in the company?' she asked. "'The bulk of my money is, of course, in the firm,' said Herbert Golding. "'but I have about fifteen thousand in the company in shares, "'none on fixed deposit.' "'But shares are more risky than deposits,' said Mrs. Bryce. "'Depositors are paid in full before shareholders can claim a penny,' "'said Herbert Golding. "'But I can assure you there is no possible risk, "'or I should not lend my name as chairman of directors, "'or have fifteen thousand pounds worth of shares to my name.' "'I should like to get ten per cent,' said Mrs. Bryce.' "'You could invest some of my money in the company for me.' "'I should advise you to place it in the bank on deposit,' he said. "'It is less trouble, and of course safer, "'and ladies always like to be on the safe side in such matters.' "'And quite right, too,' said Mrs. Bryce. "'How much should you advise me to deposit? "'Do you ask me that question as your future husband, "'or as chairman of directors?' he said. "'As my future husband, Herbert.' "'The fact of you being chairman of directors "'only makes your advice the more valuable,' she replied. "'I wonder how much he'll venture,' thought Herbert Golding. "'I'll make a plunge for it.' "'As your future husband, Lydia,' he said, "'and wishing to give you the benefit of my advice and experience, "'I advise you to place the bulk of your money in the bank "'on fixed deposit for twelve months. "'If at the end of that time I, in my position as chairman of directors,' see any cause to recommend you to withdraw the whole or any part of the money i will advise you to do so she did not look startled at what he had said and herbert golding felt sanguine of success as you say she replied the deposit could be for twelve months and by that time you would be my husband i should prefer to keep some money invested elsewhere say ten or twenty thousand the remainder could be placed in your bank on fixed deposit lydia he said with well-feigned emotion. You have indeed made me a happy man. You have shown you not only love me, but that you have unbounded confidence in me. It is very good of you. I shall never forget it. He stooped over and kissed her tenderly. Mrs. Bryce was in a heaven of delight. At that moment, she would willingly have entrusted Herbert Golding with the whole of her fortune. I should not love you as I do if I had not confidence in you, she said. "'If you are happy, Herbert, so am I. Very happy indeed.' Poor Henry Bryce! It is to be hoped, for his own sake, he had not departed to a place from whence he could witness this scene, and hear his newly made widow confess her love for another man. Before Herbert Golding left Mrs. Bryce, she had given him full authority to invest £30,000 in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company. His next step was to inform Dr. Langside, in case he should hear of it elsewhere, of what had taken place. "'Of course, Mrs. Bryce can do as she pleases,' he said. "'The money is absolutely her own. As one of the executors, however, I shall inform her I do not think she is acting wisely.' "'And why, pray?' said Herbert Golding. "'Have you any reasonable objection to advance against the company I have the honour to occupy a prominent position in?' "'No,' said Dr. Langside. "'Except,' he hesitated. "'Well, 
said Herbert Golding. Except the fact that ten per cent on fixed deposits is rather too good to last long, said Dr. Langside. I need not have informed you of this matter at all, said Herbert Golding. But as you were one of the executors, I thought it only a matter of courtesy I should do so. I have also written to Edward Bryce on the subject. As to the percentage, I grant it is exceptional interest, but the company is itself an exceptionally fortunate one, and our speculations have all turned out well. Mrs. Bryce will only deposit her money for twelve months. If at the end of that time she wishes to do so, she can withdraw the whole or any portion of it. Dr. Langside was not satisfied. He felt there was more behind this than he had been told. He thought the matter over, and came to the conclusion it would be better for Edward Bryce to allude to the subject to his stepmother. He received a letter from Edward Bryce, asking his opinion, which he gave candidly, and it coincided with Edward's view of the matter. Edward Bryce then wrote to Mrs. Bryce in a polite way, stating he had heard from Mr. Golding that she intended placing the bulk of her money in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company. He advised her to consider well before she took this step. He urged her not to trust a large sum to any banking company of this description. He did not allude to Mr. Golding in any way, except to mention the fact that he had heard from him. The letter concluded with a message from Ida and Flora. Mrs. Bryce smiled when she read her stepson's letter. How young and inexperienced he is, she thought, but he does not know all. He does not know Herbert is my intended husband. There is no necessity to inform him of our engagement yet. When he does know of it, he will see matters in a very different light. I can trust Herbert implicitly. Even a bad man would not recklessly throw away his intended wife's money. And Herbert is such a good fellow and bears such a high character. So it came about that Mrs. Bryce, through Herbert Golding, placed £30,000 at fixed deposit in the Amalgamated Land and Investments Bank. She duly received a proper acknowledgement of the same, and was perfectly satisfied with herself and Herbert Golding. Herbert Golding had managed this little transaction on his own account. He had given his brother directors very little information on the subject, but he had frightened them into agreeing that the deposit of £30,000 should go to pay back the money obtained from Bryce, Golding & Company. He had explained to them clearly that if this amount was not replaced to the firm, there would be an unpleasant exposure. When he mentioned Dr. Langside's name, the director the doctor had attended during his illness almost dropped out of his chair with fright. He at once strongly supported all Herbert Golding said. As a rule, he was the only director who occasionally put his foot down when the chairman became arbitrary, and Herbert Golding was pleased at the somewhat unexpected assistance received from this quarter. When asked how the large deposit was to be refunded to Mrs. Bryce at the end of twelve months, he smiled and hinted they need have no fear on that score, as by that time he might stand in a much nearer relation to Mrs. Bryce. Of course, he mentioned this matter privately in order to allay their fears. Herbert Golding felt a different man since Mrs. Bryce had made him her confidant in all things. He took good care the money she had placed in the bank was secure, and in a short time he meant to transfer it over to Bryce Golding and Company, or rather to Edward Bryce, as the money was lent by Henry Bryce personally. The money had been, so Herbert Golding said, taken out of the firm, but only on Henry Bryce's account. After these transactions, Herbert Golding was more assiduous than ever in attending to the wants of his vicar. He worked hard and spared no trouble to make a still further good impression on the parson, and he succeeded. The vicar was a most respectable advertisement for the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company, although he was unaware of it. The good, harmless man trumpeted forth the virtues of Herbert Golding, MLA, far and wide. He held him up as a paragon of perfection. He even went so far as to deposit a thousand pounds devoted to the church building fund, over which he had sole control, in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Bank. 
Many persons in his congregation followed suit, and the directors of the bank and company wondered at Herbert Golding's audacity. When some spiteful individual hinted in the house that these land banks were not legitimate banks and did not transact their business in a legitimate banking way, Herbert Golding replied to him and crushed him. He pointed out how the honourable member in question was a director of a bank that only paid a miserable interest on deposits, and that in consequence the bank the honourable member was connected with suffered in the competition. He went so far as to advise the honourable member to invest some of the uninvested funds of the bank he was connected with in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company. Then, said Herbert Golding, you may have a chance of placing your bank on an equality with the newer and more enterprising institution, such as the one I am proud to be connected with. This was too much for the honourable member, who left the chamber and was discovered later on in the refreshment room, drowning his exasperated feelings in malt liquor. Mrs. Bryce read Herbert Golding's speech. He marked it in blue chalk and had it sent to her. It increased her estimate of her future spouse considerably. Herbert Golding was, in fact, becoming so exalted on all sides that he actually commenced to believe the good things said and written about him were true. End of chapter 14「Of Who Did It」by Nat Gould This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At Munda again. The shearing progressed rapidly, and but little inconvenience was experienced by the action of the Unionists. Most of the men in the Union camp commenced to see the folly of holding out longer, and several went over and joined the men at work. Wyndham Hanworth was delighted at the busy scene, and much interested in the picture he was painting, which he intended to call Shearing Time on Munda Station. When Edward Bryce received Herbert Golding's letter, he was much annoyed. He thought it an absurd thing for Mrs. Bryce to invest the bulk of her money in this bank. He had no doubt it was Herbert Golding's influence that had induced her to do so. Ida Bryce said, I'm not at all surprised, Ted, you do not know Mrs. Bryce as well as I do. Would you like to have my candid opinion? Most certainly, replied her brother. Your opinions are generally candid, I know. Then my opinion is that Herbert Golding has proposed to Mrs. Bryce and been accepted, and in consequence of this she has placed her money in the bank of which he is chairman of directors. Proposed to Mrs. Bryce, said Ted indignantly. You're mistaken, Ida. Remember, our father has been dead only a few weeks. I do remember, said Ida passionately, and that is why I have such a dislike to Mrs. Bryce. She actually permitted Herbert Golding to pay his attentions to her before I left for Munda. I feel certain she's accepted him, but I have no doubt the engagement will be kept secret for some time. It would not suit Herbert Golding's plans to have the engagement made public. He's such a saintly man." Edward Bryce felt inclined to write a severe letter to Mrs. Bryce, but after taking Wyndham Hanworth's advice, he decided merely to ask her to be cautious, and strongly urged her not to deposit such a large sum of money with the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company. A day or two after Edward Bryce received his letter from Herbert Golding, Wyndham Hanworth had one from the Honourable Secretary of the Herbert Golding Presentation Committee, commissioning him to paint a portrait of Herbert Golding. The artist was considerably surprised at this request. He had, it was true, shown considerable ability in portrait painting, but unlike many artists, he modestly underrated his powers in that line. Edward Bryce advised him to accept the commission. "'What a curious coincidence,' said Ida Bryce, "'that you should be asked to paint Mr Golding's picture just at this particular time.' It is strange, said Wyndham. I assure you I did not anticipate it. I often think portrait painters ought to be good judges of character, said Ida. I am afraid I cannot claim to be a very good judge of character, said Wyndham. And yet, when I have been painting a portrait, I have sometimes fancied I could read my subject's thoughts, and almost unconsciously they influence me in the expression of the face in the picture. 
Do you think it would be possible to paint a person so that from the expression in the face, the subject, upon looking at the portrait, would see his or her own mind and thoughts expressed in the face? asked Ida. Wyndham Hanworth paused for a few moments before replying. Then he said, I understand what you mean, Miss Bryce. It would be possible, I think. I fancy I could do it myself, but if I painted portraits on that principle, I'm afraid my commissions would be few and far between. Why? asked Ida. They would be truthful portraits, then. Too truthful, said Wyndham. If you saw some of the originals of the portraits at the Royal Academy, or in the Sydney Art Gallery, as I have, you would know what I mean. That the paintings are more charming than the originals. I can well believe that, said Ida. I once knew a fashionable society lady, said Wyndham, who had her portrait painted by an eminent artist. It was an admirable likeness, true to nature. She declined to accept it. Her excuse was that it might resemble her, but she wanted an artistic picture, not a painted likeness. When asked what she meant, she explained that a portrait, when painted, ought to be artistic in the same sense of the word as the original of the portrait was artistic after undergoing her toilet. In other words, laughed Ida, that the portrait should be touched up like the original. Exactly, said Wyndham, smiling. He thought a portrait of Ida Bryce would not require much touching up. It would take a clever artist to do justice to the delicate, healthy tints on her face. Wyndham Hanworth accepted the commission to paint Herbert Golding's portrait. From what he knew and had heard of Herbert Golding, he thought that gentleman's mind would form an interesting study during the process of painting. Ida Bryce and Flora had been three weeks at Munda, and it was decided they should return to Sydney with Wyndham Hanworth. The day before they were to leave, Ted Bryce said to Wyndham, I wish the girls were safely out of the way. Wide Awake has heard from one of the union men, now shearing in the shed, that Bully Spence and a few of the more desperate men are bent on mischief. The police are here yet, said Wyndham. They will afford sufficient protection in case of any disturbance. The attack, Wide Awake heard, was to be made on the homestead, not on the wool shed. The blackguards no doubt fancy that it will be an easy job to set fire to this place. I wish I knew what night they were coming. We could give them a warm reception. They would never have the audacity to fire the homestead, said Wyndham in surprise. My dear Wyn, these men would have the audacity to set Darlinghurst Jail on fire if they thought there would not be much risk attending it. It's their own precious skins they're frightened about. Later on in the day, Wide Awake came to the homestead, and told Edward Bryce that several of the Union men, including Spence, had left the camp, but it was not known in which direction they had gone. "'I think you would act wisely to have three or four of the police here tonight,' said Wide Awake. "'I can ride over and ask Sergeant Tyler to send them.' "'If we had no ladies here,' said Ted, "'I would not send for them. Nothing would give me greater pleasure than to come to close quarters with a few of these scoundrels. Will they have firearms, do you think, Wide Awake?' "'Sure to have some revolvers among them,' he replied. "'If they've been drinking at Dame Killam's pub, they'll not stick at a trifle. "'Then you can ride over to Sergeant Tyler and ask him to send four men,' said Ted. Dame Killam, alluded to by Wide Awake, was a noted character out west. Her real name was Mrs. Warden, and she kept a lonely bush shanty near Munda, known as the Kangaroo. The shearers said it was called the Kangaroo, because so many men got the jumps there. Dame Killam, or Mrs. Warden, had buried three husbands, slain by the mighty potency of their own grog, it was said, and was on the lookout for a fourth. She had made a bold bid for Wide Awake, but he resisted her charms, which he thought were about on a par with her grog. Eli Spence and his mates, as Wide Awake anticipated, called at the kangaroo in order to prime themselves for the work of the night. Mrs. Warden knew they were a bad lot and up to no good, but that was none of her business. Her particular business was to get rid of as much bad grog as possible at a ruinous price. The more disreputable her customers, the more grog she sold. Eli Spence was a big hulking fellow, and Mrs. Warden thought him a fine man, Eli flattered her and drank her grog, 
and ran up a score. There were seven men at the kangaroo, and they were drinking heavily. Eli Spence had taken enough fiery white spirit to make him a beast in his madness. Fear that name, Gillam, shouted one of Eli's followers. It must be off before long. Perhaps when you address the lady by her proper name, she'll attend to you, said Eli Spence, with a wink at the man. Mrs. Warden gave him a look, supposed to be languishing, and proceeded to serve out another dose of poison. As Wide Awake rode towards the sheds, he thought he would go near the kangaroo and see if his surmise was correct. It was a rash thing to do, but he was a man who was not afraid of danger. The inn was only a mile or so out of his way, and it would not take him long to reach there. If he saw anything of the men, he could ride on and give information, and Sergeant Tyler could have the gang arrested on suspicion before they left the kangaroo. Unfortunately, the house was in open ground, and no one could approach it without being seen. Eli Spence happened to look out of the window, and saw Wide Awake riding in the direction of the inn. He gave a savage laugh, and turning to his mate, said, "'Here's a lark. Wide Awake's coming. We'll nab him.' "'How violence, please, Mr Spence,' said Mrs Warden. "'Ah, oh, no, we'll only tie him up for a few hours. He's on his way from the sheds to the homestead. It'll be one less there if we catch him.' he whispered. From the direction in which Wide Awake was riding, it was impossible to tell where he had come from. "'We must hide, lads,' said Eli. "'Or rather, you must. I'll stay here. Go out the back door and don't come out, and don't come until I shout for you.' The men quickly slipped out of the house, and Eli stood looking out at the window. As Wide Awake drew nearer, he sat down in a corner out of sight. Wide Awake, seeing no one about, and hearing no sounds of revel, thought he must have been mistaken, and that the men had not called at the kangaroo. He rode up to the door, and dismounting, looked in. At first he did not see Eli Spence. "'Good day, Mrs. Warden. Not many visitors about.' She merely nodded to him, and said, "'How are you? You're a stranger here.' She had no love for Wide Awake, because he declined to listen to the voice of the charmer. Eli Spence jumped up and said, I'm here at any rate. Wide Awake turned round, and seeing Eli, at once suspected other men were about, that they had seen him coming, and he had fallen into an ambush. He made for the horse, but Eli Spence was too quick for him, and caught him by the collar. Wide Awake wrenched himself free, and Spence shouted, "'Come on, boys!' The men rushed round from the back, and before Wide Awake could mount, they had him on the ground and at their mercy. Mrs. Warden rushed out. "'I have no violence done here,' she said, in order to clear herself in Wide Awake's eyes. "'We'll not hurt him, dame,' said one of the men. "'What do you want with me?' asked Wide Awake. "'You'll suffer for this, Eli Spence.' "'Shut up! You'll be made to,' said Eli. They tied his hands and feet, and carried him into a stable. Then, throwing him down on some straw, they left him. Wide Awake's hands were tied behind him in a hard knot. His meditations were not pleasant. He must get away from this place by some means, or Sergeant Tyler would receive no warning and Eli Spence and his accomplices would find the homestead unguarded. End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 of Who Did It?" by Nat Gould This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Attack on the Homestead By a lucky chance, Wide Awake's horse managed to slip his bridle and when he saw the scuffle going on, he galloped off. "'The horse has gone,' said Eli Spence. "'Curse it! The brute is sure to go straight home, and I wonder what has become of his rider.' "'Perhaps they'll send and search for him,' said one of the band. "'Sure to,' said Eli Spence. "'All the better if they do. There'll be fewer men at the homestead, and we can hurry up. 
The seven men marched off and moved in the direction of Munda. Four of them, including Eli Spence, were armed with revolvers, and the remainder carried heavy waddies. They also had inflammable material to be used in setting fire to the house and buildings. Wide Awake heard them try the door of the stable, and the key was taken out by Eli Spence, who said, oh, I'll keep this in my pocket for luck. For fully an hour, Wide Awake tugged at his bonds. He wriggled himself down to the door, and on the ground he felt a piece of old iron which was worn sharp. He twisted about until he got his hands on it, and then he managed to fix it against the side of the stable, so that he could rub the rope against the sharp edge. It was a slow process, but he managed in time to saw it through. He freed his wrists from the rope, and saw they were much swollen. Quickly he cut the rope that bound his legs with his knife, and then got on to his feet. He felt stiff and sore, but he knew that it would work off. The door was fast, and he could not open it. He went up into the small loft above, and there found a door which was easily unfastened. He looked out. The distance was not great from the ground, so he dropped down. When he ran round to the front, he saw his horse was gone. Eli Spencer's taken him, he thought. When Mrs. Warden saw him, she gave a faint shriek. Law, how you frighten me, she said. Why did you not let me out? asked Wide Awake angrily. Eli Spence has the key in his pocket, she replied. Then you should have ordered your man to burst open the door. I'm afraid you will get into trouble over this job, Mrs. Warden, he said. I had nothing to do with it, she replied. What could I do against seven men? You could not do much against seven men, replied Wide Awake. But when they were gone, you need not have assisted them by detaining me here. Do you know what devil's mischief that brute Eli Spence is up to? No, said Mrs. Warden. I don't want to know. But let me tell you that Eli Spence is no more of a brute than you are. We'll not argue that point, said Wide Awake. I'm satisfied as to what he is, because I had the pleasure of thrashing him not so very long ago. You, yeah, said Mrs. Warden with contempt. Eli Spence would lick half a dozen whippersnappers such as you are. On this particular occasion he failed to lick me, as you call it, said Wide Awake. "'to show you the sort of men you encourage about here. "'Let me tell you, Eli Spence and his mates are going to fire Munder Homestead.' "'Mrs. Warden started. "'She did not care to be mixed up in a serious affair of this kind. "'Not them,' she said. "'You're piling on the agony at any rate.' "'I've told you the truth. "'I was on my way to the shed and came round to see where the men were. "'I fancied they would call here. "'Sure enough, they trapped me.' and now I have to make up for lost time. They've taken my horse, so I want the best you have in the stable, and quick. It may be too late, but if I start at once, Sergeant Tyler may be warned in time. I have no horse to lend you, said Mrs. Warden. Yes, you have, said Wide Awake. There's one in the next shed to the hole I was put into. If you do not lend me that horse, I shall have to take it. If I tell Sergeant Tyler all I know about your place... You'll not be here long. Let me have the horse, and I'll shield you as much as I can. Mrs. Warden saw there was nothing for it but to comply with his request, so she reluctantly consented, saying it was a hard thing when a lone widow was bullied in this fashion. Wide Awake quickly saddled the horse, and mounting, at once dashed off at a gallop, merely waving his hand to Mrs. Warden and saying, I return horse! "'He's a cool un, she muttered. "'Fancy him giving Eli Spence a hiding. "'I didn't think he had it in him. "'I wish he'd take a fancy to me. "'I've given him plenty of encouragement, "'but he isn't a marrying sort.' "'Wide Awake rode as fast as his horse would go to the shed. "'It was late when he reached there, "'and when he related what had happened to Sergeant Tyler, "'the constable said, "'We must start at once. "'I hope I shall not be too late.' I shall take half a dozen men and go myself. I should like to take the whole gang red-handed. That Eli Spence is a bad lot. I've received information about him from Sydney, only this morning that may prove interesting to Mr Bryce. Wide Awake's horse was done for, 
so he took one belonging to a boundary rider that happened to be handy. The police and Wide Awake were soon on the way to Munda, and Sergeant Tyler was determined there should be no delay on the road. At Munda they were all satisfied Wide Awake had safely reached the shed, and that the police would arrive in good time. "'I hate sending for the constables,' said Ted to Wyndham, "'but I think it's only right, as the girls are here.' "'Much better to be on the safe side,' said Wyndham. "'What ruffians these fellows must be. "'Do you think Wide Awake's information is correct?' "'I've not much doubt about it,' said Ted Bryce. "'When he tells a story, it's generally founded on fact.' The hours went by, and no police arrived. A clattering of horses' hoofs was heard, and Ted Bryce, going on to the veranda, saw Wide Awake's riderless horse galloping to the homestead. "'Here's a go,' said Ted. "'Something's gone wrong with Wide Awake. "'Here's his horse with no bridle on. "'What on earth can have become of him?' "'Perhaps he's been trapped by the shearers,' said Wyndham. "'By Jove, I have it,' said Ted. "'He's been round by the kangaroo.' "'The what?' asked Wyndham. "'I forgot you did not know the kangaroo,' said Ted. "'That is the name of Dame Killam's shanty. "'He had an idea Spencer and his mates would be there, "'and he may have gone round to make certain.' It was a risky thing to do. I hope he has come to no harm. That Eli Spence is a dangerous man, and he owes Wide Awake one for the thrashing he received from him. If it is as you surmise, said Wyndham, the police will not have received information, and we shall be at the mercy of these men. They'll get a warmer reception than they expect, if I can lay hands on them, said Ted Bryce. The only danger is in fire. This place will burn like tinder. I'll send off another man at once to Tyler. Edward Bryce thought it best to tell his sister and Flora all that had happened, and he was glad to see how coolly they took it. "'What can we do to help you?' said Ida. "'I should like to have a shot at one of them, Ted. I think I could hit a man. He's a fair-sized mark at any rate.' "'But you would not like to kill a man?' said Flora. "'They're not men,' said Ida. "'They're brutes, and must be dealt with as such.' Every precaution was taken at the homestead and all the buildings were watched. In addition to Edward Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth, there were two men and several lads about. As the evening wore on, and there were no signs of the men about, Edward Bryce commenced to think that, after all, Wide Awake might have been mistaken. Ted and Wyndham Hanworth had loaded the guns, in case they were wanted, and also had a revolver each handy. "'A bullet or two will give them a fright,' said Ted, I don't want to kill anyone, but I'm not going to have my place fired if I can help it. Eli Spence and his men kept away from the homestead until it was dark, and then commenced to draw nearer. It was agreed to fire the outbuildings first, and then, in the confusion, make a rush for the house. They were unaware that Edward Bryce had received warning of their attack, or they would have altered their tactics considerably. Eli Spence calculated upon finding the outbuildings deserted and those in the house off their guard. "'We can't delay much longer,' said Eli. "'There's lights in the house yet.' "'Better wait until they're put out,' said one of the men. The night wore on, and Edward Bryce, thinking if the men were about, they would not care to come too near while the lamps were burning, kept them lighted. Eli Spence at last lost his patience and said, We'll try and fire some of the outbuildings anyhow. Come on, mates, you know what to do. They crept into the enclosure and silently stole to the buildings. Luck seemed to favour them, for the building Eli Spence decided to fire first was unguarded. In a very short time, the crackling of burning wood could be heard. The men at the homestead were on the alert in an instant, but Eli Spence and his mates were powerful men. They quickly silenced two of the men with heavy blows on their heads, and the lads, seeing such a large number of men arrayed against them, ran towards the house. Ted Bryce heard the row, and he and Wyndham at once went onto the veranda. "'They're villains! They've fired one building!' said Ted. "'Wide Awake was right after all. Had a girl safe, Win? "'Yes,' said Wyndham Hanworth. They are in the room at the far side, and it's well protected. Now, lads, what is it? 
said Ted Bryce, as the youngsters scrambled onto the veranda. Please, Mr. Bryce, there's a regular army of them. They knocked Bill and Harry down, and now they're coming on here. We're ready for them, said Ted Bryce. Eli Spence and his men fired another building, and then made a dash for the house. If they're armed, he said, there'll be less risk in rushing right into them. Here they come, said Ted, as he saw the men rushing across the lawn. "'If you do not halt, we shall fire!' he shouted at the top of his voice. No notice was taken of this, and as the men neared the veranda, both Ted Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth fired. Two of Eli Spence's men fell, but one was quickly on his feet again. Wyndham Hanworth was not a very good shot, and the bullet had only grazed him. Eli Spence levelled his revolver at Edward Bryce and fired, Ted's revolver dropped out of his hand, and he gave a sharp cry of pain. He quickly stooped down and picked it up with his left hand. "'Fire, Wynne! Fire! Quickly!' said Ted. "'There! Over there! See that brute trying to fire the place?' Wyndham Hanworth fired, and the man fell over. "'Curse you!' howled Eli Spence. "'You shall pay for this. Someone must have split. They knew we were coming,' he thought to himself." The men, five in number, had managed to reach the veranda. Edward Bryce had been shot in the right arm, but he still continued to use his left. His aim, however, was uncertain. The men came to close quarters, and Edward Bryce called out, The girls win! Go to the girls! I'll keep these cowards back! Wyndham Hanworth had not seen Ted Bryce hit, and concluded he was able to hold his own. He passed inside and took a couple of breech-loaders, and went to guard the door of the girl's room. "'How many are there?' asked Ida. "'Not many,' said Wyndham. "'We shall keep them at bay if they do not fire the place.' "'Where is Mr. Bryce?' asked Flora. "'On the veranda," said Wynne. "'Alone?' asked Flora. "'Yes,' said her brother. "'Then go to him at once,' said Flora. "'We can defend ourselves. We have revolvers here.' "'Go at once,' said Ida. "'We shall be safe here.' Wyndham Hanworth ran to the other side of the house. As he rushed through the open window onto the veranda, he was tripped up, and then a violent blow on the head stunned him. Ted Bryce had been knocked down and rendered insensible, and the ruffians now made for the girls' room. "'We'll trap these jades and then fire the place,' said Eli Spence. "'Fire it first, said one of the men. Now, we'll get the women out, said Eli, with a hoarse laugh. End of chapter 16、Chapter 17 of Who Did It? by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two Brave Girls. The ruffians rushed from room to room until they came to the locked door, which checked them for a few moments. "'They're in here,' said Eli Spence. "'Open this door!' he shouted. Ida Bryce said to Flora, "'They must have overpowered Ted and your brother. Stand firm, Flora. As soon as they bust the door open, fire. Bridget,' she said to Mrs. O'Brien, "'take that gun and don't be afraid to use it.' The men rushed at the door, but it did not yield. The girls had dragged most of the furniture to the door and piled it up. "'The moment you enter, we fire!' shouted Ida. "'We're not afraid of a pack of girls,' said Eli Spence. "'There's one or two single men here, and they want to get married, so you'd better accept their offers.' Ida muttered, "'Brents,' then held her revolver in readiness. The door soon gave way, and the men rushed forward, stumbling over the furniture. Eli Spence caught his leg in a chair and fell to the floor. It saved his life, for Ida Bryce fired straight at him, but missed him as he fell. "'Fire, Flora!' cried Ida. Flora Hanworth had never handled a revolver in her life, but she was no coward, and taking aim at one of the men, she pulled the trigger. The man gave a howl of pain, followed by a volley of oaths. He was hit in the shoulder. "'Bravo, Flora!' cried Ida. Mrs. O'Brien was not idle. She had no wish to kill any of the men, so she discharged the gun at the legs of the man next to Eli Spence. 
He was evidently hit, for he limped away and tied a large handkerchief round his wounded limb. Again Ida Bryce fired, but Eli Spence, who had recovered himself, was too quick for her, and knocked up her arm at the same time, seizing her round the waist. Ida struck him in the face with her revolver, but he did not let go his hold. Another man seized Flora Hanworth, and Mrs. O'Brien was knocked down in the scuffle. Ida Bryce struggled desperately with Eli Spence, but her strength proved of no avail against the powerful bully. She did not cry out, but made a desperate resistance. The drink the men had taken at the kangaroo made them savage and brutal, and they were more like beasts than human beings. Ida Bryce, as she looked at Eli Spence's face, saw what she had to fight against, and this gave her additional strength. "'You're a beauty,' said Eli. "'Struggle away. You'll soon tire, and there's no one to help you.' Flora Hanworth was soon overcome by the man who attacked her, and sank onto the floor. Ida Bryce felt her strength was fast giving way, and Eli Spence bent her backwards with all his might. She made another desperate effort, and then became exhausted. "'Carry them out of the house!' shouted Eli, "'and then we'll fire the place!' He lifted Ida in his arms, and made for the door. He was too late. At that moment, Sergeant Tyler and his men rushed into the house, and before Eli could drop his burden, the constable had him by the throat. "'We're just in time,' he said. "'Eli Spence, you're my prisoner.' "'Am I?' said Eli, wrenching himself free. No sooner did Ida Bryce feel Eli Spence's hold relax and see the constables than her strength returned. As Eli Spence wrenched himself free from Sergeant Tyler, Ida Bryce picked up one of the waddies that had been dropped and dealt him a blow in the face. He staggered back and fell over one of his mates. Sergeant Tyler was on to him in a moment, and pulling out a pair of handcuffs, had Eli Spence fast before he well knew what had happened. The constables soon captured the remainder of the men, and in about ten minutes from their arrival on the scene, Eli Spence and his mates were firmly secured. Leaving a couple of constables to guard them, Sergeant Tyler and his men went in search of Edward Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth. They found them on the veranda, slowly recovering their senses, and wide awake attending to them. Ida Bryce and Flora Hanworth followed. Strange to say, Ida ran to Wyndham and Flora to Ted Bryce. They were neither of them seriously hurt, but felt dazed after the blows they had received. "'What about the buildings?' said Edward Bryce. "'Are they burning still? Is it you, Flora?' he said, as he looked up into her face. "'Yes,' said Flora. "'Are you badly hurt?' "'Soon be all right,' said Ted. "'I got a nasty knock on the head. "'Thank God you've escaped those brutes. Where's Ida?' "'She's attending to Wyndham,' said Flora, smiling. "'Then we have changed sisters,' said Ted. "'Yes,' said Flora, with a slight blush. I ran to you, and Ida went to Wyndham. We had no time to think. We went to the assistance of the one nearest to us. Ah, said Ted, smiling. Then if you had considered for a few moments, Flora, you would have gone to win. Flora did not answer, and Ted Bryce said, It was my turn to help you when we chased the phantom. Now it is your turn. We seem to look after each other well, Flora. I hope we shall always be of the same mind. I hope so, replied Flora. Do you feel better now? Can you stand? She helped Ted Bryce to get up, but he felt rather shaky on his legs, and leaned on her slightly. His head pained him, and he felt faint. Flora led him into the house, and he sank down on the sofa. He took both her hands and drew her gently towards him. She did not resist. May I, Flora? he said, looking lovingly into her eyes. It is the best medicine I can take. She could not help herself. She loved him dearly, and Ted Bryce gave her the first kiss of love she had ever known. It startled her, and she drew back. She knew a change had come over her life, and that now Edward Bryce was more to her than anyone in the world. Ida Bryce was a girl of a different stamp to Flora. She roused Wyndham Hanworth, and then packed Mrs. O'Brien off to fetch some brandy and a cloth to tie round his head. 
which was much swollen at the back. "'You must have had a nasty blow,' said Ida. "'But I'll soon put you right. "'I had a tussle myself with that big hulking brute Spence. "'He'd almost mastered me, "'when luckily Sergeant Tyler came to my rescue. "'The wretch had me in his arms. "'I could have scratched his eyes out.' "'He dared to touch you?' said Wyndham savagely. "'I should rather think he did,' said Ida. "'The hoary brute held me as tight as a grizzly bear. "'He hugged me.' and Ida could not repress a shudder at the thought. This roused Wyndham Hanworth thoroughly. "'He ought to be thrashed, the beast. I wish I could have got at him.' "'I wish you had,' said Ida. "'I can assure you he almost squeezed the life out of me.' From the manner in which Wyndham Hanworth looked at her, Ida Bryce fancied he would not object to hold her in his arms. She liked him very much, but Ida Bryce was a girl not so easily won as Flora Hanworth. There was considerably more independence in her disposition. During this time, Wide Awake, the constables and the hands about the place were working hard to prevent the flames spreading. Two buildings were on fire, but they were fortunately isolated from the remainder, and as it was a still night, the danger of the fire extending was not great. "'These two buildings will go,' said Sergeant Tyler. "'Is there much inside of them?' "'Nah,' said Wide Awake. "'Only a lot of chaff and some sacks.' The fire gradually burnt itself out, and when Sergeant Taylor saw the remainder of the buildings were safe, he went to inspect his prisoners. Four of the men were wounded, and Eli Spence had some nasty bruises on his face. "'You've made a mess of it this time, Spence,' said Sergeant Tyler. I've managed to take you and your mates red-handed. There may be another charge laid against you before long, Spence. Eli Spence started and said, There's no charge to be brought against me that I know of, except this job. Cursed bad luck we had over it too. It was lucky for you I happened to reach here in time, said Tyler significantly. What's the other charge? growled Eli. I'm not at liberty to tell you at present, said Tyler. You probably have some idea what it is. The prisoners were locked up in an outbuilding and well guarded. As Sergeant Tyler went into the house, he met Ida Bryce. You are a brave girl, Miss Bryce, he said admiringly, and I'm glad to see you look none the worse for your struggle with that blackguard Eli Spence. I am glad I have been able to lay him by the heels. He's a dangerous man. You were just in time, Sergeant replied Ida Bryce. I should have been overpowered in a few more minutes. My friend, Miss Hanworth, also had to defend herself, and I can assure you she did it well, remarked Ida as Flora came up. Then there are two brave girls I'm proud to know, said Tyler politely. Ida is much braver than I am, said Flora. How she managed to struggle with that monster of a man surprises me. I must confess I do not want to repeat the experiment, said Ida. The two girls retired to try and rest, for it had been a night of desperate excitement to them. In the dining room, Tyler found Edward Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth, both looking seedy and worn out. "'I hope you are both better,' said Tyler. "'Had Wide Awake not been caught at the kangaroo, we should have saved you all this trouble, Mr Bryce. I'm glad it's no worse, and we have had the satisfaction of capturing the whole gang.' "'It was foolish of Wide Awake to run the risk he did,' said Ted but he thought it was for the best. It is the gross insults to my sister and Miss Hanworth that make me savage. That unlucky blow stunned me, or I'm afraid that Eli Spence would have been sent to another world ere this. It is much better that no one has been killed, said Tyler. It will show you acted with great forbearance. I'm afraid it will be hardly correct to credit us with forbearance, Sergeant, said Ted, smiling. Rather put it down to our being bad shots. I certainly tried my best to hit my man, and I think Mr. Hanworth did the same. I did, said Wyndham, but I am more familiar with a brush than a revolver. However, all's well that ends well, and the affair might have been more serious. For yourselves it might, said Tyler, but for these men it could not well be more serious, and they will deserve all they get. I wonder what Tom Dow will think of it, said Edward Bryce. He'll be mad, said Sergeant Tyler. Dow's not half a bad sort. If the men would follow his advice, there would never be attacks of this description. 
I don't think any of the union men in camp will feel the loss of Eli Spence. That man is an out-and-out -out scoundrel, Mr. Bryce. When you have had a rest, I have some information I can give you about this man. Wide Awake knows more about him than he cares to say, said Ted Bryce. I'll question him, said Tyler. I often wonder who Wide Awake is. The man puzzles me. I fancy he's a man suffering unjustly for another person's misdeeds. You've hit the right mark, said Ted Bryce, but do not give him a hint of what you think, or he will keep silent about Spence. End of chapter 17「eighteen of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Big Drought Shearing was over, the Unionists had struck their camp and retired beaten, and Munda Station resumed its normal attitude. Wyndham Hanworth accompanied Ida Bryce and his sister to Sydney, and Herbert Golding had commenced the sitting for his portrait. Eli Spence and his mates were committed for trial on a charge of incendiarism and assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm. Sergeant Tyler wished attempted murder to be included in the charge, but Edward Bryce begged him not to push it so hard against the men. The information Tyler received about Eli Spence related, strangely enough, to the murder of Henry Bryce. He gave Edward Bryce a hint as to the nature of the communication, but Ted did not think it of much importance. He could not see what object Eli Spence had in murdering Henry Bryce. Ted Bryce remained at Munda. The shearing had been good, better than he anticipated, and some of the men had departed with big cheques, as much as seventy pounds being earned by some of them. A lot of this hard-earned money found its way into the pockets of Dame Killam at the Kangaroo. Some of these shearers are careless fellows, and take no thought for the morrow. No sooner do they knock up a cheque, than they at once proceed to knock it down at the nearest drinking den. Mrs. Warden always reaped a rich harvest when shearing was over. She had captured two of her husbands after shearing time at Munda. Edward Bryce tried to persuade the men to have their cheques drawn on a Sydney bank, and made only negotiable there, but the bulk of them refused. He knew very well before they reached Sydney, the greater part of their money would be gone. Sam Fraser, the trainer, had been sent to Randwick with the Phantom Colt and two other horses, with instructions to train the youngster and see how he shaped. No rain had fallen for weeks in the western district. The sun blazed down upon the parched ground and shrivelled up every green blade of grass and burnt the life out of the earth. It was fearfully hot, and the thermometer went up to 118 in the shade. Edward Bryce knew if rain did not fall within a week, it would be a very serious matter indeed. The River Darling was no longer navigable. It had been dry for some months, and now the tremendous heat put the finishing touch on it. Thousands upon thousands of sheep were dying, and thousands more would follow if rain did not fall. Another week passed, and still no rain. There was hardly a cloud in the sky. It was brilliantly clear and of a dazzling blue. At night, the intense heat of the day abated somewhat, but everything was hot to the touch, as though it had been taken out of a furnace and left to cool. A dense haze, almost like a mild fog, hung around the homestead, and seemed to choke every waft of cool air that swept across the arid plains. Ted Bryce sat on the veranda with Wide Awake, who had just come in from a ride of many miles. "'This is terrible, Mr Bryce,' he said. "'I never saw the like of it before. There's not a blade of grass to be seen for miles, and the run is just one bare brown plain.' "'We'll ride out tomorrow, said Ted, and make an inspection.' Next day the heat was as intense as ever. There was no avoiding the piercing rays of the sun. They penetrated everywhere. Mile after mile Ted Bryce rode, and on all sides saw nothing but desolation. Even the wild animals and birds had at last given in. Thousands of rabbits were seen lying dead in every direction, 
and in some places they lay piled up under the trees in heaps. Scores of kangaroos, emu, and other native animals were lying about dead. The stench in places was abominable, but it could not be avoided. A great plague had fallen upon the land. It was the drought plague, a terrible scourge, more to be feared than the ravages of a pestilence or disease. "'Unless we have rain before Christmas, it will be awful,' said Edward Bryce. "'And with January to look forward to, heaven knows what will become of us.' "'We generally have rain in January here,' said Wide Awake. "'It's a good month for rain up our way.' "'So it is,' said Ted. "'But I was thinking of the heat. Showers will do no good now. We want a deluge.' It was pitiable to see the carcasses and bleached bones of thousands of sheep lying about. In places, hundreds of them had huddled together and died. The water holes were so blocked up with carcasses, and the smell was so terrible that Ted Bryce rode hastily away. "'We've used a hundred tons of lucerne and wheat and hay during the last ten months,' said Ted. "'It's lucky we grow it here, and that it costs but little to produce.' I remember my father told me in the big drought ten years ago it cost Munda Station three thousand for feed, and carriage at the rate of thirty pound a ton had to be paid. That was ruinous, said Wide Awake. I always thought it was a wise plan when you started to grow your own feed. It's a grand thing to have a supply in a bad season. By Jove, said Ted, look over there, Wide Awake. It's cloudy. I believe they've had rain over yonder. Hurrah, shouted Wide Awake. Those are rain clouds, sure enough. We may have news tonight that there's been a downpour out back. They rode back to the homestead, and sure enough, that night, news was brought that there had been a heavy storm in the paddocks, the water being up to a horse's shoulder in places. Several tanks were filled, and two miles and a half of fencing washed away. The water was running into the river, having already come twenty-five miles in its course along the creeks. "'Good news indeed,' said Ted Bryce. "'We shall be able to get feed, and soon have our horses fat.' "'Better than nothing,' said Wide Awake. "'But I wish we could get a storm round here.' Next morning, Ted Bryce, on looking out into the garden, fancied there was a mist dancing before his eyes. There was no wind, and yet all the leaves seemed to move although the branches did not stir. The fruit also appeared to move. He rubbed his eyes and looked again, this time the vegetables. They were no longer green, but all colours, and strange to say, the same restless movement was noticeable on them. He went into the garden, and soon discovered the cause of this strange phenomenon. Thousands of ladybirds had invaded the garden, a regular plague of them, and they covered up every leaf and plant, and were devouring everything green in the place. It was these tiny insects moving about caused the peculiar scene that had surprised Ted Bryce. There was no stopping this pest. The ladybirds had taken possession and would not be dislodged. It was disheartening, and Ted Bryce commenced to think there was no luck about the place. However, he had, like scores of other squatters, to make the best of it, and to read in the Sydney papers how shameful it was that these station holders were not more heavily taxed, and made to disgorge some of their vast profits for the benefit of the community. It made Ted Bryce wild to read the rash and outrageous assertions made by irresponsible men both in and out of Parliament. "'Rolling in wealth, are we?' he said to himself. "'I shall lose seven or eight thousand here this year if I lose a penny.' Hey ho a squatter's life just at present is not a happy one. It's no use growling. Hello, what's this? he said, as he turned the paper he was reading over. The Bryce mystery, a clue at last. This was what he read under the above heading. At last the police have obtained evidence which we believe will place them on the track of the murderers of the late Henry Bryce, of the well-known firm of Bryce, Golding and Company. At present, the investigation department is reticent, but we are in a position to state that one of the suspected men is now in custody on another very serious charge. It would be unfair to state definitely the name of this man, although we are in possession of it, as he will be tried for the other offence shortly. 
and it might prejudice his case. We can, however, state that this man was once in the San Francisco police force, and that he belonged to a gang of men in that city, known as High Flyers. These men murdered several individuals in a similar manner to that in which the late Mr. Bryce came by his death. As a rule, the men done to death by these High Flyers in Frisco were not robbed. The gang of ruffians were employed by other men to get rid of certain citizens who stood in the way of men holding high positions in the city. It may have been some such influence was at work in the case of the late Mr. Bryce. Anyway, the information in the possession of the police promises to lead up to some interesting developments. When Ted Bryce had finished reading the paragraph, he sent for Wide Awake. Read that, he said, handing him the paper and pointing out the paragraph. Wide Awake read it and handed the paper back. That means Eli Spence, said Ted Bryce. I reckon it does, said Wide Awake. That's Sergeant Tyler's doing. He got all I knew about Eli Spence out of me, but he did not tell me what it was for. But you guessed, said Ted. I had an idea. I knew Spence by sight in Frisco. Is what is stated here true if it refers to him? asked Ted. Yes, said Wide Awake. He was kicked out of the force for it. Lots of the shearers know all about it. That is what caused the row when I fought him in the shed. I gave a brief sketch of his career for the benefit of his mates. Do you think he had anything to do with the murder of my father? asked Ted Bryce. I won't go as far as that, but I know he was at your father's election meeting that night, said Wide Awake. How do you know that? asked Ted Bryce, now thoroughly roused. Because he let it out himself in the shed. It must be true. He did not invent it said Wide Awake. Then I wonder who the scoundrel is that is at the back of him, said Ted. Eli Spence is not a man to stick at trifles. He would knock anyone on the head for a twenty-pound note or less if he thought it could be done without danger, said Wide Awake. It ought to be easy enough to get out of him who put him up to the cowardly outrage, said Ted. That is, if he really had a hand in it. I don't know so much about that, said Wide Awake. I have known cases where the murderer actually accepted money from a man thoroughly disguised, and no attempt was made to learn the name of the man who gave the bribe. But surely the taker of the bribe would endeavour to learn who had bribed him. They generally extort money and blackmail them after it's all over, said Ted. It has not been so in this case, if Eli Spence is the man, said Wide Awake, or he would not have been here shearing. He was hard up. That is why he came here. Now, depend upon it. If Eli Spence did the deed, he does not know the man who urged him on to it. These villains who bribe men to commit crimes have a way of shielding themselves, even from the man or men they employ. Eli Spence may be guilty, said Ted Bryce, but as I told Sergeant Tyler, I doubt it. For the life of me, I cannot see what Spence's motive could be. The motive would be ten or twenty pounds, perhaps more, said Wide Awake. Spence would murder a man every week, if he dare, for that amount. Is it possible? said Ted Bryce. In the case of such a man as Eli Spence, yes, said Wide Awake. What's that? said Ted Bryce. A sound like small lumps of soft earth rolled into balls the size of marbles was heard at intervals, falling on the roof. Raindrops, said Wide Awake. They were so excited they both forgot all about Eli Spence and his alleged misdeeds and sprang up and made for the garden. Sure enough, the storm was coming and raindrops that left a splash the size of a penny piece were dropping on the wooden steps leading on to the veranda. In a few moments, the drops came down in a torrent and in five minutes it was raining as though a second deluge had commenced. End of chapter 18。chapter 19 of Who Did It by Nat Gould。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。The Portrait。Ida Bryce went home when she reached Sydney, and Flora Hanworth again kept house for her brother. Mrs. Bryce was quite amiable and Ida found things much pleasanter than when she left to go to Munda. 
Ida saw a change had come over Mrs. Bryce, and she divined what had brought it about. From what her brother had told her, she surmised that her stepmother was either engaged to Herbert Golding, or had gone so far as to promise to marry him when a sufficient time had elapsed since Henry Bryce's death. Mrs. Bryce thought the best policy she could pursue was to leave Ida to her own devices, and she knew the girl was to be trusted. There was a sturdy independence about Ida Bryce, which made her stepmother rather afraid of her. She would not have Ida know of her engagement to Herbert Golding for worlds. She knew she would not spare her if she found out the truth. So Ida Bryce did as she pleased, and Mrs. Bryce kept her own counsel, and did not interfere with her. Wyndham Hanworth commenced to paint the portrait of Herbert Golding, who, from his own choice, came to the artist's studio for that purpose. There was something about Herbert Golding that interested the artist. Wyndham Hanworth could not help thinking, as he painted Herbert Golding's portrait, what lay behind his subject's impenetrable countenance. He became thoroughly interested in his work, but as the painting progressed, it did not satisfy him. It was like Herbert Golding, and yet unlike him. At times the artist thought it an excellent portrait, and at other times he felt inclined to put his fist through the canvas and commence the work again. Herbert Golding seemed pleased with the work, and yet when he looked at it, Wyndham Hanworth saw a peculiar expression on his face, as though he was surprised and half afraid. "'Peculiar man, Herbert Golding,' said Wyndham to his sister. "'I cannot make him out at all. He appears to me to be a man with a secret troubling him, and I believe he actually thinks I am of that opinion, and am painting him accordingly. I cannot help the expression on his face. I am afraid the portrait will not be a great success, Flora. I wish I could throw up the task and finish off the shearing picture. It would be more congenial work.' "'Do you like Herbert Golding?' asked Flora. "'Can't say I do,' replied her brother. "'The more I study him, the less I like him. I'm afraid this is what hinders me in my work. If I liked the man, I could put more heart into my work. As it is, I feel disposed to burn the portrait sometimes. It must be an uncongenial occupation, painting a man's portrait, and at the same time having a distinct dislike to him,' said Flora. "'That's it exactly,' he replied. But the worst of it is, I have no particular reason to dislike him. The feeling grows upon me the more I see of him. Ida Bryce dislikes him, said Flora, and I have noticed of late, Wynne, that your likes and Ida's have a great similarity. Nonsense, said her brother. What has that got to do with it? A good deal more than you imagine, said Flora. Are you very fond of Ida, Wynne? He hesitated a moment and then said, Yes, I am. I am afraid I am more than fond of her, but I cannot say she gives me any encouragement. You don't know Ida, said his sister. If she loved you ever so much, she would not show it until she was perfectly sure you were in love with her. I am afraid there's not much chance for me in that quarter, sighed Wyndham. You see, she is an heiress, and I am a struggling artist. Ida Bryce is the sort of girl to make a brilliant match. Ida will never marry a man she does not love, said Flora. You have a better chance with her than any one. Ida thinks nothing of money. You need not let that trouble you. Sometimes at Munda I fancied she liked me a little, said her brother. Of course she does, said Flora. Who could help it? she added with a glance of pride at him. Because you consider me passable as a brother, said Wyndham. It does not follow Ida Bryce cares a straw about me. We shall see, said his sister. I rather fancy Ida cares several bundles of straw about you. You only want to set one or two of the straws on fire, and there will be a regular blaze of love for you. Upon my word, you are improving, said her brother. You are quite smart. Your visit to Munda has done you a lot of good. It has, said Flora, smiling. Her brother looked at her curiously, and then said, Are you fond of Edward Bryce, Flora? Yes, she replied with a bright smile. Very. You sly minx, said her brother. I believe he has proposed to you. He has, said Flora. Good gracious, when? he exclaimed. 
the day we left for sydney he nearly did it in the night of the attack she said i am very glad to hear it said wyndham ted bryce is a real good fellow tell me all about it there's not much to tell she said i think we were in love with each other long ago the night those men attacked the homestead you remember i attended to ted and ida looked after you well when he was on the sofa in a kind of half faint he he out with it flora said her brother he kissed me said flora wonderful said wyndham courageous youth i should as soon think of jumping over the moon or trying to as attempting to kiss ida bryce there you are wrong said flora we girls like to be taken by storm it is the sudden attack that is irresistible a girl likes a lover to be masterful that's a wrinkle said wyndham i am afraid if i attempted to take such a liberty with ida bryce she would never speak to me again catch her in the right mood and try her said flora but where did ted ask you to be his wife said wyndham at the railway station said flora how unromantic laughed wyndham yes wasn't it said flora we were just going to get into the train and ted said flora tell me you love me before you leave tell me you will be my wife it was rather sudden but i expected it and said yes to both his questions that was all he would have sealed the compact with another kiss had it been possible and you never told me said wyndham i thought it best for ted to speak first but as you asked me i have told you all said flora i congratulate you i could not wish my sister to marry a better man she came to him and kissed him and said fondly i hope before long ida will really be my sister he shook his head but made no reply he had his doubts about being successful with ida bryce herbert golding's portrait was approaching completion and wyndham hanworth seemed to hold back from putting the finishing touches to the face ida bryce's remarks about painting a man's face so that he should see the expression of his own hidden thoughts in it often occurred to him one morning after an hour's sitting herbert golding said you seem to have some difficulty in giving the proper expression to the face i do not think i often look like that mr hanworth i have not finished it off said the artist i think you will be pleased with it when it is finished the expression ought to be more pleasing said herbert golding wyndham hanworth looked at the portrait and said it is a good likeness as you have sat for it mr golding the face often gives expression to the thoughts and perhaps your thoughts have not always been pleasant when you have been sitting herbert golding started and looked hard at wyndham hanworth then a thought seemed to strike him and he said how do you know what i am thinking about when i sit to you i did not say i knew what you were thinking about mr golding the artist replied i merely said that from the expression of your face it was probable your thoughts had not always been pleasant then you should have asked me to look more cheerful said herbert golding and if i had asked you to try and look cheerful when you did not feel so your picture would have been unnatural said wyndham there is a vast difference between painting a forced expression and a real one i don't see that replied mr golding a photographer often asks you to look more pleasing when you sit to have a photo taken i am not a photographer said wyndham hanworth i am an artist and i like to paint as true to nature as my abilities allow if you do not care for the portrait mr golding i am quite willing for another artist to undertake the commission there is no occasion for that said herbert golding your abilities are too well known to be questioned mr hanworth i merely suggested that i did not think i was such a glum-looking personage wyndham hanworth looked at the picture and said you are right mr golding the expression is rather gloomy i think however i can make it more pleasing if it will suit you better but you must bring pleasant thoughts with you the next time you sit herbert golding left the studio somewhat ill at ease he wondered if it could be true that the portrait was a reflection of his thoughts he knew those thoughts had at times been of anything but a pleasant nature he determined at the next sitting he would look on the bright side of things and not dwell upon matters calculated to make him look gloomy wyndham hanworth sat down before the portrait when herbert golding left him 
and examined it intently. "'You are a bad lot, I'm afraid,' he said to himself, addressing the picture. "'I've tried hard to make you look pleasant, but it's no go. "'There's something behind that face I can't fathom. "'It is no business of mine, but I wish you had a clearer conscience, Herbert Golding. "'If you had, it would come out in your expression. "'Confound the thing, he looks as though he had committed a crime, "'and was hourly afraid of being taxed with it. "'That will never do in a presentation portrait. "'I'll try again.' It won't take me long to copy what I want of this portrait. I'll give him a new head, and try and put a clear conscience into it. I never was so stuck up before. I wish to goodness someone else had the work. Next time Herbert Golding called, Wyndham Hanworth said, I'm going to put a new head on to you, Mr. Golding, so try and have pleasant thoughts in it. A new head? What do you mean? he asked. I mean, I am determined to give you a chance to look pleasant, replied the artist. I will paint a fresh portrait. It will not take me long. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanworth, said Herbert Golding. I should be sorry for my friends to think I always looked so gloomy. I hope it will not give you very much trouble. An artist should never think any trouble too great to make his work good, said Wyndham. And you will destroy the other painting, said Herbert Golding, somewhat anxiously. Wyndham Hanworth looked at him in surprise. Probably, he said. At present I want to see how the portraits compare, and to note the difference in the expression. When I have done that, I certainly see no use in keeping the other picture. He's afraid of that portrait, thought Wyndham Hanworth, when Herbert Golding had left. I've a good mind to finish it off and give him a fright. I believe Ida Bryce was right and Herbert Golding saw his own thoughts reflected in the face I painted. I caught one expression that startled me. It was only a brief flash across his face, but I never saw a greater look of apprehension, almost terror, in a man's eyes before. I'll do it now, while it is vividly before me. Wyndham Hanworth took the portrait of Herbert Golding, and commenced to work upon the face. End of chapter 19《ハッピーニュースを見つけた!》ッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッッ It is generally foreshadowed by failures, most of them unexpected. Herbert Golding was uneasy at the turn affairs had taken, and the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company had not improved its position of late. In fact, things were going from bad to worse in that quarter. Dr. Langside was somewhat surprised when the thirty thousand pounds advanced by Henry Bryce to the company was refunded. He had a shrewd idea where the money came from, but he kept his opinion to himself. He was satisfied to know the money was safe. The squatters had not had a good season, and there had been heavy withdrawals from the banks. How the run commenced, no one exactly knew. Rumours quickly circulate. People talk these matters over, and as the statements pass from mouth to mouth, they become enlarged and exaggerated. At first the banks were well able to meet the demands for gold made upon them, but the managers could not help seeing if the withdrawals continued, the position would be serious. At least one bank closed its doors, and then ensued a panic such as Sydney had never witnessed before. All the banks were rushed, and the drain upon their resources was tremendous. Every morning the papers gave news that startled the public, and bank after bank suspended business, until only such old establishments as the Bank of New South Wales, the Union Bank, the Bank of Australasia, the City Bank, and one or two more held out. A senseless rush was made upon the Savings Bank of New South Wales, and crowds of depositors stood outside the doors, fighting and struggling to gain admission, in order to withdraw their accounts. Many persons who succeeded in reaching the counters and obtaining their money 
were robbed of it in the crowd outside, and the pickpockets reaped a rich harvest. The Safe Deposit Company was resorted to, and thousands of pounds worth of sovereigns were withdrawn from circulation and locked up in this place. Even the Post Office Savings Bank was not exempted from the general run, and thousands of pounds were withdrawn by the frightened depositors. Of course, these banks were perfectly safe, but in times of panic people do not consider what they are doing, but follow the lead given like a flock of sheep. Passing down George Street one morning, Wyndham Hanworth saw a tremendous crowd of people blocking up the roadway in front of a well-known bank. He understood what had happened, and quietly observed the scene. It was a curious crowd, composed of all kinds of people, but he judged the main portion of them were small depositors, eager to withdraw what little they had to their credit. Those who had money on fixed deposit, he knew, stood but little chance of withdrawing, and there were many such people in the crowd. He noted the varying expression on the faces of this struggling mass of people. The bare idea of losing their money had transformed many of them. People that at ordinary times were quiet and unobtrusive were rushing about with white faces and wild eager eyes, asking senseless questions and badgering everyone they met for information. Some men with notes on this particular bank were selling them at a considerable loss to men more far-seeing than themselves, who were eager to make this panic profitable to themselves. Pound notes changed hands for seventeen shillings and less, and one individual actually offered Wyndham Hanworth ten one-pound notes for five sovereigns. Madness seemed to have settled upon the people and altered them beyond recognition, the panic lasted for several days, and the government had to step in, in order to allay the fears of the public, and put a stop, if possible, to this run on the banks that still remained open. The locking up of so much gold caused great inconvenience, and the resources of the sound banks were taxed to the utmost. A lull came after the storm, but the excitement did not abate for a long time. It was quite evident that the bulk of the banks would have to reconstruct, and this not always on favourable terms to the depositors. Men began to grumble about the big dividends to shareholders some of these banks had been paying, 25%, and some went so far as to say these dividends had been paid out of fixed deposits. Enormous sums had been recklessly lent upon securities that had greatly depreciated in value, Wyndham Hanworth was told of one case in which a bank had advanced a hundred thousand pounds on an estate that was not at that time worth half the amount. There were scores of similar cases. Squatters had borrowed money on wool in the expectation of a big clip, and when their sheep died by the thousands, they found the number of bales fell far short of what they had reckoned upon, and consequently they were in a hole. Bank directors had a lively time of it during this crisis. No words were too strong for people to use against them, and accusations, wildly improbable, were brought forward. One director was accused of persuading all his to place money on fixed deposit in the bank when he knew it was not in a sound financial condition. He was even accused of having forced men who were in his power to bank money in the institution of which he was a director. Many people were brought to the verge of ruin. It was maddening to them to think that they had an ample sum on fixed deposit in a bank, and yet had no earthly chance of drawing it out, or even of negotiating a loan upon it. But as the public excitement waned, many people did very foolish things. Some sold their deposits at a great loss, others secured small advances upon them at ruinous interest. Moneylenders saw their opportunity and stepped in. They lent with a sparing hand to supply present needs and raked in securities of great value. These men knew that it was only a question of time before they would be able to realise a tremendous profit. They anticipated the schemes of reconstruction the banks would adopt and worked upon this foundation. Enterprising shopkeepers placed notices in their windows and 
stating that full value in goods would be given in exchange for one pound notes on such and such a bank hundreds of people were induced to purchase goods they could have done without in order to obtain full value in kind for paper they feared might become worthless it was only when the government stepped in and made these notes a legal tender that people commenced to see their folly the banks that had not closed accepted the notes of the banks that had suspended for reconstruction purposes the savings banks accepted them as deposits at their full value and then the far-seeing man who had bought notes at a profit commenced to reap the benefit naturally this crisis in the legitimate banking institutions which was unavoidable came like a thunderclap on scores of shady investment and banking companies of the amalgamated land and investment company order herbert golding was in a peculiar position he foresaw what this crisis would lead to and yet he was not in a financial condition to take advantage of it inwardly he cursed himself as much as such an outwardly pious individual could do for handing over mrs bryce's thirty thousand with that amount of money at his command he felt he could have doubled it during the crisis and realised long before it became necessary to fulfil his promise to dr langside the amalgamated land company he knew could not hold out much longer he was quite aware the company had not been sound for two or three years as he sat in church apparently devoutly attending to the sermon of his vicar he was meditating upon the course he ought to take in order to ensure his own safety he abhorred flight he knew he could lay his hands on several thousands but he dreaded the exposure although he was a hypocrite he did not wish the world to know it he had a very good opinion of the world's opinion the vicar was expatiating in his mild way upon the results of the recent crisis and trusted it would be a lesson to his congregation not to place too much value upon worldly possessions but to look to higher things when the discourse was over he was very anxious to hear from herbert golding how the amalgamated land company's finances were and whether his own fixed deposits was safe henry golding satisfied him by saying it was a great advertisement for the company's stability that the present crisis had not affected them at all strange to say however when the term upon which a fixed deposit had been placed in the amalgamated land company expired the money was speedily withdrawn herbert golding knew there would soon come a time when there would be no ready cash to meet these withdrawals he wondered whether the bank would be allowed to formulate a scheme of reconstruction he rather fancied not because there was nothing sound about its present construction upon which to reconstruct when money paid into a bank is deliberately divided among the directors and the few shareholders in the shape of profits and there are no substantial assets to meet liabilities then herbert golding knew as well as any man fraud was the word to use in connection with that bank mrs bryce had been uneasy about her money and had plagued herbert golding with questions innumerable which he had answered to the best of his ability and his powers of evasion if mrs bryce had not been in love with him she would probably have acted like a sensible woman and disbelieved his fairy tales she was however blindly prejudiced in his favour and he carefully guided that prejudice into a channel favourable to the company wyndham hanworth found it a difficult matter to fix herbert golding's attention when he sat for his portrait but he succeeded in a fashion the new picture pleased herbert golding but it did not please wyndham hanworth the artist felt it was a flattering portrait and herbert golding was about the last man he cared to flatter he could not bear to look at the new portrait alone so he placed the two side by side undoubtedly the first painting was the better likeness but it did not represent herbert golding in a favourable light the more desirous herbert golding was that the first portrait should be destroyed the more determined the artist was that he would keep it to suit his own convenience he liked to look at this picture of herbert golding now that he had put that look into the eyes 
Since these finishing touches, Herbert Golding had not seen it. He would have liked it less than he did before. It turned out, however, that the first painting was to prove more important to Herbert Golding's career than the second. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Colts by Phantom. Sam Fraser had been chaffed considerably by the Randwick trainers when he returned to Sydney. He was asked if he had been out west on a fleecing expedition, and if he had been shearing any guileless young men in that locality. Sam took their bantering in good part and as he was fairly popular, he was soon left alone to continue his work in peace. The colt by Phantom was now three years old, and had shown such remarkable staying powers on the track, that the trainer fancied he would have a good chance in the Sydney Cup, with the light weight he was sure to get. Being out of a mare called Fright, Ted Bryce named him the Ghost, which was appropriate, Sam Fraser made no secret of his opinion of the colt. As Ted Bryce was not a betting owner, it mattered very little to him who knew the merits of the horse. He came up from Munda soon after Wyndham Hanworth had finished the second portrait of Herbert Golding. His engagement to the artist's sister was generally known, and Mrs. Bryce told Herbert Golding that Flora was a schemer and that she knew quite well why she was anxious to go to Munda with Ida. "'I should not be at all surprised if Ida accepted Mr. Hanworth,' said Mrs. Bryce. "'Anyone can see he is over head and ears in love with her.' It was perfectly correct that Wyndham Hanworth was in love with Ida Bryce, but she gave him very little encouragement. Sam Fraser was anxious Edward Bryce should see the ghost gallop, and Ted agreed to drive to the course and take Wyndham Hanworth with him. "'I know very little about horses,' said the artist, "'but I love a drive in the early morning, "'and if I shan't be in the way, I'll go with you, Ted.' About half-past six they were in a hansom, driving to the course, and went through the Centennial Park. It was a charming morning, nice and cool and a fresh breeze blowing. They could see numerous horses filing onto the course as they drove through the gates onto the Randwick Road. Sam Fraser had borrowed a horse to gallop with the ghost, as the pair he had brought down from Munda were not fast enough. It was evident to Ted Bryce, as soon as he saw the ghost, that the colt had made a vast improvement since he had been brought from Munda. "'That's a remarkably nice colt of yours, Mr Bryce,' said William Sellers, a well-known owner of racehorses, as the ghost walked onto the track. "'How's he bred?' "'He's by a horse we call the Phantom,' said Ted, "'out of a Yettendon mare called Fright. "'How the Phantom is bred is more than I can tell. "'He's a wild horse. "'We've never been able to catch him, "'although I can assure you we've had some great rides after him.' "'I've heard about that horse,' said Mr Sellers. "'Curious thing, isn't it? "'He must be a good bred one to get a colt like that.' "'Yes, I'm sure he's well-bred,' said Ted, "'and he's the best galloper I ever saw.' Then the conversation changed, and Sellers said, "'I suppose these banks have hit you a bit, "'the same as the rest of us, Mr Bryce.' "'Yes,' replied Ted, "'but luckily it will not inconvenience me. "'I've got some money in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company,' "'said William Sellers, "'and I'm anxious to draw it out. "'I gave notice I should withdraw when the twelve months was up, and I'm getting anxious about it. The money ought to have been paid a week ago. Mr. Golding, your partner, is the chairman of directors. I thought perhaps you might know how matters stood there, and whether they had been affected by the crisis. Ted Bryce had been asked several times since his return to Sydney if he knew anything about the affairs of the amalgamated company, and he was annoyed at the persistent requests for information. He knew, however, that Mr. Sellers was not a man to question him, merely out of curiosity, and, moreover, he liked William Sellers, who had often given him good advice about horses. "'I've been asked several times if I knew how the amalgamated company stands,' said Ted Bryce. "'I know nothing whatever about the bank. Mr. Golding ought to know what he is about. 
I should hardly think he would hold the position he does if he was not quite certain of the company's stability. As you are an old friend, Mr. Sellers, I may tell you in confidence that my father, according to Herbert Golding's statement, advanced the company £30,000. That amount was repaid not a long ago. It may have been a drain upon the resources of the company, but I should think it is sound. Thank you, Mr. Bryce, said Sellers. I have a couple of thousand in the amalgamated, and I don't care to lose it. If Mr. Hamworth does not mind, may I speak a word to you privately for a moment? By all means, said Wyndham, as he moved away and spoke to Sam Fraser, who was standing near, watching the ghost and his mate walk down towards the sheds where they were to start for a two miles gallop. There's something I've heard I think you ought to know, Mr. Bryce, said Sellers. I can't tell you where I received the information from, but I know it's correct. Don't tell me anything you do not feel it is right for you to disclose, said Ted. Under the circumstances, I think I am perfectly justified in telling you, said Mr. Sellers. I knew your father well, and I've known you for some years. Are you aware that your stepmother deposited £30,000 in the amalgamated? I am, said Ted. I strongly advised her not to do it. You did right, said Mr. Sellers. I know for an absolute fact that the 30000 paid into the amalgamated by Mrs. Bryce was used to pay back the same amount Herbert Golding got from your father. Ted Bryce had half suspected this, but it surprised him to hear it from Mr. Sellers. Are you certain about this? he asked. It is a serious matter. I'm positive, said Mr. Sellers. Ask Golding and see how he takes it. There's another thing I should like to tell you, Mr. Bryce. I do not believe your father ever advanced that money. But surely you do not suggest that Herbert Golding did it on his own responsibility, said Ted Bryce, surprised. That is precisely what I do mean, said Mr. Sellers, and I also believe your father found him out. Ted Bryce looked startled. When do you think he found him out? he asked. I was one of your father's committee when he put up for Balmain East, said Mr. Sellers. He gave me a hint about it himself. He advised me not to put any money in the amalgamated, but I had done it then. From what he said to me, I felt certain, had he lived, Herbert Golding would not now be a partner, nor would he have been an executor if your father could have altered his will. This is most extraordinary, Mr. Sellers. You ought to have given me this information before, said Ted. So I should have done, but I've been away in New Zealand. I only returned the day before yesterday. In order to lose no time, I thought I would tell you at once, although it is hardly the place for it said Mr. Sellers with a smile. It is very strange my father should be put out of the way so soon after his partner made this discovery, said Ted. It has proved a fortunate thing for Herbert Golding, said Mr. Sellers. But mind you, Mr. Bryce, I do not think he is the man to have had a hand in your father's death. It is a curious coincidence, that is all. I shall make further inquiries about this affair, said Ted Bryce. I am much obliged to you for giving me the information. If anything fresh transpires, I will call upon you. That is all I have to say, Mr. Bryce. I hope it will not spoil your morning's pleasure, but I thought it better to tell you as early as possible, said Mr. Sellers. No, you've not spoilt the morning's pleasure. You've given a zest to it, said Ted Bryce. I've sworn to avenge my poor father's death, and there shall be a day of reckoning for the man who caused it when I find him. William Sellers looked at Ted Bryce's face and thought he would not care to be in that man's shoes when Edward Bryce discovered him. Sam Fraser shouted, They're off, Mr. Bryce! And he pointed to a couple of horses rounding the bend at full gallop, and they were quickly in the straight. It's the ghost and la belle, said Mr. Sellers. The mare belongs to me. Then I'm much obliged to you for lending her to Fraser to gallop with my colt, said Ted. The obligation is on my side said William Sellers. From what my trainer says, the ghost should give me a very good line as to the merits of my mare. He gallops just like the old phantom, said Ted Bryce. You ought to pay me a visit at Munda, Mr. Sellers, and then you might get a glimpse of the horse. I should very much like to, said William Sellers. Mind I do not take you at your word and suddenly make a raid upon you. You'll have a hearty welcome whenever you come, said Ted. The ghost and Labelle were going along the back stretch at a great pace, and the gallop was evidently going to be a good one. 
The usual crowd of men on the track had their watches out, timing the go, and Sam Fraser kept glancing at his chronometer to see how the pace was. Those last two furlongs were got over in fast time, he said to Ted Bryce. It will be a real good gallop. La Belle was a five-year-old, and as she carried a light boy, Sam Fraser expected her to beat the colt comfortably. The ghost, however, did not mean to be left behind. At the ledger stand, the mare led him by a length, but the lad on the ghost shook the whip at the colt, and he soon drew level again. It was a ding-dong finish, and as they passed the post, La Belle was only about half a length to the good. "'By Jove, that colt's a clinker,' said Mr. Sellers. "'I congratulate you on having such a good one.' "'Is your mare reliable?' said Ted. "'It looks almost too good a performance for the colt, considering the race's La Belle's won. "'I can assure you there's not a more reliable track horse at Randwick than my mare,' said William Sellers. "'In that case, the ghost is much better than I ever thought him,' said Ted Bryce. Sam Fraser was delighted with the gallop, and the ghost walked into the yards as cool and fresh as though he had only been out for ordinary exercise. "'You ought not to get more than six stone ten pound or seven stone at the very outside on that colt in the Sydney Cup,' said Mr. Sellers. "'And what do you expect the mare to get?' asked Ted. "'About eight stone,' said Mr. Sellers. "'Then on this morning's gallop I ought to have a chance, if the ghost is not overweighted.' said Ted. Yes, a chance second to none, said Mr. Sellers. If I hear anything more about the amalgamated, I'll let you know, said Ted Bryce to Mr. Sellers, as he and Wyndham Hanworth got into the hansom. Call and see me, replied Mr. Sellers. Very well, replied Ted, as they started for Sydney. As they drove to town, Ted Bryce related to Wyndham most of the conversation he had had with Mr. Sellers. Wyndham Hanworth thought for a few moments, and then said, "'You have not seen the portraits I painted of Herbert Golding, Ted. Come up to the studio and have a look at them this afternoon.' "'Portraits?' said Ted. "'Have you painted more than one?' "'I painted two. Herbert Golding did not like the first. He said it was too gloomy-looking. I am very anxious to have your opinion, more especially after what you have told me,' said Wyndham. "'What difference can it make to my opinion of a portrait?' said Ted Bryce. Wait until you see it, said Wyndham, and then you will understand what I mean. End of chapter 21said Ted Bryce as he entered Wyndham Hanworth's studio, bearding the lion in his den. "'I'm afraid I'm not much of a lion,' said Wyndham. "'At all events, not a roaring lion, for I have not created much noise in the world.' "'What nonsense,' said Ted Bryce. "'Look here, Wyn, it's about time you gave up this constant running down of your work. Other people praise it. Why cannot you be satisfied with it?' "'Because whatever other people may say or think,' said Wyndham, I know it is not good work I've been turning out lately. I'm a bit unsettled, Ted. That's the true cause of it. Whatever have you got to unsettle you? said Ted Bryce. The artistic temperament accounts for it, probably. That is generally unsettled and uncertain, I believe. No, it is nothing to do with art in this instance, said Wyndham Hamworth. But it has a lot to do with nature, in the shape of a lovely woman. Oh, that's it, exclaimed Ted Bryce. I grant you, a charming girl is a disturbing element in a man's life, more especially when he has not put the desperate question to her. Surely you've not been refused, Win. Oh, no, I've not had the pluck to risk a refusal. I would rather exist in a blissful state of uncertainty than know there was no hope, said Wyndham. I managed to screw up courage to ask Flora, said Ted Bryce. Come, old fellow, if that is all that's hindering your work, ask her at once. Anyone can see you're in love with her. Why, you don't even know who the lady is, said Wyndham. But how can you know I'm in love with any particular girl? Bet you I know her name, said Ted Bryce. I have it in one guess. Front name, Ida. Surname, same as my own. I see, I've hit the mark. Take her win and may you be happy.'
do you think i have any chance with her said wyndham it's an absolute certainty that i shall be refused he said accepted said ted bryce i wish i could think so the artist said you don't know ida yet said her brother she's not demonstrative but she is a real good girl and has deep feelings i know she likes you and ida's liking is what a more impulsive girl would call love you give me hope said wyndham but consider our positions i have nothing to give your sister and she is rich it would be called a mercenary match on my part as i have no doubt it has been on flora's side i'd like to hear any man say flora was marrying me for my money said ted bryce he would stand a very good chance of being knocked down you say you have nothing to give ida i say you have the name of hanworth is already known to fame with ida's assistance and i'm not such a fool as to deny money is useful in such cases you will become a great artist you'll be able to devote your time to your work and also be able to paint what you like it's the struggling artist has to paint to order not the man who is famous or who has ample means you know that is true because you would not have painted herbert golding had such not been the case it has not been a labour of love painting that man's portrait said wyndham hanworth i am glad to hear you speak like this ted i was half afraid you might object to me as not being good enough for your sister then you wronged me said ted you are my best friend win and i know ida would be happy with you i'll chance it said wyndham but if your sister declines me with thanks it will be no more than i deserve ted bryce was not of this opinion and said so but where are the portraits of herbert golding he asked wyndham hanworth stepped to an easel upon which a picture rested and throwing off the cover disclosed the second portrait he had painted of herbert golding that's like him said ted bryce but it flatters him is this the second portrait yes said wyndham he did not like the first he would like it still less now i have put an expression into his eyes that i caught in them for a brief moment i confess the look startled me how said ted bryce what sort of a look was it you can judge for yourself said wyndham hanworth i will show you the portrait i am anxious to hear if your opinion coincides with my own he drew the covering off the next easel and edward bryce started back when he saw the picture good heavens win this must be imagination on your part herbert golding never had that look on his face surely i thought it would surprise you said the artist i assure you the expression is not exaggerated it is toned down softened if anything what do you think of it any one looking at that face can only surmise one thing said ted bryce and that is asked the artist that the man was terrified by his thoughts when he sat for the portrait i see it all now said ted bryce excitedly your opinion coincides exactly with mine said wyndham his thoughts were reflected in his face and i surprised them there it surprised him too when he saw it and that was before i had touched the eyes up but what are you so excited about ted don't you see cannot you guess said ted bryce you say his thoughts were reflected in his face as you painted him i believe you and i believe herbert golding was thinking about how my father met his death as he sat for that portrait i never saw such a look of absolute dread in a man's face before i am on the track at last win if that man did not murder my father he knew all about it he may not have struck the blow but he had a hand in my father's death i'll swear look at the face only a guilty man could look like that and his crime must have been an awful one you caught herbert golding in his true colours in that portrait it reveals the man as he is it's simply wonderful i must let sergeant tyler see it and hear what he has to say do nothing rash ted said the artist i knew what you would think when you saw the picture that is why i said what i did in the cab this morning but be careful you have a dangerous man to deal with i am certain and he may not be guilty after all you cannot look on that face and say herbert golding has a clear conscience said ted bryce i grant you that said wyndham but it may not be your father's death that troubles him it may be money matters affairs connected with the amalgamated or other matters we know nothing of it may be as you say said ted bryce that we must find out i must think of some plan 
You say he has not seen the portrait since you altered the eyes? Under those circumstances, it will be a shock for him when he does see it. I should like to be present when he looks at it, and also have Tyler here. We could easily be concealed in this room. I'll trap him, so sure as he is alive. That portrait will be the ruin of Herbert Golding. They talked the matter over for some time, and finally Ted Bryce left saying he would arrange for everything connected with Herbert Golding seeing the portrait. When Edward Bryce and Dr Langside went through the books of the firm of Bryce, Golding and Company, with a chartered accountant to assist them, it was soon evident that Herbert Golding had been helping himself freely. Herbert Golding, it must be understood, had put no money into the firm when Henry Bryce took him into it. He had been engaged in Henry Bryce's business for many years, and had made himself thoroughly master of the concern. It was this that induced Henry Bryce to give him an interest in the business. But it had only been a minor position, and Henry Bryce was the real firm of Bryce, Golding & Company. Herbert Golding's position in the firm was clearly defined in Henry Bryce's papers. Since Henry Bryce's death, with the consent of Edward Bryce, Herbert Golding had been entrusted with much greater powers. He had used his power to the full, and from the books it was gathered he had drained the resources of the firm considerably. It was the opinion of the accountant that Herbert Golding could be criminally prosecuted for what he had done. When Ted Bryce and Dr Langside came to talk the matter over, Ted said, He has not spent all the money. He's not the man to do that. He has a hoard put away somewhere, and he must be made to disgorge it. By the by, Doctor, have you seen the portraits of Herbert Golding that Mr Hanworth has painted? asked Ted. No, said Dr Langside. Then I should like you to see them, said Ted Bryce, and tell me what your opinion is of the first portrait he painted. I will call round at the studio and look at them, said Dr Langside. In the meantime, what shall you do about the books? Leave that to me, said Ted Bryce. I will promise you Herbert Golding will be out of the firm in a week, and that if he has the money safe, he shall give it up. You'll be clever if you can manage all that in a week, said Dr Langside. I have a tight screw I can put on him, said Ted Bryce. Then screw it down without any mercy, said Dr Langside. That man is a bad lot. I know he is, said Ted Bryce. Get him out of the firm as speedily as possible, said Dr Langside because the Amalgamated Land Company is sure to smash up before long, and if he was in the firm, it might complicate matters. I'll see to that, said Ted. Are you perfectly certain about the Amalgamated? Yes, said Dr Langside. I cannot tell you how I am certain, but you may take it for granted. And does Golding know the company is insolvent? asked Ted Bryce. He does, said Dr Langside, and he has known for some time. What a scoundrel the man is, said Ted Bryce. He is one of the biggest hypocrites I know, said Dr Langside, and of all men I hate a hypocrite. What a surprise it will be for the goody-goody people when the crash comes, said Ted Bryce. It will, said Dr Langside. Religion in this case covers a multitude of sins. Don't forget to call and see those portraits, said Ted Bryce. I will look in as I go home said Dr Langside. He did look into Wyndham Hanworth's studio, and when he saw the first portrait of Herbert Golding, he was as surprised as Edward Bryce had been, although he did not show it so openly. That is the face of a man with a heavy burden on his conscience, said Dr Langside. Do you know, Mr Hanworth, that the painting is an exceedingly clever one? I'm glad you think so, said Wyndham, because Mr Golding did not like it. I don't wonder at it, said Dr Langside, laughing. You must have caught the expression very accurately. I did, said Wyndham. I was amazed at the look of terror in the eyes. You see it in the portrait, do you not, Doctor? Quite plainly. I never saw a painting of a man's mind before, but I am certain Herbert Golding's thoughts are painted on that face. It is the face of a man who has forgotten for the time where he is, and has let his thoughts master him. When you caught that expression, Herbert Golding was utterly oblivious of the fact that he was in your studio, and that you were painting his portrait. 
He was, I should think, startled when he saw it, said Dr. Langside. He has not seen it as it is, said Wyndham Hanworth. I have put that expression in the eyes since he saw it last. Then I should show it to him now, said Dr. Langside. I intend to, said Wyndham. It will teach him a lesson he will never forget, said Dr. Langside. He will see his thoughts reflected in his face, and it will teach him the truth of the saying, that a guilty conscience needs no accuser. End of chapter 22「Who Who Did It」by Nat Gould This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Face to Face Herbert Golding expressed great surprise when Edward Bryce said they must dissolve partnership. He was not aware that a thorough examination of the books had been made. When he heard the reasons given by Edward Bryce for wishing to dissolve the partnership, he was exceedingly angry and indignant. "'It's of no use your protesting in this manner,' said Ted Bryce. "'A thorough overhauling of the books has been made, and that ought to be sufficient to prove to you that you can no longer remain in the firm. You may think yourself lucky if you're not criminally prosecuted. I've not made my mind up what course to take at present, but if you do not at once retire from the firm, I shall know how to act.' "'I shall not consent to a dissolution of partnership "'without it is made worth my while,' said Herbert Golding. "'I may as well tell you,' said Ted Bryce, "'taking no notice of his remarks, "'that I do not believe my father ever advanced you thirty thousand pounds "'for the amalgamated land company. "'I go further and say he did not. "'You paid that money back with the thirty thousand Mrs Bryce "'at your instigation put into the bank on fixed deposit.' You see, I know a good deal about your transactions. Perhaps you are aware I'm engaged to be married to Mrs. Bryce, sneered Herbert Golding. My sister guessed as much, but I was loath to believe it, said Ted Bryce. I thought Mrs. Bryce had more respect for herself and for my father's memory. It was with difficulty Herbert Golding controlled his temper. He did so by a great effort, knowing he was in an awkward fix. At the same time, he had an inward feeling of satisfaction that he had taken the precaution to safely dispose of a considerable sum of money which he could put his hands on at short notice. "'Mrs. Bryce has a better opinion of me than you have,' he said. "'I'm sorry for her judgment," said Ted Bryce. "'I must also inform you that the money you have taken must be refunded.' "'I have not drawn more out of the business than I was entitled to,' said Herbert Golding angrily. "'And I have no money to refund.' "'You have falsified the books,' said Ted Bryce. "'No doubt you have adopted similar means to bolster up the amalgamated land company. "'Perhaps it may be news to you to know that I am aware that the company is insolvent "'and that a crash cannot be long averted. "'Before the company smashes up, you must repay Mr. Sellers his deposit of two thousand pounds. "'If this is not done, I am afraid the crash will come sooner than you anticipate.' "'Herbert Golding was cornered and did not know how to act. He stood on the brink of something worse than ruin. "'Will you agree to my terms?' said Edward Bryce. "'What are they?' asked Herbert Golding. "'Dissolution of our partnership by mutual consent immediately. I have the form already legally drawn up. The refunding of the money you have unlawfully taken out of the firm. The payment to Mr. Sellers of his two thousand. As to the thirty thousand you obtained from Mrs. Bryce, it is safe with me, and she will not suffer by your perfidy. You must also release Mrs. Bryce from her engagement. As to resigning your seat in the house, I leave that to your own discretion. And as for the amalgamated land company, it will come to grief without any interference on my part. If I accede to your unjust demands, it means ruin to me, said Herbert Golding. I have helped build up this business. Had it not been for my exertions, this firm would never have been in the position it is today. I think you owe me something on that score, Edward Bryce. I acknowledge your services in the past, said Edward Bryce, but I cannot overlook what you have done. On account of those services you allude to, I will not take any action against you if you agree to my terms. Will you sign the dissolution of partnership deed at once, so that it may be notified in the papers? When that notice is made public, 
said Herbert Golding. I shall have no chance to make a recovery. I have nothing to do with that, said Edward Bryce. Once and for all, will you agree to my terms? I will sign the document, said Herbert Golding. And about the refunding of the money, asked Ted Bryce. How much do you require? asked Herbert Golding. Roughly speaking, about nine or ten thousand pounds, said Edward Bryce. Herbert Golding laughed harshly. I have a few hundreds at the bank, if you're welcome to that, he said. What have you done with the money? Sank it in the amalgamated, said Herbert Golding. Edward Bryce was inclined to believe him. He knew Herbert Golding had great faith in the company when it was formed, and he thought he might have been tempted to take the money in order to bolster up the finances of the company. As he looked at Herbert Golding, he thought of the portrait he had seen at Wyndham Hanworth's, and wondered if the man before him had any hand in his father's death. He must wait and see how his plans developed. At present, he could not bring himself to believe that Herbert Golding actually committed the deed. Herbert Golding saw Ted Bryce hesitated, and said, I assure you, I am speaking the truth. If the amalgamated turns out a failure, I shall lose all my money. We will waive the question of refunding the money, said Ted Bryce, but you must agree to all the other proposals. And suppose Mrs. Bryce refuses to release me from the engagement, said Herbert Golding. If you tell her everything, said Edward Bryce, and she still decides to marry you, I shall not interfere, but you must tell her the whole truth, or I shall do so myself. Herbert Golding had to give in. The deed was duly signed and witnessed, and the partnership dissolved, and William Sellers was agreeably surprised to receive his deposit of £2,000 with interest at 10% added. By the way, said Ted Bryce to Herbert Golding, I have seen the portraits Wyndham Hanworth painted of you. I should strongly advise you to get him to destroy the first one. Has he not done so? said Herbert Golding. It is scandalous he should keep such a thing in his studio. I shall see him about it at once. Is he at home? He'll be in tomorrow morning at eleven, said Ted Bryce. I'm certain you will see him there at that hour. If you take a note from me to him, I'm sure he will accede to my request and destroy the picture. I should be obliged if you would give me a note to him, said Herbert Golding. You do not deserve it, said Ted Bryce, after all that has happened, but I will give you the note as you desire it. He wrote a note to the artist and handed it to Herbert Golding, who said, I will see him tomorrow at eleven. Herbert Golding left the offices a beaten man. He had been worsted by a man much younger than himself, and he was anxious to know how it would all end. As the partnership had been dissolved by mutual consent, he could give out that he had received a large sum of money for his share in the business, the bulk of which he meant to invest in the amalgamated company. This, he felt, would be a politic stroke, as it would uphold his own credit, and also that of the company. He was strangely anxious Wyndham Hanworth should destroy the first portrait. He inwardly felt that it, so to speak, gave him away, and exposed his faults and failings. He was also anxious the presentation should be made without delay, as it would increase his popularity. Sergeant Tyler was in Sydney for the trial of Eli Spence and his mates, as the government had thought it wise to have them tried in Sydney, where a perfectly unbiased jury could be sworn. Edward Bryce took Sergeant Tyler to Wyndham Hanworth's studio, and he saw both portraits. The whole circumstances were explained to him, and his opinion of the first painting agreed with those of the artist and Edward Bryce. "'That man's conscience gives him a lot of trouble,' said Sergeant Tyler. "'I should very much like to see him when he looks at the picture.' It was agreed that Sergeant Tyler and Edward Bryce should be in the studio when Herbert's Golding called, and watch the effect the sight of the portrait had upon him. Accordingly, they were there next morning, and were concealed behind a curtain, from which they could observe Herbert Golding without being seen by him. Punctually, at eleven, Herbert Golding called. Wyndham Hanworth read the note Edward Bryce had written, and which Herbert Golding handed to him. "'You are very anxious to have the picture destroyed,' said the artist in a tone of annoyance. "'Since you last saw it, I have made an alteration in the face. Perhaps you will like it better now.' 
I shall never like it, said Herbert Golding. I cannot bear it. But will you look at it again? asked Wyndham. If you wish it, he replied. Stand here, you will have a better light on it then, he said. Herbert Golding stood before the easel, and Sergeant Tyler and Edward Bryce had a good view of his face. Wyndham Hanworth pulled the covering off quickly, and when Herbert Golding stood face to face with his own portrait, he staggered back as though he had been struck a severe blow. The colour went out of his face, and his eyes were dilated with horror. He seemed to have lost all power of speech. In the portrait before him, Herbert Golding saw himself as he really was, and the sight appalled him. His own face on the canvas seemed to accuse him of some terrible crime. The eyes were fixed upon him, and he gazed at them like a man fascinated. It was some moments before he recovered himself. Then he looked at the artist with a pale, frightened face, and gasped. "'Take it away! It's horrible! I cannot bear the sight of it!' Wyndham Hanworth was not surprised at the effects the picture had on Herbert's golding. He handed him a chair and said, "'Sit down. You look faint.' Herbert's golding dropped down into the chair, looking cowed and miserable. "'Did I ever look like that?' he asked in a hollow voice. "'Yes,' said Wyndham Hanworth. "'You looked like that when we were talking about the murder of Henry Bryce. Don't you recollect?' Herbert Golding trembled from head to foot. "'I don't remember,' he gasped. "'We never spoke of the murder of Henry Bryce.' "'You have a bad memory,' said Wyndham Hanworth. "'You were thinking of Henry Bryce when that expression came into your face. I know it,' said the artist, fixing his eyes on the man cowering before him. "'Hush, for God's sake,' said Herbert Golding. "'You do not know what you are saying. How could you know what I was thinking about?' "'Look at your own face in that picture,' said the artist. "'Is not that enough to condemn you?' Herbert Golding recovered himself. He rose from the chair, and striding up to Wyndham Hanworth, said, "'I did not come here to be insulted. Why do you bring up Henry Bryce's murder now? If I did think of it at the time you were painting my portrait, no wonder I looked startled. If we conversed about it, I do not recollect the circumstances.' At all events, as an artist, you may have introduced a more pleasant subject. I could guess your thoughts as I painted that picture, said the artist. I am afraid I cannot comply with your request and destroy it. Then I shall, shouted Herbert Golding savagely, as he raised his clenched hand and aimed a blow at the picture. Ted Bryce saw his intention, and darting from behind the curtain, struck Herbert Golding's arm down, before he had time to do the picture any damage. When Herbert Golding saw who it was that had struck him, he gave a sharp cry of fear. "'You here?' he gasped. "'Yes, I've heard and seen all,' said Ted Bryce. "'Played the spy,' said Herbert Golding. "'And what may your object be in concealing yourself here?' "'To find out your true character, Herbert Golding.' "'From what I have seen, I have a shrewd suspicion you could tell me something about my father's death,' said Edward Bryce. Herbert Golding again turned pale, but he said angrily, "'Do you accuse me of having a hand in your father's death? You had better take care what you say. You may go too far.' "'I mean to go farther than I have done,' said Ted Bryce. "'If you had a hand in my father's death, Herbert Golding, there will be a heavy day of reckoning between us.' "'You shall pay for this,' said Herbert Golding, as he left the room, anxious to get away as quickly as possible. "'What do you think of him, Tyler?' said Edward Bryce, as the constable stepped from behind the curtain. "'He's a bad lot,' said Tyler. "'But I do not think he murdered your father. He would have been more frightened had such been the case. He may have had a hand in it, but I don't think he's the man that struck the blow.' End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 of Who Did It ?" by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tried and Convicted The trial of Eli Spence and his mates took place at Darlinghurst before the Chief Justice of the Colony, 
it was regarded as an important case, and the Crown was anxious to secure a conviction. During the shearing season, there had been several acts of incendiarism, and as the culprits had escaped each time, the conviction of Eli Spence and the other men was eagerly sought for. The prisoners had no grounds of defence. They were caught red-handed at Munda, and Edward Bryce, Wyndham Hanworth, Wideawake, Sergeant Tyler, and others testified to the men in the dock having committed the outrage. There had been some difficulty about Wideawake's evidence. At first he had declined to give his real name, but eventually he said he was known many years ago as Joel Chester. When Eli Spence heard the name, he was evidently surprised. He looked as though he had heard it before. To no other man present did Wide Awake's acknowledgment that his name was Joel Chester convey any meaning, but Eli Spence recognised it. Wide Awake looked straight at Eli Spence as he gave the name of Joel Chester, and saw him start. On behalf of the prisoners, Tom Dow gave evidence. He said what he could in their favour, but it amounted to very little. He had to acknowledge the men were not in the shearer's camp at the time of the attack on Munda. Mrs. Warden also gave evidence as to the prisoners being at the kangaroo, and stated that she did not think they would have had time to reach Munda. She was severely cross-examined, and before the legal gentleman had done with her, she heartily wished she had never left the West to come to Sydney. The jury were not long in coming to a decision. Their verdict against all the prisoners, after a quarter of an hour's consideration, was one of guilty. The Chief Justice, in sentencing the men, gave his opinion of the desperate nature of their crime, which, he said, tended to alienate any sympathy that might exist for the shearers. He pronounced Eli Spence to be a dangerous ruffian, who would not stop at murder even, to gain his own vile ends. Such a man was a standing menace to the maintenance of law and order, and life and property must be protected from such men. He sentenced Eli Spence to fourteen years' penal servitude, and the other prisoners, who had evidently been led on by Eli Spence, to ten years each. Such exemplary sentences had their due effect, and although severe, the general feeling was that it served them right. The prisoners were staggered when they heard the sentences, and Eli Spence muttered something to the effect that he would like to see the judge struck dead on the bench. But there was more to follow this trial in the case of Eli Spence. Sergeant Taylor had seen the effect the mention of Wide Awake's name had upon Eli Spence. He saw Wide Awake when the prisoners were removed from the court, and requested him to give him Eli Spence's reason for being startled at the name of Joel Chester. At first Wide Awake was reticent, but after some persuasion, he said that his brother, Joseph Chester, had been mixed up in a case of robbery in San Francisco, in which Eli Spence had been ringleader. To shield his brother, and more especially to save the family name from disgrace, Wide Awake, who was very much like Joseph Chester, had permitted himself to be arrested in his stead. Eli Spence, who was in the police at the time, was discharged from the force, owing to some irregularities on his part, and managed to leave the country before his connection with the bank robbery was discovered. Wide Awake, as he may still be called, communicated with his brother, Joseph Chester, who also left San Francisco. At the trial, the evidence against Wide Awake, who gave an assumed name, was not sufficient to convict him, but he felt keenly the disgrace that had been put upon him, and he resolved not to disclose his real name again. He said that he should not have disclosed it at the trial, but he could not resist the temptation to see what effect it had upon Eli Spence, and, moreover, he had heard his brother was dead. "'But why did you stand your trial in place of your brother?' said Sergeant Tyler. "'Because he was young, and had been led away by a lot of scoundrels, and I wished to give him another chance,' said Wide Awake. "'And did his conduct after this justify what you had done for him?' asked Tyler. No, I'm sorry to say it did not, said Wide Awake, but I can say no more on that subject. The name of Chester was not branded with infamy in the bank robbery case, but since that time, owing to my brother's actions, 
I have been ashamed even to own to myself that my name was Joel Chester. Do you still think Eli Spence had a hand in Henry Bryce's death? asked Tyler. Yes, I know the man well. When he heard my name was Joel Chester, he understood that I had known about his past life in San Francisco. But what connection has Eli Spence's life in Frisco to do with Henry Bryce's death? asked Tyler. You heard my story at Munda, said Wide Awake. I have very little to add to it. Eli Spence was at Mr. Bryce's election meeting that night. It's a clue for you to go upon. The manner in which Henry Bryce met with his death is mysterious, and resembles the method used by Eli Spence and others of the High Flyer gang in Frisco. Sergeant Tyler thought for a few moments and then said, I must see Eli Spence before he leaves Darlinghurst. I will try and see him now. Wide Awake said, What do you propose to do? A little plan of my own I want to work out, if they will let me. Sergeant Tyler left Wide Awake and went to the governor of the jail. What passed between them need not be related. It suffices to say that the governor said at the conclusion of the interview, It's a clever plan, Tyler. If it succeeds, you will beat the detectives on their own ground. Sergeant Tyler went straight from the jail to Wyndham Hanworth's studio, where luckily he found not only the artist, but Edward Bryce. You here, Sergeant? said Ted Bryce in surprise. Yes, I've come to borrow the painting of Herbert Golding, the first one, I mean, he said. Whatever do you want it for? asked Ted. I'm going to bait a trap with it, said Tyler. Explain what you mean, said Ted Bryce. Don't talk in riddles. I've just left the governor of the jail, said Tyler. My plan I have explained to him, and he thinks the idea clever. It might not be fair in an ordinary case, but in a matter of this kind it is admissible. I want that picture to confront Eli Spence with. Ted Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth looked at the constable in amazement. Will you permit me to take it to Darlinghurst? asked Tyler. Certainly, said Wyndham. But what has Eli Spence got to do with it? Listen for a few moments and I will explain, said the constable. My idea is this. I may be wrong, but it is feasible. Herbert Golding, we think, knows something about the murder of your father, Mr. Bryce. We saw how startled he was when he looked at that picture, and also how he collapsed when Mr. Hanworth alluded to the murder. Now from this I gather that if Herbert Golding did not commit the deed, he may have seen it committed. Yes, yes exclaimed Ted Bryce excitedly. Go on, Tyler. I fancy I see what you're driving at. If Herbert Golding saw your father murdered, said Tyler, he would probably look as horrified as he does in that painting. Now, presuming Eli Spence murdered your father, mind, it's only a supposition on somewhat flimsy evidence, and he encountered Herbert Golding afterwards, he would recognise the portrait as that of the man who had seen him commit the deed. Both Herbert Golding and Eli Spence were at your father's meeting that night. It may be that Eli Spence followed your father, intending to rob him, and finding him able to make a desperate resistance, he struck him a violent blow on the head. Mr. Bryce may have fallen into the water, and Eli Spence, if he was the man, would thus be unable to rob him. Finding what he had done meant murder, the man probably ran away, and he may have encountered Herbert Golding. It's an ingenious theory, said Ted Bryce, but surely Herbert Golding would have attempted to stop the man, or raised a cry of alarm. He may have had a reason for not doing so, said Tyler. In that case, if he thought Mr. Bryce's death would be to his advantage, he would let the murderer escape, rather than risk a rescue. Ted Bryce knew Herbert Golding had very good reasons for wishing Henry Bryce out of the way. Had not his unfortunate father hinted to Mr. Sellers that he had found Herbert Golding out, and perhaps had given his partner to understand such was the case? I fear Herbert Golding had every reason to wish my father out of the way, he said. That makes my theory more practicable, said Tyler. If Herbert Golding saw Mr. Bryce knocked into the water, and the murderer ran into him as he hurried away, there would probably be a look of horror on Golding's face, similar to that in the picture. If Eli Spence is the man, he will show considerable alarm when he sees that portrait. 
If my idea be correct, he will know it is the face of the man who saw him kill Henry Bryce. At the moment he recognises the portrait will be the time to wring a confession of his crime from him, if he has committed one. There were evidently no witnesses of the murder, with the exception of Golding, because, had there been so, the police would have come across them before this. If it is as I surmise, Herbert Golding and Eli Spence will not be known to each other by name, but the features of each other will be familiar to the other. If Eli Spence recognises Herbert Golding's portrait, then Herbert Golding must be brought face to face with Eli Spence. It is not a very complicated matter when you come to work it out. Now you've explained it to us, said Ted Bryce. I must congratulate you. You reason soundly, and you've formed a perfectly feasible theory. Wide Awake gave me a wrinkle or two, said Tyler. He firmly believes Eli Spence had a hand in the affair from something he heard in the Shearer's camp. When do you want the painting to try your experiment? said Wyndham Hanworth. At once, said Tyler, and I should like both yourself and Mr. Bryce to be present when Eli Spence sees it. I'm commencing to think my time has not been wasted after all, said Wyndham. I thought when I was painting Herbert Golding's portrait it was a waste of energy and a most uncongenial occupation. We have no time to lose, said Sergeant Tyler. Let us go at once to Darlinghurst. The first painting of Herbert Golding was carefully wrapped up, and Tyler took it with him in a hansom to Darlinghurst. Wyndham Hanworth and Ted Bryce followed in another hansom, and both were eagerly anticipating the result of Sergeant Tyler's plan. End of chapter 24「Twenty Five of Who Did It」by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Startling Results On arriving at Darlinghurst, Sergeant Tyler took the picture to a room the Governor had decided to bring Eli Spence into. The picture was fixed in a conspicuous place, and as in the studio, a cover was over it that could be easily withdrawn. Edward Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth were acquainted with the governor, so there was no difficulty in their being present. Eli Spence was surprised when a warder told him he had orders to take him to the governor of the jail. "'That cursed old judge must have thought better of it and reduced my sentence,' he said with a grin. "'Not much fear of that,' said the warder. "'You may consider yourself lucky you were not on your trial for murder.' Eli Spence gave a start and said, "'What the... Do you mean? What I say, said the warder. You might have killed two or three people in that row at Munda, and in that case you would have found a rope around your neck for sure. When Eli Spence entered the room, there was another surprise in store for him. At the sight of Edward Bryce, Wyndham Hanworth and Sergeant Tyler, he at once suspected their presence boded him no good. Eli Spence was not a brave man at any time, and therefore he quailed before the men he had attempted to injure. Without a word of explanation, the governor, keeping his eyes fixed upon Eli Spence, signalled to Wyndham Hanworth to draw the cover off the picture. Eli Spence stood directly in front of it, so that Herbert Golding's face in the painting seemed to glare at him in a horrified amazement and terror. When he saw it, he gave a cry of fear and staggered back, before he had time to recover himself, the governor said, The man whose portrait you see has confessed all. He did not say what the confession was, but Eli Spence, in a voice trembling with fear, said, Take it away. He saw it all. It was an accident. I swear I never intended to kill him. Take those horrible eyes away. He looked worse than that. Then you are the murderer of my father, said Ted Bryce, advancing towards Eli Spence. I never meant to murder him, stammered the wretched man, now as white as a ghost. You are not obliged to say anything that will incriminate yourself, said the governor. I'll confess the truth. Let me tell the truth now, said Eli Spence. He thought if he made a statement now, and stuck to it, he may yet save his wretched neck. You must please yourself about that, said the governor. Eli Spence commenced to speak rapidly. Rapidly. 
when the governor interrupted him and said, "'Whatever you say will be taken down "'and given in evidence against you upon your trial.' "'I don't care. I'll speak out now,' said Eli Spence. "'This is the statement made by Eli Spence "'as it was taken down in writing. "'I was at Mr. Bryce's election meeting. "'I had heard a good deal about Mr. Bryce at one time and another. "'I frequently called at his office and asked for work on one of his stations.' I never saw the man whose picture was shown me today at Mr. Bryce's, nor do I know his name. I make this statement in answer to a question put to me. Mr. Bryce gave me money once or twice, but when he found out I had been mixed up in the shearing disturbances last season but one, he declined to give me more help. I had no grudge against him for this, but I heard when he went to his election meeting he was generally alone on his return home. I thought he would have money on him the night I went to his meeting, and I meant to threaten him, if I got a favourable chance, until he parted with some coin. When he left the meeting, I believe he went out with the man whose portrait I have seen. At all events, I saw them conversing. When Mr. Bryce was alone, he walked quickly, as though he was going to catch the ferry boat. He had some distance to go, and I followed him. He had to pass a dark spot near the harbour, and it was late, and I saw no people about. I went after him, and called out quietly, Mr. Bryce, Mr. Bryce. When he turned round, he did not at first recognise me, but no doubt thinking it was one of his supporters, he came up to me. He then recognised me, and I could see by his face he thought I was up to no good. You here, he said. You scoundrel, be off, or I will call the police. I did not hesitate then. I knew he would do so. I caught him by the throat and said, Hand over your money and I'll let you go. He would not give in, but caught me round the waist. He was a strong man for his age, and we had a desperate struggle. I saw we were nearing the water's edge, and I endeavoured to get loose from him, but he would not let me go. At last he tripped backwards over a stone and fell to the ground, and I heard his head strike heavily. His grasp relaxed, and before I knew what had happened, I'd shaken myself loose from him, and he rolled over into the harbour. I heard the splash as he fell into the water, and then I realised what had happened. I was terribly afraid. I could not swim, or I should have tried to save him. I never intended he should come to harm in that way. I stood dazed for a few moments, and then ran off, intending to call for assistance. I'd not gone a dozen yards before I ran into a man, and from the expression of his face... It was exactly like that in the picture. I knew he must have seen everything. Who is it? said the man with a gasp. Mr. Bryce, I answered. Save him. I can't swim. I hurried on. I was too terrified at the thoughts of what I had done, and the consequences to me, if discovered, to pause for a moment. Where I went that night I hardly knew, but next morning I made my way up country, and as I had a little money with me, I got to the Burke district, and then joined the Shearer's camp. I never knew what had happened, until I got hold of a Sydney paper, with an account of the inquest in it. I then commenced to wonder who the man was that I had seen when I ran away, and who I knew must have witnessed the struggle. That man I saw made no sign, and gave no evidence. Then I thought he must have some reason for keeping in the dark. Perhaps he had a grudge against Mr Bryce. At any rate... I meant to hunt him out when I got to Sydney and see what he had to say, because I felt he would never betray me and might be useful to me. That man could not have made any effort to save Mr. Bryce. Why I told him the name of the man who fell into the water, I do not know. It may have been that I thought, when he knew it was Mr. Bryce, he would make some effort to save him. The man did not try to detain me, nor did he follow after me or raise any cry of alarm. That is the whole truth about the matter. I have nothing more to say. On the strength of this confession, Herbert Golding was sent for, but he was nowhere to be found. His house was searched and inquiries made in every direction, but all to no purpose. The next day, after Eli Spence had made his confession, the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company smashed and it was discovered that someone had abstracted several thousands of pounds from the safes. When Herbert Golding could not be found, 
suspicion naturally attached to him. On top of this came the rumour that Herbert Golding was wanted by the police on another charge connected with the death of the late Henry Bryce. The Sydney paper that gave a hint on a previous occasion that some startling revelations might shortly be expected in connection with the murder of Henry Bryce now proceeded to explain what had occurred. The statement was wildly exaggerated, but to some extent it was true, and it gradually got about that Herbert Golding was mixed up in the murder of his late partner. Then there was an authorised statement in the Sydney Morning Herald that Eli Spence, who had been sentenced to fourteen years for the attack on Munda Station, was to be put on his trial for the murder of Henry Bryce, and that he had made a full confession of all that had taken place in connection with the outrage. At one point there was no doubt whatever. The pious, sanctimonious Herbert Golding, MLA, had bolted. His character was pulled to pieces with remarkable rapidity, considering the elaborate care he had bestowed upon its building up. Much better men than Herbert Golding have had their characters mutilated behind their backs. As proof after proof of Herbert Golding's perfidy came to light, people were willing to believe almost any evil of him. His offences, which were many and great, were magnified until they assumed colossal proportions. It was even said that Herbert Golding had first bribed Eli Spence to murder Henry Bryce, and had then lured the unfortunate man from the election meeting to the scene of the tragedy. There was no more bitter denouncer of Herbert Golding than the vicar he had so long deceived. The reverend gentleman went about in an almost frantic state of mind. He lifted up his voice and gave vent to the most unchristian-like expressions of feeling. The dupe depositors in the amalgamated bank laid their ruin at Herbert Golding's door. He was cursed from the pulpit and cursed in the humble home of the working man. But where had he got to? That was the main question to solve. Mrs. Bryce reeled under the shock of Herbert Golding's base deception. She thought the bulk of her fortune had gone in the bank crash. Edward Bryce did not mean to undeceive her on that point at present. He thought she deserved to suffer. Ida Bryce gave her no sympathy, and Mrs. Bryce felt very much alone. Her one consolation lay in the fact that her engagement to Herbert Golding had not been made public. Edward Bryce meant to see Herbert Golding standing in the dock if money could procure that desirable consummation. Now he knew what Herbert Golding had been guilty of, he would not spare him. To his mind, the missing man was as much guilty of the death of his father as Eli Spence. He clenched his hands with rage as he pictured how Herbert Golding had stood by and made no attempt to save the drowning man. He placed unlimited money at the disposal of the detectives who were engaged in hunting Herbert Golding down. Eli Spence was put on his trial for the murder of Henry Bryce. His confession he strictly adhered to, and although the jury found him guilty, he was recommended to mercy because they believed he had no actual intention of committing murder. Sergeant Tyler thought a recommendation to mercy in the case of Eli Spence a mere mockery, and said so openly. Eli Spence's death sentence was, however, commuted to lifelong imprisonment. The way in which the portrait of Herbert Golding, painted by Wyndham Hanworth, had been used, caused quite a sensation. It was produced in court on the trial of Eli Spence, who swore it was the face of the man he had seen that night, and who must have witnessed all that had taken place. The newspapers made the most of the sensation, and there was a morbid desire on the part of the public to see this now celebrated portrait. Wyndham Hanworth had several offers for it. He was amused at some of them, for it was quite evident the portrait was regarded as a legitimate article to exhibit and make money out of. There had been no such sensation in Sydney for many years, and there was an eager desire on the part of a variety of individuals interested and otherwise, for the capture of Herbert Golding. 
End of chapter 25「Chapter Twenty Six of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ghost Wins. Although Edward Bryce was very anxious Herbert Golding should be caught, he did not let his feelings in that direction interfere with his enjoyment. He naturally enough thought if the absconder was to be found, the detectives would do it without further trouble on his part. Much of his time was spent with Flora Hanworth, and in her society the gloom cast over him by recent events was dispelled. Edward Bryce, as before stated, was not a city man. He loved the country, and Flora Hanworth was quite willing to make her home with him at Munda, or anywhere else he chose. She loved him dearly, and to her it mattered little where she resided, so long as he was with her. Ida Bryce would not leave Mrs. Bryce now she was in trouble. Although she did not sympathise with her stepmother, she pitied her. Mrs. Bryce, when the first shock was over, thought more of the loss of her money than of her intended husband. She knew she was the dupe of a scoundrel, and the thought was bitter to her. "'I shall never be able to keep up this house now, Ida,' she said. "'You are rich, and when you marry, you may have it with pleasure.' "'But I have no intention of marrying,' said Ida. "'And as for your leaving here, I'm sure Ted would never allow that.' "'I thought you were engaged to Mr. Hanworth,' said Mrs. Bryce. "'Indeed,' said Ida. "'Then you are mistaken. "'Mr. Hanworth has not even made love to me, "'so I fail to see how I can be engaged to him.' "'But I know you like him, Ida,' said Mrs. Bryce. "'Oh, I like him well enough,' said Ida. "'But that is quite a different matter to loving him.' Ted Bryce often called to see his sister, but he did not care to remain in his stepmother's house. Mrs. Bryce was anxious to learn all about the affairs of the amalgamated company, but Ted would not give her much information. What he did tell her served rather to increase than allay her fears. He was determined to punish her for her conduct, and felt justified in doing so. The handicap for the Sydney Cup was generally considered a good one, and for a change the handicapper was not abused like a pickpocket. The ghost had got seven stone, and La Belle eight stone four pound, and Ted Bryce was quite satisfied with the phantom colt's weight. Sam Fraser was delighted, and considered the ghost's chance a first-class one. He knew if the ghost managed to win the Cup, his luck would change for the better. Most trainers believe in luck, and Sam Fraser was no exception to the general rule. His run of bad luck landed him at Munda, and he had an idea that, after all, his experiences there were to stand him in good stead. The history of the ghost sire was public property, for an account of the celebrated phantom had appeared in print, surrounded by such a halo of romance that Ted Bryce had been amused when he read the sensational story. Still, there had been enough of the truth in it to make the ghost's work on the track attractive. Ted Bryce made no secret of the chance he thought the colt possessed, and much to Sam Fraser's disgust, he had publicly stated in Tattersall's club what the ghost was capable of doing. When the AJC autumn meeting drew near, the betting became brisk, and although the ghost was not heavily backed, plenty of people had put money on him. Wide Awake, who had returned to Munda, had given such a glowing account of the colt's progress that the station hands clubbed together and sent down a tidy sum to Oxenham's to back him. Even the lads had put in their dollars with the rest and were as eager as the older hands to learn how the ghost went in his work. The papers were in great demand and the morning gallops were read out by Wide Awake to an enthusiastic audience. The ghost, accompanied by Rosie Morn and La Belle, did one of the best goes of the morning, over a mile and a half, was sure to be read amidst an outburst of cheering. Startling cable intelligence had no charm for the Munda hands. They were uninterested in the information that Mr Gladstone was doing the continent, or that the Queen had gone to Nice, and they failed to recognise any particular charm in the report, which was contradicted the next day, 
that a well-known member of Parliament contemplated a visit to Australia. The ghost was of far more importance to them than such items of news. Ted Bryce had the natural enthusiasm of a true sportsman to see his horse win, and although he did not bet heavily, he was perhaps more interested in the result than others who plunged. It was a glorious autumn day when the Sydney Cup was to be decided. It was Easter time and the holiday makers were in great force at Randwick. Thousands of people were present and it was evident the Cup was going to be an exciting and well-contested race. Wyndham Hanworth seldom visited a race course, but he went with Ida Bryce, his sister and Ted Bryce to see how the ghost would run. They all thought of their ride after the Phantom as they stood looking at Sam Fraser, putting the finishing touches to the ghost. "'If he can stay as well as his sire, he ought to win,' said Ted. "'What a dance the old Phantom led us that day!' "'It was the best ride I ever had,' said Ida enthusiastically. "'And what a narrow escape you had, Flora! "'What should I have done had anything serious happened to you, Flora?' said Ted Bryce with a fond look. "'And what should I have done had you been seriously wounded at Munda?' she replied. "'It is lucky for all of us both affairs turned out so well,' said Ted. Mr. Sellers came up, and after an all-round greeting said, "'La Belle seems very fractious, Mr. Bryce. I do not think she will do her best.' "'You never can tell,' said Ted. "'Mares are so uncertain. How's the betting now?' Quail is a favourite, and the party behind him think he can't lose. Then Forrester thinks his horse has a chance. But Bill's luck has been so bad lately, I'm afraid he won't win. If the ghost cannot win, said Ted Bryce, there's no man I would sooner see land the cup than Mr Forrester. I hear he has a remarkably fine colt by carbine out of rosary. He has, said William Sellers, a regular beauty, so he tells me. The youngster has a cut of musket about him, and has the markings of the old horse. But here he comes. He will tell you about it himself. Mr. Forrester joined the group and cast critical eyes on the ghost. Looks fit, he said laconically. Sam Fraser has not lost much of his knowledge at Munda. I think he'll win, said Ted Price. My fellow has a chance, said Mr. Forrester. I'll save a hundred with you. They are both about the same price in the betting. Very well, said Ted. A hundred of the ghost for a hundred of Romulus. Mr. Sellers tells me your carbine colt is a good one. He is, said Mr. Forrester with a smile. I'll give the boys down the banks with him if my old luck returns. I'm sure I hope it will, said Ted. You've had a long spell the other way. We've had to declare a couple of pounds overweight for Parker, said Sam Fraser. So you couldn't get down to seven stones, sis, said Ted Bryce. No, replied Parker. I done me best, but it's a pinch for me to get down to seven stone two pound. I don't mind going to a little trouble to ride for you, Mr. Bryce. I hope you will manage to win, said Ted. Has Fraser given you instructions how to ride the colt? No, said Parker, but he has given me a few hints, which is better. It does not do to hamper a fellow with too many orders in a race like this. I think you are quite right, said Ted Bryce. Ride your own race, sis and win if you can. I shan't blame you in any case. Thank you, said Parker. Some men are only too ready to think ill of a jockey. Sis Parker was a well-known and capable rider, a clever young fellow with excellent hands and just the jockey for a colt like the ghost. When he came out of the weighing room with the magenta jacket and black cap on, there was a disposition to back the ghost more freely. It could easily be seen that the jockey had numerous followers. The ghost was a bit fractious and scattered the crowd in the paddock as he lashed out and tried to get his head loose from Sam Fraser, who had hold of the bridle. When in the straight, however, he soon settled down to his work and galloped freely. There were thirty starters, and Mr Watson soon had them off to a level start with the machine. It was not a race full of incident, as some Sydney Cups have been, for at the end of a mile more than half the horses were out of it. The ghost had been lying fifth or sixth and going well on the rails. As they neared the sheds, Parker commenced to creep up to Quail, Romulus, Labelle and Hero, and close in the wake of the colt followed Pilot and Chesterfield. 
The pace had not been fast, and the jockey felt the ghost was going well, and had plenty left in him. As they rounded the bend, Quail and Romulus ran wide, and in an instant Parker had taken advantage of the opening on the rails, and brought the ghost with a smart run. "'Cleverly done,' said Ted Bryce. "'He's got a splendid position now, and there's not much danger of a block.' At the ledger stand, there were shouts of Quail and the favourite wins. Then came Romulus wins, and the crimson and white jackets for a moment looked dangerous. Hero next caused a cry from the excited crowd, as he forged ahead in Mr. Oxenham's popular colours. But Parker had been keeping his eyes open. He felt the ghost was not going too well now. The critical pinch had come, and he meant to nurse him until the last moment. "'Hang him,' said Fraser to himself. "'Either the jockey or the colt is licked. "'Blessed if I know which it is.' "'You can bet it's not Sis that's licked,' said an enthusiastic admirer of Parker. "'He don't know what it is to be licked.' But Sam Fraser knew when a jockey came down to seven stone two pound, as Parker had done, it was liable to take a bit out of him. If the race had been uninteresting, the finish made up for it, and so intense was the excitement that a momentary hush fell upon the crowd. There is nothing stranger than these sudden changes in a vast racecourse crowd. In their intense emotion, the people seem incapable of giving vent to their feelings. When four horses are racing neck and neck at the finish of a race, hardly a sound is heard until one of the four gets his head in front. Then there is a frantic roar in favour of the horse with this slight advantage. It was so in this instance. Just below the distance, the ghost on the rails, Quail, Hero and Romulus, had all drawn level. The four horses were desperately struggling to gain a slight advantage. It was a battle royal worth seeing. Four heads level, necks outstretched, nostrils wide, eyes glowing fiercely with excitement, and every nerve and sinew trained to endure, strained to the utmost tension. Four jockeys, all adepts in their profession, riding these horses with consummate coolness and judgment. The least mistake each jockey knew would be fatal. The slightest move too soon, and defeat would certainly follow. And so these four horses and riders came on towards the judge's box. Quail faltered, and his jockey had to ride him. He fell back astride. Hero reeled and had to be straightened, and Romulus's rider felt the time had come. Parker saw everything that happened in that brief moment. He saw Quail falter and Hero roll, and then, with joy, he saw the rider of Romulus raise his whip. Still as a mouse sat Parker on the ghost. He was riding a splendid race. He felt he should just get the colt home. He dared not move. He knew the excited crowd would think he was throwing the race away. He knew the public would much rather have seen him riding for dear life, and, as they thought, getting every ounce out of the colt under pressure. He knew if he lost, stewards, who were not the best of judges, might condemn him, and that even Edward Bryce and Sam Fraser might say he ought to have made more use of his mount at the finish. Knowing all this, he sat still and let the ghost do his best, for he alone knew it was the only way to win the race. The ghost was doing his best. Had his jockey attempted to make him do more than his best, the result would have been disastrous, and still the ghost could not shake off Romulus. Only a few more strides and the strain would be over. Parker was holding the ghost well together, and at the same time letting him do his level best. He saw the judge's box on his left, and he saw the level mark on the board on his right. He glanced to his left, and just saw the tip of Romulus's nose. A short head, he muttered, and I have it. But he was anxious to see the numbers go up. I beat you, Jim, he said, as he rode back with the rider of Romulus. Blessed if I know, sis, I thought it was a dead heat. No, I just got home. He was right. The clerk of the course rode up to the ghost and then Sis Parker knew he had won the race. End of chapter 26
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After the Victory The Ghost's Win was popular, although the horse was by no means a favourite. Racing men, however, are not slow to recognise the win of a horse whose owner is known to be a straight goer. Just my luck, said Mr. Forrester as he met Ted Bryce going across the paddock to see his horse rub down. He was a man who could take a defeat as well as a victory. I can't say I wish you had won, said Ted Bryce with a smile, so I will say better luck next time. I hope so, said Mr. Forrester as he moved on to look after his own horse. What sort of a ride had you? said Ted Bryce to Parker. Not an easy one at the finish by any means, was the reply. I only just got home. I had to nurse him all down the street. He's a real good colt. I should not be at all surprised if there was a Melbourne Cup in him. You appear to be taking it easy at the finish, said Ted Bryce. I never rode a better finish, said Parker. I dared not move on the colt. He would have lost had I not sat still and let him fight it out. The colt was doing his best. He could do no more. Sam Fraser was elated at the win, and felt his luck was in. It was amusing to see how he smiled upon the other trainers. He had his turn now, and chaffed them unmercifully. "'You'll have to catch the phantom somehow,' said Fraser to Ted Bryce, "'or you'll have men losing their good mares in the district for a few weeks in order to get a foal by him.' "'I'm sure he will never be caught,' said Ted. "'For my part, he can run wild until he dies of old age.' If ever I come across him when he's knocked up, he shall have a painless death and an honourable burial. And at Munda you will find his hoofs upon the table, his hide upon the chair. I wish he could be caught. What stock you would get if mated properly, said Fraser. He gets them all right now, replied Ted, and picks his own mares. There's a heap of luck in breeding horses. They were a merry party at the Australia Hotel that night and Ted Bryce's rooms were decorated for the occasion. The great race of the day was talked over again, and the merits of the ghost descanted upon. "'Telegram for you, sir,' said the waiter, as he entered the room, just as dinner was over. Ted Bryce took it and said, "'Congratulations, I suppose, on the win.' The wire was from Louth, and signed Wide Awake. "'We're all drinking the ghost's health tonight, and also your own.' Manda is a scene of wild hilarity. Ted Bryce laughed as he handed the telegram to his sister, and Ida read it aloud. They will be having a good time, said Wyndham Hanworth. The revels will be prolonged until midnight, I expect. And after, said Ida Bryce, the Manda hands know how to play as well as work. The waiter entered the room with another telegram. More congratulations, I suppose, said Ted. He gave an exclamation of surprise as he read the information it contained. "'What is it?' asked Ida. "'Anything wrong?' "'This is a go,' said Ted. "'What a curious thing it should happen on this particular day. "'We can now celebrate another victory.' "'But what has happened, Ted? "'Why don't you tell us?' said Ida impatiently. "'It's from Melbourne,' said Ted. "'I'll read it. "'Herbert Golding arrested this afternoon on board the Tayan. "'We'll arrive in Sydney on Wednesday.' "'That is news!' exclaimed Ida. "'I'm glad the scoundrel is caught.' "'And so am I,' said Ted Bryce. "'He shall have no mercy from me.' "'I wonder how he will face it,' said Wyndham Hanworth. "'He'll brazen it out right enough,' said Ted Bryce. "'What a hypocritical scoundrel he is!' Herbert Golding's arrest was soon heard of in Sydney, and special editions of the evening papers came out with imaginary accounts of the scene on board the Tayan. As a matter of fact, the arrest had been accomplished quietly. Herbert Golding intended escaping to China, and had assumed a disguise and booked his passage by the Tayan under a false name. When arrested, he saw the game was up, and that it would be in his favour to take matters quietly. He had read the accounts of the confession of Eli Spence, and saw how badly it would tell against him. But he had nothing to fear as regards being implicated in the death of Henry Bryce. He shuddered as he thought of the scene he had witnessed that night at Balmain. Could he have prevented the murder of Henry Bryce? He knew he could have done so, 
and therefore he was morally guilty of a crime in not saving him. At last the truth came home to him, that he was at heart a murderer. The thought was not pleasant, even such a man as Herbert Golding has his hours of remorse. As the train sped on its way from Albury to Sydney, he had ample time for reflection. It was not the punishment he dreaded so much as the thought that during his long imprisonment he would be haunted by the memory of that fatal night when his too generous partner, Henry Bryce, had been murdered in his presence. He knew what a feeling of relief came over him when he saw Henry Bryce fall into the water. Only that very week had Henry Bryce discovered his, Herbert Golding's, perfidy, and that a large sum of money had been taken out of the firm by means of forgery. Herbert Golding knew he had been glad when Henry Bryce was found dead in the harbour, but now his day of reckoning had come. The enormity of his misdeeds appalled him. What was there he had not done? He had sat Sunday after Sunday facing the Ten Commandments in church, hearing them read aloud. He had said the response after each commandment in a loud, clear voice. He intended it should be known that he, at all events, wished to incline his heart to keep this law. Could he say now that there was one of those commandments he had kept? No, he could not. Thou shalt not steal. He had stolen. He had borne false witness. He had murdered in his heart, and he had coveted his neighbour's wife. He had worshipped an idol he had set up, and that idol was himself. He had cloaked his sins with religion. He had desecrated the church by his presence within it. Ted Bryce had said Herbert Golding would brazen it out. He was mistaken. When Herbert Golding left Melbourne, he felt he could brazen it out. At that time he was five hundred miles away from Sydney, and the people he had wronged and deceived. But as the train drew nearer and nearer to the scene of his iniquities, his brazen courage, if it can be called courage in such a man, forsook him. As every mile left behind took him onward to Sydney, he feared the ordeal that lay before him. It was not repentance for his crimes he felt. Had he been able to escape, he would have done so, and lived a life of deception and hypocrisy elsewhere. But there was no chance of this. He could not escape alive. What he feared was facing the crowded court, and the eager faces glaring at him and demanding justice upon him. He dreaded to face the men he had deceived with his canting phrases and mock morality. He dreaded facing the sneers of men who had held subordinate positions to himself in the commercial world. He pictured to himself the utter contempt in which all these people would hold him, and pointed at him as a sneaking hypocritical thief. He could not face that ordeal. He must escape, even if he had to take his life. He was a coward to the bitter end. He dared not face the consequences of his own misdeeds. When the train stopped for the passengers to have breakfast, Herbert Golding asked the detective who had charge of him to join him at that meal. The detective saw no harm in this, and they went into the breakfast room at the station. Herbert Golding chatted freely with the man, and seemed quite at his ease and reconciled to his position. The detective also talked to the man who sat on the opposite side of him, to his prisoner. He did not see Herbert Golding quickly slip a knife up his sleeve. When they left the room, Herbert Golding walked up the platform with the detective towards their carriage. He was not handcuffed, as the man in charge of him did not consider this to be necessary until they reached Sydney. As they were passing a waiting room, Herbert Golding suddenly rushed inside and slammed the door in the astonished detective's face. The detective at once made a dash at the door. Behind that door, with his back against it and the lock turned, stood Herbert Golding. In an instant he slipped the knife down his sleeve and, grasping the handle with tremendous force, drew the blade across his throat. The detective forced open the door, Herbert Golding fell face forwards, and the knife turning as it fell with him, and the handle striking the floor on end, the blade ran into his chest. The detective, seeing what had happened, 
left his prisoner and rushed onto the platform, shouting for a doctor. There happened to be a medical man in the train, but he had no desire to be left behind. What is it? he asked with his head out of the carriage window. Man cut his throat in the waiting room. Come quickly or he'll bleed to death, said the detective. I shall miss my train, said the doctor. No, you will not. They will wait for you, replied the detective. With protestations on his part, the doctor got out of the carriage and hurried along the platform. The train was detained to see if the injured man could still be taken on. The doctor quickly saw there was no hope for Herbert Golding, and he was not at all well pleased when the train departed, leaving him there. Herbert Golding did not speak again. He had taken the law into his own hands and passed sentence upon himself. The wound in his chest was a fatal one, as the knife-blade had pierced his lung. The throat was terribly lacerated, the knife having been worn at the point and blunted towards the haft. He died the same night, and the detective had to convey a dead prisoner to Sydney. Herbert Golding's suicide, people said, was in accordance with his mode of living. He had been a cheat all his life, and now he had cheated his victims, who would much have preferred seeing him alive in the dock. Edward Bryce was astonished when he heard the news. He took it differently to most people. He had meant to have a day of reckoning with Herbert Golding, but now the man had taken his own life, that was impossible. He's dead, said Ted Bryce to Wyndham Hanworth, and therefore he's given a life for a life, for he was morally guilty of my father's death. Now I come to think it over, I'm glad this has happened. There would have been many unpleasant details at the trial, and the judgment pronounced upon him would not have been so severe as that he has meted out to himself. It is a miserable end to a wretched life. So Herbert Golding paid the penalty for his crimes. Mrs. Bryce was naturally much shocked at the news. Edward Bryce thought she had been sufficiently punished, and informed her that her thirty thousand pounds was safe in the firm of Bryce and Company. This assuaged her grief considerably, and she commenced to praise Herbert Golding for withdrawing her money from the bank. But when Edward Bryce explained to her that the thirty thousand she had handed over to Herbert Golding was used by him to pay back a sum of exactly the same amount of which he had defrauded Henry Bryce, she was indignant against the dead man. Edward Bryce also explained to her that she could not withdraw the money, and as a matter of fact it did not belong to her at all, but he was willing, considering she was his father's widow, to allow her five per cent on the amount during her lifetime, that interest to cease if she married again. Mrs. Bryce found much to ponder over in all this, and she arrived at the conclusion that her stepson was a hard-hearted young man, and could have no feelings for her lonely position when he made such a stipulation as the one of not to marry again. End of chapter 27「Chapter 28 of Who Did It?" by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Munda once more. Six months after the events narrated in the previous chapter, Mr. and Mrs. Edward Bryce were entertaining a party of guests at Munda. Included in those staying under their hospitable roof were Ida Bryce, Wyndham Hanworth, Dr. Langside, William Sellers, and his daughter Laura. The marriage of Edward Bryce and Flora Hanworth had taken place three months previously, and after a short honeymoon they had come on to Munda, where Wide Awake, who was now holding a responsible position there, had organised a hearty reception for them. Edward Bryce was anxious his sister should marry Wyndham Hanworth. He knew it would be unwise for him to urge Wyndham's claims to Ida, but he thought if they came together at Munda again, it would give the artist the opportunity he desired. There was plenty of amusement at Munda. The shooting was excellent, and as the country was now in splendid condition, it presented a very different aspect to what it did at the time of the memorable attack on Munda. There was also good fishing to be had in the Darling River, and any amount of horses to ride, 
Riding parties were much in favour, and seldom a day passed without most of the guests having an exhilarating gallop over the great level paddocks. Races were got up for the benefit of the hands, and Wide Awake greatly astonished some of the juniors by winning a prize of five and twenty pounds, which Edward Bryce had given for a two miles race. The Phantom had not been seen for many weeks, and Ted Bryce commenced to think the horse must have met with some mishap. Dr Langside was very anxious to catch a glimpse of the celebrated sire of the ghost, and so was William Sellers. A search party was organised, and with wide awake in command, as on a former occasion, they rode out to find the phantom horse. It was a long ride and an arduous search, and nothing came of it. No trace of the old horse could be found, and they had to return to Munda after an unsuccessful ride. Next day they went out again, and as Ida Bryce did not feel particularly well, she decided to remain at home with Flora. Wyndham Hanworth had gone off by himself on a sketching bent. This time the riding party was more successful, for they tracked the phantom to one of his favourite haunts. Here they found the old horse, lying on the grass, with four mares standing round him, and gazing at him with startled looks. When the mares caught sight of the approaching horseman, they galloped off, but the phantom could not rise, although he made desperate efforts to get on to his feet. His struggles were painful to witness, and it was evident the old horse had finished his final gallop. "'What a pity!' said Ted, as he looked at the fallen hero. "'He's injured his spine. "'No, by Jove, his back's broken. "'He must have had a nasty fall, but however did he manage to get here?' "'I think he'd better be shot,' said Wide Awake. "'It will put an end to his misery. "'He may have been like this for a considerable time.' They looked sorrowfully on, and Ted Bryce said, Yes, it will be better to put an end to his suffering. Shoot him, wide awake. The report of a gun discharged echoed through the hollows, and without a struggle, the old phantom died. What a magnificent horse he must have been in his prime, said William Sellers. Now one day his stock can race. Ted Bryce examined him closely, but could find no brand nor other marks of ownership upon him. They covered up the remains of the phantom with branches, and Ted Bryce told Wide Awake to send a man from the station to get the hide and the hoofs, which he intended to preserve as a memento of the old grey. "'That's a horse with a history,' said Dr Langside as they rode back to Munda. "'If his career could be traced, it would form interesting reading.' "'There may be a chance of finding out all about him,' said Edward Bryce." If ever I do make any discoveries in that direction, I will see they are made public. When Wyndham Hanworth felt tired of sketching, he returned to the homestead, and he saw Ida Bryce alone on the veranda. Something seemed to tell him it was now or never if he wished to win Ida Bryce, so he determined to make the plunge. Having had but little experience in such delicate matters, the artist hardly knew how to commence business. He had, however, a straightforward nature, and generally said what he thought without any circumlocution. Ida Bryce heard him step onto the veranda and looked up. She instinctively knew what he had come to say to her, and it made her heart flutter slightly, despite her self-control. "'You have returned early,' she said, by way of opening a commonplace conversation. "'I'm glad I've found you alone.' commenced Wyndham, and then, with a boldness and suddenness that startled Ida Bryce, the artist declared his love for her. He pleaded earnestly and in a manly way. There was something masterful about him that attracted Ida. She thought she had never seen him look so handsome or heard him speak so well. She had long liked Wyndham Hanworth, and now she knew that liking had developed into love. He spoke without hesitation or diffidence. He had confidence in his own powers, and he said if Ida Bryce would consent to be his wife, he would try and make for himself a name that would be worthy of her. And when Ida Bryce replied, she spoke openly and truthfully. She let Wyndham Hanworth see that if he married her, he must accept what help she could give him to win fame in the career he had chosen.' 
she accepted his offer and promised to be his wife, and then, after struggling hard to keep back her emotional feelings, she, woman-like, gave way. Wyndham Hanworth made the most of this opportunity, and Edward Bryce would have had no cause to give him further hints as to the boldness of his wooing. When Ted Bryce saw his sister, he knew there was a change in her. "'You look better, Ida,' he said. "'The rest has done you good. "'If I was given to flattery, I should say you were looking radiant. "'Has anything happened?' he asked as he saw a bright light in her eyes. "'A good deal has happened, Ted, since you left home this morning,' said Ida. "'It was mean of you to leave me in such an unprotected state.' "'Has Wyndham screwed up his courage at last?' said Ted with a laugh. "'If you mean has he proposed to me,' said Ida, "'he has, and I have accepted him.' Ted Bryce kissed her fondly, and said he knew she would be happy with his friend. Flora Bryce soon saw her brother was in very high spirits. "'What has pleased you so much today, Wynne?' "'I'm the luckiest man in the world,' he said. "'Ida has consented to be my wife.' Flora Bryce was as delighted almost as her brother, at this good news. "'No use keeping it a secret,' said Ted Bryce, and forthwith he proceeded to enlighten his guests as to what had taken place during their absence. "'I call it real mean of Wynne to go and steal my sister during our unavoidable absence,' he said. "'You don't suppose we required your presence as a spectator of the interesting proceedings?' said Ida with a smile. "'Not if you were as enthusiastic as the usual run of lovers,' said Ted." I should never feel I was engaged if Wyndham had proposed to me in an off-hand manner on a railway station platform, said Ida, with a glance at Flora. I don't see why a railway station platform is not as good a place as the veranda of Munda Homestead, said Ted. Who told you it was on the veranda? asked Ida. Wynne, of course, said Ted. He's quite proud of his bravery, I assure you. If Wyndham has been giving you a full, true and particular account of all that took place on the veranda, I shall never forgive him, said Ida. I assure you, Ida, your brother is drawing upon his imagination, said Wyndham. That scene is sacred to me. Bravo, shouted Ted. How would this do for a subject for a picture? One on a veranda. Or caught at the railway station, said Ida with a merry laugh. The poor old phantom's dead said Ted, and he described how they had found the horse. "'Oh, I am sorry,' said Flora, "'but we have the ghost to remind us of him.' That night, Wyndham Hanworth and Edward Bryce had a quiet chat together. "'And when is the wedding to be?' asked Ted. "'I will leave it entirely to Ida,' said Wyndham. "'Take my advice and do nothing of the kind,' said Ted Bryce. "'Choose the date and stick to it.' "'But will Ida like that?' asked Wynne. "'Ida is a sensible woman, and will like what you like,' said Ted. "'Then the sooner the better,' said Wyndham. "'I agree with you heartily,' said Ted. "'Get it over quick, and settle down into a quiet married couple, like Flora and myself.' "'I mean to work hard,' said Wyndham. "'Nothing like it,' said Ted. "'And I'm sure Ida will help you.' "'By the by, Ted, did I tell you?' said Wyndham. "'What is it? You look quite desperate.' said Ted. I've destroyed those paintings of Herbert Golding. I never felt as much satisfaction in painting a picture as I did in burning those portraits. I'm glad you've done so, said Ted. It was an unprofitable commission you received. It was. I will never accept another commission to paint a man I do not like, said the artist. You'll have no necessity to do so now, Wynne, said Ted Bryce. Thanks to Ida, I shall not, said Wyndham. "'We are lucky men, Wynne,' said Ted. "'We are,' said Wyndham Hanworth. "'I have won Ida.' "'And I have won Flora,' said Ted Bryce. End of chapter 28 End of Who Did It? by Nat Gould Read by Phil Benson in Sydney, Australia